Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mihal Ofalu. Good morning, Krakow. Um, my name is Mihal. I'm Irish, but I'm working in the Munich office, and I'm here to tell you about Google engineering in Europe. Google's a fun place for engineers to work and help to create products that have a really global impact. But before I get into the talk, I just want you to think a bit about what end users of Google products think about Google. Probably the first thing they think about is Google's search engine. And then I want you to think about what sort of company is Google? What are we? We're one of the biggest companies in the world in terms of uh, revenues and market cap and so on. But if you think about what sort of company we are, we're, we started out as a search company, but now we're much more than a search company. And people in this audience probably have a good idea of what we are. We're a company that produces a lot of products. And all of these products are this strange new thing that didn't exist 100 years ago, software products. Strangely ephemeral, based on layers of abstraction that keep changing every five years or every two months if you're in JavaScript. <laughs> now, the, um, if you think about what it takes to build these products, essentially this means that we're a software company. And so we know about software, and we love our own developers, and we love you, our developer community. So this means that our products are more than just products. They're things that people use to help create real impact globally. And every one of our hundreds of products has potentially billions of success stories of people using them to really change their lives. And very importantly, in terms of Google's philosophy, even though we started as an American company in Silicon Valley, like many other software companies, from the get-go, our vision has been a global vision. And our vision has been that the internet and the services and products that we provide are for absolutely everyone on the planet, not just for English speakers, not just for North Americans, not just for Europeans, but globally. And we've put a huge amount of investment of time and effort and energy into trying to make this vision real. And we certainly have got a long way there. If you look at the globe, we have users in all corners of the globe using all of our products. Now I'm going to focus in on what we're doing here in Europe in terms of engineering, because you may think that our engineering products are all developed in America. But in fact, we're a global company, and we have a very, very significant presence here in Europe. These dots represent our engineering offices, not all of our offices, in um, EMEA, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. This includes Zurich, Dublin, London, Munich, Paris, Aarhus, Stockholm, and Warsaw, and Tel Aviv in Israel. Famously, Google has seven products that have more than a billion users, and some of them with more than two billion users. And every one of these products has a significant engineering effort here in Europe. At its simplest, there's two main types of engineers in Google. There are what we call SWEs, software engineers. Um, and there are what we call SREs, site reliability engineers. And because so many of our products are hosted uh, internet services, we need to place just as much emphasis on keeping things up and running and keeping latencies low and so on and so forth as we do on actually developing and building the software itself. And it takes both types of engineers to make products work. And of course, there's a whole slew of other supporting engineers. I don't mean to miss anybody out, but it includes UX and design and all sorts of other types and security and all sorts of things. But principally, that Google thinks about these engineers as falling into these two categories. Um, if you think about where some of this activity takes place, just to call out three, um, Android has a huge base in London and Aarhus. Chrome has a huge base in Munich and Paris. 
and Google Play Store has a big base in London and in Zurich. Now, as well as creating products for consumers, we also create products for developers. And there's a number of different types of products that we create for developers. So probably the most obvious one, uh, which has a huge presence here at this event, is the Google Cloud Platform. And much of that effort takes place here in Poland, in Warsaw. And the next speaker, Ava, will be giving you some details about what's actually going on there in that office. Um, as well as that, we have sort of APIs that can be reused by developers that are part of Google Cloud Platform, but almost come from a separate engineering effort. And in Europe, a lot of that effort is focused in Zurich. Um, for our next talk after Ava, we have Bashad, who will be telling you all about Google Assistant. And uh, you'll be able to engage then here in the conference in Code Labs and so on in using AI in your own services. We also have a set of external developer tools that we link to the Google Cloud Platform. And because we ourselves are full of developers and we need to support them, we have a set of internal developer tools. And a lot of that effort goes on uh, in my home office in Munich. And then we have, like any company does, corporate applications that are for all users, not just for developers. Um, and a lot of that effort happens in Munich and London. And why do we do all this? So that you have the tools to build cool products and services for your own users. Now, as this is mainly a developer audience, I just want to give you a bit of a feel about the scale that we operate in in our own software inside Google. For comparison, let's just look at the um, Linux 4.2 code base, uh, roughly 20 million lines of code uh, in 50,000 files, quite a big code base. We change that amount of code in our code base in Google every week. In fact, more than that number of uh, files gets changed every week. If you look at the bigger stats, internally, we have more than 40,000 developers working on a single integrated mono repo code base that's made up of a billion files, um, 9 million source files, and 2 billion lines of code. And we're working furiously at this every day. And code review is a critical part of Google's code culture. So we have over 20,000 code reviews happening per workday. Nobody's allowed to check stuff into the master repo without it being reviewed on a number of different vectors. And this leads to thousands of commits per week. And interestingly, over time, we've invested so much in our internal tooling that there's a much higher growth rate of automated changes to our code base than the human-based changes. But also, quite interestingly, these automated changes also seem to have breaks in the holidays. right? So the robots take holidays too. Um, our tooling is vast, and we've, we've uh, invested very, very heavily in it. Um, uh, the tooling group that I work for is called DevTask, Developer Tools and Signals. And we are in charge of this internal tooling for our internal code base that we call Google 3. And there's a set of probably 20 to 50 tools in, t in these various categories that help build our software and keep it current and keep it regular. I want to call out just one of these tools that we've externalized as open source. It's a tool called Bazel. It'll be particularly interesting to any of you who are working on very large code bases, and you want to try and optimize build times, because it allows you to store a graph of all the builds that anyone in the company has done. And if you can cache those builds, when the builds are then done again, only the stuff that hasn't already been compiled needs to be recompiled, and you can reuse the binaries from anywhere in the organization. And we use a version of this internally in Google called Blaze, and it's one of the core productivity tools that we have. Now, Bazel is open source. Um, and it's not yet at version 1.0. But already, it's being used by companies like Dropbox, Huawei, and Stripe. Um, so especially if you're working on large code bases, you might be very interested in Bazel. 
In terms of our philosophy, then, we have a slightly unique way of doing things in Google using our single mono repo. Um, it's actually uh, our own tool called Piper. Again, one of my teams works on that. And uh, we started off using Perforce, and we outgrew it in terms of our scale, so we needed to build a, our own replacement for it. Mandatory code reviews, fast builds from source at head using Blaze, ruthless refactoring, um, identifying breaking changes with automated testing, uh, maintaining a green build and frequent releases. In fact, anything running in our own internal cloud that's running for more than six months without an update is a red flag, and people have to revisit it. And this is to make sure that we're constantly recompiling all of our services with the latest libraries to make sure that we're not breaking, opening any vulnerabilities. Um, if you look at the news today, anyone who develops in Java, check out the Struts vulnerability that was just announced. It's quite uh, scary. You may be recompiling some code tonight. Um, so <clears throat> to take it all back then, um, we are trying to invest in software. We have an internal community, and we have an external community. And we're trying to take as much knowledge from our internal community to share with the external community in terms of tools, services, and products. And now we've realized that we need to also invest in communication and events like this. And this event is one example of this, trying to hold, host more events here in Europe where, as was mentioned in the opening keynote on day one, we know that there are more software developers than in the North America, um, the US, and Canada combined. Last month, for example, we had the Polymer Summit in Copenhagen in Denmark. And next month, uh, we have the Firebase Summit in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And it's particularly cool how you can hook up Firebase with cloud functions from the Google Cloud Platform to create a very lightweight, serverless, back-end to very complex applications. And any of you who are working in mobile might be interested in that. So I'm now going to pass you over to someone who will do a deeper dive into the Google Cloud Platform and who works here in Europe, Ava, who works in our Warsaw office. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eva Maciasz, and I'm leading cloud front-end team, uh, one of the engineering teams we have in Poland. I'm very happy to be here today in Krakow. I, I counted, and I spent about 43% of my entire life in Krakow, and about 88% of my adult life. I was studying here, and then uh, spent the first eight years at Google here. It's, it's really good to be back. And I'm proud that I'm representing our Google Poland office here today and tell you a little bit about what we are focusing on. Over the last decade, Google Poland has focused its effort on technical in infrastructure. We built products and uh, systems that are part of the Google internal platform where all Google services like Search and YouTube and Gmail are running. We built software throughout multiple layers, from an agent running on every single machine in Google data centers, through a massive data collection and uh, processing, to web user interface. A major theme for us over the years has been automation and improving user interaction with the infrastructure so that the internal teams can spend less time doing operations work and more time developing actual business logic. Here's one example of, the, of our automation focus. We build a system that, for a service, automatically chooses a data center to run on based on the service requirements. It also decides how many resources to allocate for a service, and decides how many copies of the service to run. When we get started here in Poland over 10 years ago, the industry was running mostly on private data centers. 
maintaining large specialized servers. These days, almost everyone is looking at how to move to cloud because it's expensive and time consuming to maintain infrastructure. And it also takes you away from your core business. So for the last four years, we focused our efforts on exposing the internal infrastructure to our external users. And the resulting product is known today as Google Cloud Platform. Why developers choose cloud? Because it's built on the same infrastructure as all other services at Google. And it offers security, scale, and cost efficiency, access to a global network, best in class data processing tools, uh, access to services like machine learning, and most importantly, velocity. You can see here on the slide some quotes directly from our customers. I could stand here probably for all day telling you a lot of details about GCP, but since we don't have that much time, the rest of my talk will focus on the product known as cloud compute, because this is what our team in Poland is working on. In cloud compute, uh, our mission is to help you find a perfect engine for your workloads. From serverless environments, through containers, to virtual machines, we are working to provide a scalable range of compute options to match your needs. Specifically, cloud compute offers four places when you can run your software. Compute engine, container engine, app engine, and Cloud Functions. Now, when I look at the slide, maybe Cloud Functions should be renamed to Functions Engine. My slide would look much better then. Look at this slide as a, as a spectrum. The lower in the stack, the more flexibility and control you have. The higher in the stack, the more automation Google provides. In other words, in the lower layer, you get almost raw infrastructure. In the highest layer, you just bring your code, your business logic, and Google will do the rest for you. I'm going to walk you through the four platforms to give you an understanding of what they are and how you might want to use them. And I will also point out some specific things that we are working on here in Poland. So let's start from the bottom. Compute, en compute engine. Compute Engine offers virtual machines. Um, think about virtual machines as your personal computer, only that it's not on your desk, but it's remote. Uh, it's in a Google Data Center, and you can access it remotely. Uh, so let me now show you how to get a server on GCE in a few seconds. I will do a live demo, so fingers crossed. So this is Cloud Console. It's a web interface where you can create and manage your GCP resources. It's a really good place to start exploring the platform. See, here are the four platforms I'm presenting today. But you can get access to many more, like storage and networking and uh, machine learning, everything. So let's go to the Compute Engine and uh, create an instance. When you, uh, when you create an instance, you can decide how big it is. You can get anything from one core to 64 cores, and you can get up to 416 uh, gigabytes of memory. We have a wide range of pre-cooked images, uh, Linux distributions and Windows Server. You can also bring your own image. If you want this instance to run web traffic, you want to probably enable HTTP HTTPS. By default, all the VMs are protected by, fire, by firewalls from the traffic from internet. Before I go ahead and uh, create this VM, I want to show you one cool thing. Many users, when they uh, get more familiar with the GCP, they tend to prefer 
command line over the UI, uh, and it's a natural process. But this web UI is a very good way to learn command line two and transition to command line later. For almost everything that you can do in this UI, you can get an equivalent command line. So this is the command line for the VM. And the cool thing is that you can run it directly from the browser. Whoops. Uh, so you don't have to install gcloud or configure anything on your computer. You, all you need is the browser. So let's go ahead and create a VM. Uh, booting the VM and programming the network takes like 20, 30 seconds. And uh, so there's one more cool thing I want to show. So when you have the server up and running, you want to SSH to it, and you, want to, uh, and you can start installing basically any software you like on the server. And you can also SSH directly from the UI. OK. Um, it will take a couple of seconds. Maybe I will not be waiting for that. OK, black screen. I don't know what happened. OK, okay let's go. OK, we are in the, inside of the VM, and you can you know, start browsing as in a normal uh, virtual machine. I really also wanted to do this demo, because this front end for cloud compute is being built in Warsaw. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out is sometimes that it, sometimes it can be hard to decide up front what is the right size of the machine for your service. To help with that, GCP will observe the load of the VM and the traffic and will recommend you the best size. Either decrease it to save you money or increase it for a better performance. This recommendation engine is being built in Poland as well. Together with the uh, uh, VMs and access to a global network, you also get uh, a set of tools that help you manage the service. Uh, one of them is auto-scaling groups of instances. You can configure it so it always keeps a certain amount of instances up and running. The system does it by observing the health and recreating the VM if they go unhealthy. You can also attach an autoscaler that will observe the CPU load and add or remove the servers based on your metric or on the traffic on, on the CPU load. So you still have a full control over what is running on the VM, but you apply an automation that helps you run the service in a cost-efficient and uh, reliable way. And Autoscaler and many other tools that help you manage GC instances are also being built in Poland. All right, let's go uh, one level up to Container Engine. Container Engine is our hosted Kubernetes environment. And as you might guess from its name, it's a platform for la running large number of containers. It handles a lot of infrastructure details for you, like virtual machines and networking. And by using the open source Kubernetes, it also manages the containers for you automatically. What are containers? I like thinking about containers as a lighter version of virtual machines. There are software packaging units that only take your code and libraries and make them independent from the operating system so that you can run multiple containers on one VM in isolation. Unlike virtual machines, they do not contain operating system. So they are much smaller in bytes and they start much faster. What are Kubernetes? You usually put just one thing into a container, like web server or database, for example. So when you want to start building system out of your containers, you usually end up having a lot of them. And maintaining a lot of containers can be challenging. So let me give you one example. Let's say I want to have a three-layer um, application database, backend, and frontend. 
So I package them into three containers. For redundancy, I want to have a couple of instances of each. Uh, I want to have a front-end accessible via public IP address and two upper layers auto-scaled. Even such a relatively simple service can be challenging to maintain. So here is where, here where Kubernetes comes in. They will start that up for you and make sure it stays up and running. Some of you may heard or played the game Pokemon Go. Um, this slide will show how fast the game were growing in the first days of its popularity. So this line shows the estimated traffic. The green line is the success disaster scenario. And the blue line is the real traffic. So it was huge success of the game. And it was also a huge success of the Google Container Engine, because the platform actually managed to scale for the game. And I'm very proud to say that uh, Google Poland is contributing to both Kubernetes and GKE, and specifically, they are working on the scalability on the of the platform. Now let's go another layer up to App Engine. App Engine is optimized to run your web code extremely well. The motto of App Engine is bring your code and we'll do the rest for you. So you don't have to think about operating system or virtual machines or any other piece of infrastructure when you use App Engine. This is called serverless environment. It doesn't mean that the server doesn't exist. It only means that from the perspective of a developer, the server is invisible. All you see when you implement and manage and deploy your app are application level constructs. App Engine also uh, offers very rich set of tools crafted for web applications like traffic splitting, security scanner, versioning, and incredibly rapid scaling. The last piece of our spectrums is Cloud Functions. It also is a serverless environment, but from the perspective of a developer, it's even simpler than, than App Engine. And it can be seen as a glue that enables you to very easily use uh, many Google uh, services, like speech recognition API and vision API, or listen to a changes in a database. With Cloud Functions, you can almost forget about the concept of an application. All you see or all you think about when you use Cloud Functions is your code, your function, and an event on which the function should be executed. So let me show you uh, how you do it. A classical, classical example is, um, uh, is uh, sending an email to a users when they upload an image to a database. All right. So let's go to Cloud Functions. I will create a function, upload an image to a storage, and observe that the function was executed. So I choose a trigger, cloud storage bucket. I specify the bucket that will be observed for changes. And here is my code. I will not be sending email in this demo. We don't have that much time. I will just pretend. And one small detail, I need to specify a bucket where my source code will be stored. And uh, create. Now I will go to the storage. Let's see the trigger. Let's go to the, we are in the storage UI. And uh, I'm uploading a file. Let's say a dog image.
Please upload. Okay. Uh, it doesn't want to upload the file. Ooh oh, ooh -hoo. yes, the file is there. <laughs> Success. So now let's go and see whether the function was executed. So I go to logs. Since we are in the, in the uh, source code, we are logging the fact that the function has been executed. And all right, the logs is not there, not there yet. All right, we have something. Do we have a dog? We have a cat. We have a dog, and we have a cat. OK. Uh, so let's go back to the presentation. Uh, so you see, that was easy. That was like a couple of clicks and lines of code. And all the glue between your code and the storage in particular, listening to the changes and making sure that your function is really gets executed uh, at least once. All that is handled for you by the platform. Uh, as some of you may heard yesterday, Cloud Functions also can be used with Firebase. And it's a very powerful way for the uh, mobile developers uh, to build a server-side extensions without having to learn or manage or understand any of the, or deal with any servers. Uh, and Cloud Functions are 100% designed and built in Warsaw. <laughs> All right, so a quick recap of the presentation. Uh, when you use Compute Engine, you think about virtual machines, operating system, and network. Basically, a uh, virtual infrastructure. Containers take you from the world of uh, virtual machines to microservices, containers, and application. When you use App Engine, you choose to abstract away from the infrastructure. And uh, all you see or care about is application and HTTP requests. And uh, finally, when you use Cloud Functions, you solely operate on piece of code, your function, and events. So now when I highlighted the differences between the four platforms, you might be asking yourself, so which one I should be using? My recommendation is that you go from the top. Check whether the platforms work for you and whether it's not constraining you too much. And if it's not, just take it. If it is constraining you too much, it means that you need more flexibility and control. So go la one level down. Uh, Google plat Cloud Platform has really a lot to offer. And we are very excited about its future. So if you are interested in learning more about it, uh, I encourage you to go to the Cloud Console or to cloud.google.com and start exploring. I'll also be around here today if you want to ask me any questions. Um, so now I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Bashad uh, Bazadi from Zurich, Zurich office. He's a senior engineering director, and he's leading a team of over 100 engineers building Google Assistant. Welcome, Bashad, on stage. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Beshad, and I work in the Google Assistant team in Zurich office. Um, yesterday, Tilke talked about uh, the ways, the different ways that you can bring the power of Google Assistant into your own applications through the Actions in Google platform. Today, I want to talk about uh, what Google Assistant, what we in Google uh, are doing to improve the Google Assistant across devices. So in Google I.O., Sundar sent this key message, which is, the next 10 years is going to be an AI-first world. And I'm personally very excited about that because I consider Google Assistant and building an assistant is actually one of the core implementations of uh, such uh, AI world. So in some way, uh, we feel that we are part of building this next revolution. 
But before going and talking more about the Google Assistant itself, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, AI revolution. Um, the AI revolution is in some ways similar to some of the bigger revolutions which happened through the past uh, 100 years. These were revolutions where they changed the uh, life of lots of people. They made lots of companies to disappear. Lots of new companies appeared. And they're actually saving lots of time from people. If you think about phone, uh, car, plane, and transistor, for example, just consider the plane. Before that 100 years ago, if you wanted to go from Europe to US, you needed a month on a ship. And only some people could do that. Today, you do it in one day or less than one day to 10 hours. And that's basically about saving time. Life of people is changing. Now, if you move fast forward towards newer types of revolutions which happened in the past, uh, um, uh, which happened around 20 years ago, is about PC and uh, internet. So all of a sudden, at home, we got connected to the information. So we didn't need to go to the library if you wanted to find how tall is the Empire State Building. And, and really, it's, um, it's, if you think about 20 years ago, that was the only way that to find the answers to such questions. Uh, so this is a big change again into people's life. We didn't, you don't need to go to a bank to check, to check what's your um, uh, bank account. You can buy things from home. And you don't need to wait for the next news uh, in, on TV to know what's the weather going to be tomorrow. You can just ask it. Um, but the but next revolution happened soon after, less than 10 years, and that's a mobile revolution, which was even bigger than the previous one. Because the, the huge um, PC, which was in, in the corner of your home before, now is replaced by these mobile phones, which is a smaller, and it's in your pocket, and you can, you can bring it everywhere. It's actually in some way more powerful, because it has a camera, it has a microphone, and it's more personal. You can take pictures, share, and communicate, and more. Mobile made are thinking at Google about product different. So we became a really a mobile first uh, company from, uh, from those moments. Um, however, the mobile revolution is still ongoing. And we kind of predict that by 2020, there is uh, going to be 5 billion mobile users uh, on this planet, which means that uh, really the scale is bigger than the PC and the web uh, uh, revolution, which was happening before. This is because the cost and, and, and bringing this to emerging market is much easier. This revolution is ongoing, but the next revolution is happening now. And it's bringing this revolution to the next level. And that's the AI revolution. This is where, for example, in the case of mobile, we're trying to make the, the interactions with mobile to be conversational, much more natural, make the, make the smartphones smart, and then uh, make them to um, understand intents, understand context, and answer things based on what they hear and what they see. Um, when we have these conversational types of experiences through, um, slide is not changing, uh, through the, uh, um, when we have these uh, experiences through the, um, uh, through a conversation with mobiles, we can expand that to all types of other devices too. So we have, if, you have a, if you're at car or at your watch at home, you can uh, use the same conversational experience and try to add that intelligence in a very consistent way through, through all your devices at, um, in different places. And, um, and now, the, uh, I repeatedly say conversation, conversation, and this is really the core of what we think about Google Assistant, because we kind of think that conversation is the most uh, used interface human beings have, the most used interface human beings have used. We all know how to talk from when we were a kid to when we were old. I mean, old is not tall necessarily, but, um, uh, but from different race, different ages, you would, people know how to interact with each other through talking. So if we solve that problem of conversational understanding, we have solved a big problem, and then we can expand that to many use cases. So I think the best would be now to, I mean, for, I want to show you Google Assistant, and I would like to invite the cameraman to come, and I will go to my uh, live demos, which is going to be quite risky for me. These are all live demos. And uh, you will have fun seeing me being scared, I guess. So um, so here on, on my phone, I'm going to show you lots of demos of uh, showing where we are um, today with uh, Google Assistant developments and, uh, and uh, on different, types, different aspects of what the Assistant is doing. So the, the first thing I would show is uh, about how Google Assistant is answering things uh, today. Let's start with, hi, Google. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Anything I can help with? Can you please tell me how is the weather going to be tomorrow in Krakow? <laughs> uh, 
Always needs a... I don't think, I don't think if you upload it will work. Can you please tell me how is the weather going to be tomorrow in Krakow? It'll be partly cloudy there tomorrow in Krakow with a high of 18 and a low of 10 degrees Celsius. So, so, so as you said, this is, a, this is a rather more natural language, longer types of questions, as opposed to when you type in a machine, you say, weather Krakow tomorrow. Here I use a rather long sentence of, in a conversation way. So we're trying to understand, and there's machine learning behind which understands that that, uh, that sentence is the same thing as weather Krakow tomorrow. So let's do more questions. Show me tourist attractions in Krakow. Attractions in Krakow include Wielika Salt Mine, Wawel Castle, Ojkow National Park, and others. Okay, so these are, these are more popular questions, right, about weather or attractions. But now I want to show you how uh, we actually try to expand these answering uh, uh, capabilities to really more specific and long tail type of questions. Uh, for example, Show me a list of rides in Europa Park. Europa Park's rides include Blue Fire, Silver Star, Woden Timber Coaster, and others. So we even know about the rides in an attraction park. Now I'm going to ask questions about one particular ride there. What is the height restriction for Blue Fire? You must be at least 1.31 meters tall to ride Blue Fire. Sir. Thanks. So, so what I'm trying to show here is that, I mean, the, the range of examples I can show is really big, but we really are trying to expand uh, to a long, wide range of questions, uh, and that's what you expect from an ultimate assistant. Now, the next example I'm showing you, and actually across my uh, demos, uh, it's a mixture of things which, uh, which is live and launched and some of the things which is not yet uh, launched but these are like internal prototypes that we have and, uh, and they're going to launch either in the next few months and in some cases next year. Uh, so uh, the next one is one of them uh, which we are trying to handle more complex natural language understanding. What is the name of the movie where Tom Cruise acts in it and he plays pool and while he plays pool he dances? Here is some information about the color of money. Former pool hustler Felsen decides he wants to return to the game by taking a pupil. So, so this, is, this, is, this is possible through merging like the power of search, the signals coming from Google search with machine learning. It's really a combination, combined system which is capable of doing these things. Um, we can see the cast, for example. Its cast includes Paul Newman, Tom Cruise, and 47 others. So now, now let me show you how this voice interface could be, uh, could be used for connecting to other services uh, from first party Google or, or type of others uh, outside Google. So uh, first I will show an example of how the integration with Translate could look like in this assistant world. Be my Vietnamese trans translator. Understood. I will translate all your following messages to Vietnamese. To stop, just say, stop translation. Hey, I have a problem. Can you help me? Hey, tôi có một vấn đề. Bạn có thể giúp tôi? I lost my luggage in the train. Y bị mất hành lý của tôi trong chuyến tàu. Stop translation. Okay. So, so you see that you can use this natural language and talking and get uh, connected to these uh, services and applications. Now I show another example, this time with the street view, again to show a combination of voice input and the natural language understanding connected to this service. So in this case I would say something like, I would like to be on the top of Eiffel Tower now, can you please bring me there? Opening street view. We actually call this project internally teleport. It's uh... a... <laughs> I think that's as good as it can, we can do for a teleport. Um, but um, so um, now I want to show you how this could be, for example, with, uh, integrated with a um, with an service which is not developed at Google. Uh, talk to WebMD. 
Sure, getting WebMD. Welcome to WebMD. I can tell you about health conditions, drugs, or even side effects. What would you like to know? What are the side effects of aspirin? Here's a summary from our X list. Severe nausea, vomiting, or stomach pain, coughing up blood or vomit that looks like coffee grounds, fever lasting longer than three days, and more. It actually failed. Um, we can try one more time, maybe. What are the side effects of aspirin? Here's a summary from our X. OK. So, but you know it works. I guess you are developing this, too. OK, so, but, but really, in the core of what we need is also to, to be able to talk to the different services developed by um, and merged by Actions and Google Platform uh, to the assistant itself. So in the next part of my demos, I want to show you how the assistant should be ultra personal, and because this is a kind of a personal assistant. So these are, uh, there, there are answers and, uh, and things which assistant could do about the world f for me, but we want it to also be answering things which is specific to me. For example, I can do things like, how is the traffic from Zurich Airport to my home? There's light traffic from Zurich Airport, ZRH, to your home, so it should take 43 minutes. So I don't need to say the, what's the address of my home, because my assistant knows that, and that's, that's helpful for me. I can ask for things like, when is my flight today? Your flight is Lufthansa Flight 1625 to Munich, which leaves today at 4.50 so, so p.m. Note that Note that these are all uh, happening automatic and through a different machine learning system helping uh, detecting that from Gmail. We also, we, are, we also have ways to do explicit in an explicit way. For example, if I say, how is my team doing? Barcelona is second in Group A. It's only the, it's only the beginning. But um, <laughs> these are all. I think that's a, these are all the Barcelona fans. But, um, uh, but I think the reason that I actually can do that is because I explicitly uh, said this. So I can say something like, what is my favorite team? You told me that you like Barcelona. So I explicitly said I like Barcelona one day, actually, I think a few months back to the assistant. And from that moment, she actually, if I, say, um, if I say, what's my favorite team or how's my team doing, it considers Barcelona. OK. so. Um, now I want to show you, this is, this is a way that we can actually improve the assistant by teaching them something to it, like about myself. I'm going to show you a more fancy version of that, which is potentially coming next year. Um, when the weather is more than 25 degrees, I can swim in the Lake of Zurich. OK, understood. Can I swim in the Lake of Zurich this weekend? No, you can't. The temperature is less than 25 degrees. What's the weather in Zurich this weekend? Here's the forecast for Zurich. OK. So, um, so that's, that's kind of things that really, if you think about a personal assistant which you can improve it through natural language, this is really it's going to be much more powerful and uh, easier to use for many people. So the next part of my demo is I want to talk about context. Context is very important. The different meanings of context is uh, used, uh, uh, used to make the interactions with the assistant easier and more natural. So, and we use it in different places. One of the places that we use context is speech recognition itself, trying to understand uh, the words. So now I try to say an example where first I don't give a context. Normally it fails. Uh, and then I will try to give context and see whether it works or not. Um, something like, how high is the ricey? Here's what I found. The How high is the ricey? So the point here is that if I don't give uh, context, it's, it's hard uh, to, uh, and it even hangs sometimes. Here's the forecast for Zurich. OK. That's <laughs> it tries to do something because it doesn't understand what it says. But, um, but now, now try it now. Now let's see if I, what happens if I give some context to it, something like highest Tatra mountains. High Tatras includes Lomniki Stit, Rice, Gerlakovsky Stit, and so, other mountains. So as you see now, there is a Rice there. So this time now, I'm going to ask, and hopefully it should work. How high is the Rice? Uh huh. I can search the web for answers. Highest Tatra mountains. 
High Tatras includes Lamniki Stit. How high is the Rai Sea? Okay. Rai Sea is 2,503 meters tall. So, so this shows that contextual voice recognition is actually going to play a big role because people actually always try to continue talking about things which is related and uh, things which is also personal and location specific, contextually relevant. Um, now, let me show you another uh, usage of context when context is used to understand the, the entities itself. For example, pictures of Thomas. Check out these pictures. I think without a context, that's perhaps the best we can come up with. Bayern Munich team roster. The roster for FC Bayern Munich includes Robert Lewandowski, James Rodriguez, Aryan Robin, and others. So you see some Thomas is here. Pictures of Thomas. Pictures of Thomas Muller. Here you so, are. So in the context of... In the context of uh, the previous sentence, then Thomas should be interpreted as the different entity in this case. Now, now I want to show you how context is helping to have follow-on uh, conversations. Something like, where is the Empire State Building? The address for Empire State Building is Empire State Building, 355th Avenue, New York, New York. One I want to see pictures. Pictures of the Empire State Building. OK. How tall is it? The Empire State Building is 381 meters tall. Who built it? Sterrett Corporation. When? Construction for the Empire State Building started in March 17, 1930. What are the Italian restaurants around there? I found a few places. Call the first one. It's Call in New York. Call Fiori. So, so you can see that I'm having a conversation back and forth with... Uh, I will stop there. <laughs> So, so you can see that I said like seven, eight sentences about Empire State Building. I mentioned only one time. And this is all thanks to the power of context and trying to put context into the conversational understanding. So this is much more getting closer to how people talk. Still, there's lots of problems to be solved there, but we're excited about these uh, steps in the right direction. Um, now, I want to uh, uh, show next another example of context, which is context of what you see. Uh, so for that, I'm basically trying to show some examples of integration of Google Lens with the Assistant, where we're adding visual input uh, to the Assistant. If uh, I don't know what, what are you seeing here. Now I'm putting an apple here. And I'm going to the uh, Google Lens part of the Assistant. And I would ask, how many calories does it have? There are 95 calories in one medium apple. So that's the... This is, this, is, this is an experience that you can have where you have visual input and voice input together. Um, so, but let me try to show you one other example. I can try to get some money. Um, how much you can put? Okay. Okay. Um, this is visible, yeah. How much is this in Swiss franc? 250 Polish zlotys equals 67 Swiss francs and 10 wrappers. So, so you can see that uh, and this combination can be very useful. I was actually the other day in, walking in Krakow yesterday seeing buildings and trying to take pictures I would go to the, with Google Lens and try to ask questions about uh, what I was seeing around. And that's quite uh, going to be more powerful experiences uh, for this future uh, of the assistant. Uh, the last example I want to show you is, uh, because the speech recognition often worked here, I want to show you also that we have worked on improving the speech recognition in a noisy environment. Uh, so for that, I need your help. And we will, the setup will be that 
We will cut my mic, and I will ask all of you to make as much noise as you can. Your mission should be to make me fail. And I will ask, uh, and I will ask a question, like my favorite team, when my favorite team is playing next. And uh, yeah, we can even put some music to make the, the noise to be higher. It's OK if I fail. Uh, it's just fun. Let's do it. So, um, so please make as much noise as you can, and please cut the mic. is on Saturday at 8.45 p.m. when they will take on the Espanol. So we actually have spent, um, can I have the mic back? Yeah, we actually have spent lots of time on trying to improve speech recognition in noisy environments, added lots of data to the machine learning systems behind by no automatically generated noise, like fake noise of stadium or, uh, or people or cars. And that's, that's how we have actually significantly tr managed to improve, uh, improve this. Thank you, the cameraman. So I can go back to uh, my slides for. Thank you. So um, what you have seen in the previous de in these demos is actually a collection of lots of technologies going behind. Lots of that is actually being built in Zurich and uh, in Europe. Uh, so. Speech recognition, context understanding, natural language understanding, understanding the world, because we were answering things about the world, understanding the user, understanding the context, image recognition, and personalization, and many more. But this was uh, the ones that I uh, put on the slides. And this is, uh, this is all. We believe that these are all early steps of uh, the Google Assistant and, and the age of the Assistant, but it's a very exciting moment. I want to remind that um, I talked about AI revolution, and. And that doesn't mean Google Assistant or Age of Assistant is the AI revolution. It's one of the things which is happening in this AI revolution. But the AI and machine learning is being used heavily in, uh, and going to be used much more in, in many industries, such as health, agriculture, smart cities, smart cars, and many more. So it's the right time to really try to invest in different in industries in, in, in the AI. And while, uh, while at Google, uh, um, we're, we're to, I'm working and we're working on the Google Assistant, I feel very excited of the adding these types of intelligences into, uh, into the Google Assistant. But I think in the end, the Google Assistant will be more powerful depending on how many different services and applications it can have. And this is where you all can help by integrating with the, uh, with the Google Assistant with the, with the different use cases that you have and applications that you have, and take part with us in building this uh, AI revolution. Thank you. And with, and with that, I would like to invite Michal again to join to the stage. So we've had two great talks uh, to kick off the day today. Um, and I would especially like to thank those two speakers, Bashad, who is very brave with all those demonstrations. Thank you. And, <laughs> and Ava, who uh, showed us the very exciting work that's going on in uh, Warsaw in Poland. Um, <clears throat> I was reminded of one of my favorite geeky t-shirts as I, as I was listening to Ava, which is, there's no such thing as cloud computing, only someone else's computers. Um, and the thing is, when that is true, you want the people running those computers to know what they're doing. And so trust in Google, use our Google Cloud platform. Now, um, I'd advise you all to, to make best use of the code labs that allow you to do sort of follow-up activities, especially on the Google Cloud Platform stuff that Ava was talking about, but also about some of our open-sourced um, AI stuff that relates to what Bashad was talking about. Um, and for the rest of the day, you can also join in um, sessions, trainings, and explore the sandboxes that are scattered around. And don't forget that we're wrapping up at uh, quarter past five, 1715, back here in the main auditorium with the closing keynote. Uh, so thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Welcome to Google Developer Days Europe. We're happy that you'll be joining us for two days of talks, demos, hands-on training, and more. By now, you've checked into registration on level zero to receive your badge. 
your badge must be visibly worn at all times. The Google Help Desk is also located on Level Zero. If you have any questions or are in need of assistance, feel free to stop by. All talks and sessions will be taking place in either the auditorium hall or the theater hall and are accessible on Level Zero through Two. For hands-on trainings and code labs, be sure to visit the S3.1 and S3.2 Training Chamber Hall and S4 Code Labs Conference Hall Complex on Level 3, where instructors will teach you how to use the latest Google technologies, or you can work at your own pace to execute different coding challenges. This is also where you'll be able to meet with product teams for office hours and ask them questions or visit a review clinic to get feedback on an app that you might have created. No Google event would be complete without showcasing the newest products and technologies, so we invite you to explore the different sandbox demos that are located throughout the venue on all levels. Be sure to check out the Community Lounge and Google Developers and Cloud Certification Lounge located on Level 2. There will be scheduled meetups, fun activities, and engagement opportunities, as well as places to just sit and relax and meet with your peers. This is an inclusive community. No matter your experience or background, you're welcome here. We encourage you to be excellent to each other by saying hi to new faces, building on one another's ideas, and reporting any uncomfortable experiences. We have a zero tolerance policy for harassment of any kind. This policy is posted on large signs around the venue and our full community guidelines are on the event website. Please share your positive and constructive feedback with staff and speakers. Staff and speakers can be identified by their staff or speaker badges or shirts. Let's make this the best developer event ever by creating an excellent experience at this year's Google Developer Days. Thanks. We started is on a living room couch, and we really started because of the problem that we had, which was asking the same question to our closest friends, where are you, what are you doing? We were baffled by the fact that there wasn't a solution that solved this problem, and we felt like we could build one that was better. The value that is drives for all users is knowing which of your friends are nearby. So if you look around where we are right now, an arena, how many times have people gone to a basketball game, hockey game, or a concert and found out the next day that they had friends who were at the same event? And think about all those moments that are missed because they didn't know they had friends there. So what we're solving is letting people know who's nearby and making those moments matter. My name is Diesel Peltz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Is. I'm Mark French, co-founder of Is. We felt there was no reason users should manually go fetch data. When I get a text message, there's no reason for me to tap refresh. And we felt, why should it be different from anything else? And Firebase let us solve that. Firebase really allowed us to enhance user experience by making it real time, simplify the UI by not having a fresh button and cut down on development time. Like any startup, the most valuable asset that you have is your team and your time. And what Firebase has allowed us to do is save 50% in terms of time by moving that much quicker with a product. It's a game changer. We're using eight features from Firebase right now. They're analytics, remote config, dynamic links, the real-time database, and more. Traditionally, that would have been in eight different places. And now we go to one place, which is the Firebase console. We're eager to launch this product in a big way. We're seeing how people are using the product and how they're inviting more and more friends that we're concerned. We're growing very, very quickly. So we sleep a lot easier at night knowing that we got Firebase that's really there to build that infrastructure. If you're a developer, use it. We love it, and it's enabled us to focus on developing the user experience and not have to worry about the things in the background that should be there. Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology, and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. 
My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Reyes Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Ray's Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class, and we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. The Google Developer Agency Program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and which touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. The comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next.
Hello, everyone. My name is Florina Montanescu. I'm a developer advocate at Google. At Google I.O. earlier this year, we launched Architecture Components, a collection of libraries that help you design robust, testable, and maintainable apps. Since then, we've been discussed a lot with, well, with a lot of you. And then we saw a lot of, the, a lot of questions that kept on repeating. Stuff like, OK, I'm already using RxJava in my application. Should I start using live data also? Or my architecture is implemented using MVP. Should I now move to MVVM? Or I need to display a large list in my application. What should I do? In today's talk, I want to tell you our suggestions of how to handle all of these. But before I go into this, I want to go a little bit over the architecture components just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And also, I want to mention a few of these do's and don'ts of the architecture components. So let's say that this is an activity that displays information about the user. One of the biggest problems for us and our developers is configuration change. So for example, when you rotate your device, the activity gets destroyed and then recreated. So to help with this, we introduced a lifecycle and the lifecycle owner. So an activity or a fragment has a lifecycle. Therefore, they are a lifecycle owner. And a life, the lifecycle of a lifecycle owner can be observed by a lifecycle observer. And in that observer, we can define methods that will be called whenever specific lifecycle events will be triggered. So all you need to do is annotate those methods with on lifecycle event plus the event name that you're interested in. Um, architecture Components provides one such lifecycle-aware component, which is live data. Live data is a data holder, so it can hold information about the user, for example. And other components can set the value that is being held. And activities and fragments, so objects that have a lifecycle, can observe that live data. And then they can react on the changes of that live data. And then they can update the UI, for example. But when the activity is on pause or on destroy, the subscriber is removed. So the live data is considered inactive, and the events are not propagated. But once the activity is recreated, we subscribe again, and we can update the UI. The class designed to store and manage the UI data that survives configuration changes is the view model. So let's see how the, uh, the lifecycle of the view model actually looks like compared to the activity lifecycle. We can see that we can create a view model only once the activity is created. And then the view model will only be destroyed when the activity is finished. So uh, more precisely, the view model survives configuration changes, but it will, it will not survive pressing back on your phone, killing the application from recents, or when the fragment kills your application. So this means that the view model is uh, perfect for handling long-running operations, because the view model will be updated independent on whether the data is observed or not. So this means that you will no longer get these null pointer exceptions when trying to update a non-existing view. So make sure you avoid referencing views in view models, because they can lead to memory leaks or crashes. So the mindset here changes a little bit, because instead of pushing the data to the UI, you let the UI observe the changes. So just make sure you don't hold any UI logic in the view, but rather move this in the view model so it can be easily unit tested. So for example, it will be the view's, uh, view model's responsibility to get the user, prepare it to be displayed, and hold it for the UI. And then the UI will notify the view model of the user's actions. The view model would work with a repository. This will be a class that you define to get and set the data. 
So the repository models are uh, modules are responsible for handling data operations. They provide clean API to the rest of the application. They know where to get the data, what API is called to make when the data is, up, uh, is updated. So you can see them as mediators between different data sources. So it's a good idea to have a data layer in your app completely unaware of the presentation layer. Because algorithms that synchronize or keep caches or make database synchronizations are quite complicated. So you want to make sure that you add a single uh, point of entry to your data. So this means that the repository will know which API to call to get the user from the network. And because we want to make sure that we don't request the data too many times, we're also going to save it locally in the database. But to save the data in the database, architecture components comes with a new library, Roo. Room is a wrapper over SQLi database. It is an object mapping library that provides data persistence with minimal boilerplate code. So for example, let's say that this is our users table that has a user ID, which is the primary key, and the name, and all sorts of other information about the user. And what we want is actually every instance of, that, uh, of, of the row uh, should be an instance of a user object. So to do this, we define a user data model that we just annotate with entity. Here, we define the primary key and the column infos. To actually access the data in the database, we work with DAOs, so data access objects. Um, we're annotating our class with DAO. And then we define um, access points. So we can define queries, inserts, update, and deletes. Um, queries can also return live data objects. So they're making this query an observable query. So what's an observable query? Let's say that we have this users table, and we want to get the users by ID. So let's say that we're interested in the user with ID 4. So live data will uh, get the initial data from the database, which is the user with the name John. But then, when we update the data in the table with, let's say, Mark instead of John, the live data will automatically emit that new information. So using observable queries means that we have a UI that observes, uh, that reflects the latest changes in the databases, because the repository would expose a live data object. And then the view model will also expose a live data object for the UI. So <clears throat> what we've, I've been mentioning before, or until now, with the view models and with the repositories is what we call a guide to app architecture. It provides testability and separations of concerns. But I saw that you've got a few questions about this. So for example, how many live data objects should I expose from my view model? Should I have, uh, so let's say that the live data contains a model for the screen. Should I expose only one? Should I expose multiple? So let's say that the top part contains some user information, and then the bottom part, some general settings data. So you can see that actually these are two different logical units. So what you could do is group together these logical units. So you could expose a live data for the user info, and then another live data for the settings. What if I'm using MVP? Should I switch to MVVM? So should you replace the presenter with the view model? Actually, it depends. It depends on the amount of logic that you have on how testable your classes are. The main idea is that you should keep the logic in the activities and in fragments to a minimum. So what you could do is put a view model between the presenter and the repository and still let the presenter work with the view. But what's extremely important is not to let view models and presenters know about the Android framework classes. And make sure you distribute responsibilities. Don't be afraid to create new classes. Should I use live data if I'm already using RxJava? If you're already using RxJava, chances are your project looks something like this. You're using it throughout the entire application. 
You're using it on the network part, on the database part. You have a repository that uh, exposes flowables or observables, and view models that also do that. So one way you could do this is uh, split the responsibility. Live data was made for the UI, so you could leverage that and let the live data handle the connection between the view model and your activities or fragments. You could use a composite disposable where you keep your subscriptions to the Rx Java, and then in the view model on clear, you just clear those disposables. How about the data? How do we save it? Where do we save it? Should you save it in the database, in the view model? What should you save in on save instance state? So before going over the few scenarios, let's look at this again. So only when the activity is finished, only then the view model is cleared. So let's remember this. So let's see what happens when the application starts. Um, when the activity starts, um, you call on create. And in on create, we would actually get that reference to the view model. The view model will talk to the repository to get the user. So the repository would do a request to the network calling a get user from your backend. The repository will save that user information in the database. And then it will expose that information to the view model. The view model will create the model for the UI, because maybe you don't want to expose all of that information that you have about your user, maybe only the first name and the last name. And then the activity will use that uh, information and will display it. Let's see what happens when you do configuration changes. So for example, when you're rotating the device. Um, so on configuration change, the on stop is, is being called. But the view model is still, it still exists, still holds a reference to the UI model. When uh, the application goes to foreground or it's recreated, the on start is, uh, is called. And then in our display method, we just get a reference from that UI model from the view model. That's it. We don't need to work with the repository at all. Let's say that our application goes to background, and then the user navigates back to the app. So in this case, when the activity goes to background, on saved instance state is called. And then uh, when the activity comes to foreground, we just uh, display the user information based on whatever we have in the view model. Again, without requesting anything from the network. Scenario three, application goes to background, and then the process is killed. So in this case, when the activity goes to background, we should, uh, on in on saved instance state, we should save the user ID. This is why. Because when the process is killed, the view model is also killed. So when the activity starts, in the on create, we would have in the bundle that user ID. So what we can do is just inform the view model about the user ID that we're interested in. And then the view model will just talk to the repository to get the user. But the repository already has that information in the database, so we no longer need to do another network request just to get the user. So the on save instance state allows us to have the minimum amount of information that we need to restore our UI without doing any extra network requests. So what should you put in each of them? In the database, uh, put the data that survives process death. In the view model, put the data that's needed by the UI. And then, in on saved instance state, put the minimum information that is needed to restore the data. Instead of just a user, Let's consider that we have a, li a list of users. Many applications need to load a lot of information from the database. Database queries can take a long time to run and use a lot of memory. And we have a new paging library that we will release soon that can help you with all of this. So the main components of the paging library are a page list adapter that actually extends the recycler view adapter, a page list, and a data source. The data source is an interface for page sources to provide data gradually. But you will need to implement one of the two data sources, either a key data source, 
which will be used when you need to load item uh, n based on the item n minus 1, or a tiled data source that allows you to jump in any place of your data set instantly. And you also need to implement another method, load count. This one will be the one that uh, tells whether you have an infinite or a finite amount of items that you need to display in your list. The page list is a component that loads the data automatically and can provide update signals to, for example, to the Recycler View adapter. The data is loaded automatically from a data source on the background thread, but then it's consumed on the main thread. And it supports both an infinite scrolling list, but also countable lists. And you can configure several things. You can configure the initial load size, the page size, but also the prefetch distance. So here's the data flow. Let's say that we have some data that we put on the, or on the data source on the background thread. The data source invalidates the page list and updates its value. And then, on the main thread, the page list notifies its observers of the new value. So now, the page list adapter knows about the new value. So on the background thread, the page list adapter needs to compute what changed, what's the difference. And then, back on the UI thread, the view is updated by in the on bind view holder. So all of this happens automatically. You just insert an item in the database, and then you see it animated in, and no UI code is required. OK, let's look at the code a bit. So to tell the page list adapter how to compute the differences between the two elements, you'll need to implement a new class, diff callback. Here, you will um, define two things. You will define how to compute whether the contents are the same and how to define whether the items are the same. To simplify the connection between the data source and the recycler view, we can use a live paged list provider. So this will expose actually a live data of a paged list of our user. So all you will need to do is provide a data source. But if that data source is true, then it will be generated for you in the DAO. You don't need to write any invalidating handling code. You can simply bind the live data of a page list to a page list adapter and get updates, invalidates, and lifecycle cleanup with a single line of binding code. So in our user DAO, we would return a live page list provider of our users to get the users by the last name. And then in the view model, we would extend from the architecture component view model. And then we would keep a reference to that live data of a page list. And we will get that reference from the DAO uh, by calling get users by the last name. And then calling create using the configuration that you want. So for example, setting the page size to 50, setting the prefetch, size, prefetch distance to 50, and so on. In our activity, the activity needs to be, of course, a lifecycle owner. And then in the onCreate, we get a reference to our view model. We get a reference to the recycler view, and we create our adapter. And then we use another um, handy class from the architecture components, live list adapter util. So this provides hooks for live data and lifecycle, so you can bind with just one line of code and not worry about the cleanup. And then we're just setting the adapter to the recycler view. Let's look at the adapter. So our adapter would extend page list adapter, and then it will connect the user, which is the information that we need to display, with the user view holder. And then we define uh, the callback, the diff callback, for our user objects. And then in on bind view holder, all we need to do is bind the item to the view holder. That's all. We have a lot of new concepts and components with architecture components. Uh, but the thing is, you can use them separately. So if you want, you'll only be able to use lifecycle, live data, and page list, or only view model, or only room. But you can also use them together. So 
start using the architecture components to create a more testable architecture for your application. Thank you. We started is on a living room couch, and we really started because of the problem that we had, which was asking the same question to our closest friends, where are you, what are you doing? We were baffled by the fact that there wasn't a solution that solved this problem, and we felt like we could build one that was better. The value that is drives for all users is knowing which of your friends are nearby. So if you look around where we are right now in Arena, how many times have people gone to a basketball game, hockey game, or a concert and found out the next day that they had friends who were at the same event? And think about all those moments that are missed because they didn't know they had friends there. So what we're solving is letting people know who's nearby and making those moments matter. My name is Diesel Peltz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Is. I'm Mark French, co-founder of Is. We felt there was no reason users should manually go fetch data. When I get a text message, there's no reason for me to tap refresh. And we felt, why should it be different from anything else? And Firebase let us solve that. Firebase really allowed us to enhance user experience by making it real time, simplify the UI by not having a fresh button and cut down on development time. Like any startup, the most valuable asset that you have is your team and your time. And what Firebase has allowed us to do is save 50% in terms of time by moving that much quicker with a product. It's a game changer. We're using eight features from Firebase right now. They're analytics, remote config, dynamic links, the real-time database, and more. Traditionally, that would have been in eight different places. And now we go to one place, which is the Firebase console. We're eager to launch this product in a big way. We're seeing how people are using the product and how they're inviting more and more friends that we're concerned. We're growing very, very quickly. So we sleep a lot easier at night knowing that we got Firebase that's really there to build that infrastructure. If you're a developer, use it. We love it, and it's enabled us to focus on developing the user experience and not have to worry about the things in the background that should be there. Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology, and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Reyes Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Ray's Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. 
The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class and we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. The Google Developer Agency program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and which touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. And the comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next.
Hello. Hello. It's great to see so, so many of you here. Uh, my name is Matat Tamel. I'm a developer advocate uh, at Google based in London. Dzień dobry. <laughs> Jestem Mark, witam serdecznie. I don't know what you said, but hopefully it was something good. <laughs> I'm not totally sure either, but I think I said, good morning, I'm Mark, and I welcome you to our session. Great. Uh, so, first of all, before we start our talk, uh, you might be wondering, what's a developer advocate? Uh, one of my coworkers and a good friend of mine, Felipe Hoffa, you might know him, he, he basically says a developer advocate is someone, is a software engineer, who has license to speak. Um, I think that kind of captures what we do. We are software engineers uh, by experience, but we come to events like this and talk about Google Cloud-related technologies. Um, at the same time, we want to get your feedback so, uh, and bring that back to engineering. So after this talk, we have office hours on level three. So if you have any questions or any feedback about Google Cloud, please come and see us. Um, so today, we're going to talk about fundamentals of Google Cloud Platform. Um, we have a bit.ly link for the, for the slides, so if you want to slice, just get it from there. Um, and I've been with Google for one and a half years, but Mark has been around more than me. I think he's been there since 2011. So, Mark, you want to tell us about those good old days uh, in 2011, how it was? Sure. So, uh, back when I started, Google Cloud Platform was quite a bit simpler. Uh, this is actually what the platform website looked like in 2012. There were four products, App Engine, Compute Engine, Cloud Storage, and BigQuery. It was really nice and easy. You knew exactly which tool to use for which job. You could really get your head around the entire product offering. So those were kind of the good old days for me. Uh, this is what it's like nowadays. We have more than 60 Google Cloud product services, and uh, so many that I can't even fit it on fit them all on one slide. So there's a lot of choices out there. Well, that's good, right, Mark? I mean, more services, more tools, more choice. That can be only good, right? Well, it's kind of a mixed bag, actually. The good news is we have tons of capabilities. So you can build almost anything you can imagine now. And it's a very powerful platform. But the downside is there's kind of a high cognitive load associated with all that choice. You have to actually think a little bit more and understand a little bit more to figure out which tool to use when to use it, and how to use it. Greg Wilson came up with this uh, chart, which I think is really nice reference. And by the way, for anybody that is, is photographing, we do have these slides online right now. So we'll share this with you after the, I mean, feel free to photograph, but we'll share this with you. Uh, it's actually up now. Um, but this chart summarizes every cloud product, every Google Cloud product in four words or less. So it's Really nice synopsis. Today, we're going to focus on the four highlighted areas. And even there, we're not going to get to go too deeply, because we have 30 minutes to cover all of this stuff. And each of these products, could, we could spend hours on. Uh, but we'll, give, we'll, we'll focus on those four areas. We'll probably touch on a few others. And we'll try to just kind of give you a high-level view, uh, essentially a roadmap, of all the capabilities of Google Cloud, Pro Google Cloud Platform. All right, uh, first, let's talk about compute. Um, I heard that in Keynote, there was a compute section, so this will be a little bit of a repetition of that, but hopefully, you, there will be some new stuff. Uh, so what we're trying to answer here is, if you have some code and you want to run on Google Cloud, what options do you have? That's what we are trying to answer. Um, at the high level, you have three separate buckets when it comes to how to deploy your code. The first one is virtual machines. So you can think of these as physical machines, um, except they're virtualized and, and they're running in someone else's data center. Um, so you can pick and choose the CPU you want, the memory you want, and then you also get to choose the operating system. It can be Linux-based or Windows-based. And then once you have the machine, you can install whatever you want. So you have, you have full uh, control, but at the same time, you have full responsibility with virtual machines. So virtual machines are great, uh, but they're kind of heavyweight because you need to virtualize the whole operating system and everything that comes on top of that. Uh, so more recently, we have something called containers. So the idea with containers is that instead of virtualizing the operating system, you're virtualizing the, the actual process that your application runs. So you're virtualizing your application and its dependencies. Uh, this way, the, uh, and you create, from there, you create a container image. And this container image is much more lightweight than virtual machines. So containers are really easy to move around. They're really fast to start. So they're much quicker and agile way of running your applications. 
And if you're like me, you usually don't care about infrastructure, you don't want to care about virtual machines, you don't want to care about containers, you just want to deploy your code and let someone else manage that for you. So that's when serverless comes in. In serverless, literally just create a function, deploy it, and let someone else scale it for you, run it for you, all that kind of stuff. So as Meta said, uh, containers have really changed everything. And that's another thing that I've noticed over the last five years has had a huge impact on the entire industry and the cloud in particular. Uh, it kind of really picked up steam when Docker was released in 2013. Uh, so containers really enable a bunch of things that we, we didn't have before, but containers by themselves are not enough. If you think about deploying your applications in containers, these entirely self-contained modular units that you can kind of scale incrementally, it's all wonderful, but if you have a complex application with, say, a bunch of front-end servers, a bunch of back-end database servers, maybe some middleware, it's complicated to get all that stuff to work together, to monitor it, to restart things when they fail. And that's where orchestrators come in. So we've got a kind of a new breed of software, container orchestration, the most uh, popular one being Kubernetes. And then another piece that you kind of have to reinvent if somebody hasn't created a nice pattern for you to reuse is the service access layer. So if you want to apply some security policies, te telemetry, uh, capture analytics, customize how your service is accessed. It's really nice to have a service layer on top of it. And that's what Istio is all about as a service mesh. And so uh, the combination of all these innovations together, containers, orchestrators, and a service mesh, really gives you a very powerful way to manage and deploy your apps, especially in the cloud. Yep. Uh, so now let's look at what, uh, what you have on Google Cloud um, as products uh, to deploy your applications. The first thing that you want to decide is how much customization you want and how much management you want. So there's this spectrum. That the more highly managed things are, the less customizable they are usually. Or if you want things to be customized, then they're not so highly managed because you have to maintain that yourself. So if you want to have things customizable, you have Compute Engine. So the idea with Compute Engine, as you heard before at the keynote, is that you get a VM with an operating system with certain CPU and memory that you choose. And then once you have the VM, it's yours. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, so you only get like, the, the machine and then the operating system with it. Um, at some point, you might want to put some uh, software on it. So one way of doing that is that you can install it that yourself manually. But we also have something called uh, Cloud Launcher. Uh, it's kind of like a marketplace for solutions to, to deploy to Google Cloud. So um, you can install things like MongoDB, uh, ASP.NET Framework, and there's a bunch of other solutions from Google and from outside Google. So the idea of Cloud Launcher is that with one click, you can get a solution deployed to Compute Engine. So let, just let me show you uh, some of this quickly. So here I am in Google Cloud Console. Uh, you've probably seen this before. Um, on the left, we have bunch of products uh, on Google Cloud, but the one that we are interested in is in the Compute Engine. So on Compute Engine instance, I can see the, my VMs, and then these are the VMs that, that I have uh, already running. If I want to create a VM, I just do create instance, and this takes me to a new page, so I'll give, give my instance a name. Let's, so let's call this instance GDD Krakow. And then you can choose your zone. So we have zones all over the world, but since we're in Europe, let's choose Europe West. Um, so for machine type, you can customize it. So you can pick and choose how many cores you want and how, many, how much memory you want, uh, all the way from one CPU to 64 CPUs. Uh, you can also choose uh, already pre-configured um, instances. So I'm just going to choose an N1 standard, which has one CPU and, and four gigs of memory. After that, you can choose what kind of operating system you want. So we have all different flavors of Linux. Uh, from Debian, CoreOS, um, container-optimized operating systems, even Windows servers, uh, 2008, 12, uh, 16. You can even install applications. So if you want to have SQL Server, for example, you, under application images, you can install that. So I'll just choose a standard uh, Linux instance, let's say De Debian 9, and then you, you can allow HTTP, HTTPS and create, and this will give me a VM within a few seconds. So I have a, a Linux VM already running. Um, you can easily SSH into that. Just click this button, and you don't have to worry about keys. And everything is fully managed. Uh, so it, this will launch within a few seconds, and you can get into it, and you can SSH and do all, the, all that stuff. But if you're a Windows person, um, I have a Windows uh, app running here. You can RDP into that. So right from the browser, just RDP, and enter my password, and then 
you're, boom, you're in and you can do all the Windows stuff that you need to do. Um, so that's how you get VMs. Uh, but if you want to install something on these VMs, then there's Cloud Launcher. So if you go here, Cloud Launcher, this is, as I mentioned before, a marketplace for different kinds of solutions. So you can install LAMP stack, WordPress with, with one click. So let's just search for uh, ASP.NET because I'm a .NET guy and I just want to install ASP.NET Framework. So this solution uh, will give you a Windows Server and ASP.NET Framework, IIS, and SQL Express. So I'll just say launch on Compute Engine and give this a name. So let's say ASP.NET GDD Krakow. Choose my zone as um, Europe West again. Um, I'll keep my machine tab as it is. And then Windows Server, I'll choose the latest one. And I'll just keep the default, hit deploy, and now this will give me a Windows Server with ASP.NET Framework and IIS and SQL Server Express deployed. So we, we, it will take a couple of minutes, but it's right there. So that's that. Um, but as we mentioned, uh, virtual machines, uh, they're kind of old school now. So we have containers. And how do you run containers on Google Cloud? Um, the easiest way to do that is App Engine. So the idea with App Engine is that you take your code, you deploy it using G Cloud. Um, and then from that, then on, we take that code, we create a container for it in, in the cloud, and then we host it on container repository, and then we deploy it to App Engine. Uh, so with App Engine, you get uh, dashboards by, by default. You get versions. So every time you deploy your application, you get, you get different versions. Uh, you get traffic splitting. So if you have multiple versions, you can split the traffic between them. And you get auto scaling. So by default, it starts on two VMs, but then it can auto scale all the way to 20. So it's very easy. It's the easiest way to start with containers on Google Cloud. Um, but at some point, you, you might need more control. Um, sometimes you want to be able to define uh, multiple containers, and you want to be able to scale them independently. So you basically want to create a container cluster. For that, we have Container Engine. So Container Engine is basically managed Kubernetes. So we, give you, we manage the Kubernetes master for you. And, and with one command, you can get a Kubernetes cluster with the master and with the nodes, and then you can just use the kubectl command line tool to, to schedule containers. And we also have some tools around containers. So we have Container Builder, which is a, a way to build containers in the cloud really fast. And then we have Container Registry. So once you build your containers, they get hosted into this private space for your project. And then from there, once you have the container image, you can deploy it to Compute Engine. And then you can deploy it to App Engine, or you can deploy it to, to uh, Container Engine and Compute Engine, anywhere you want, basically. So it's available to everything, everything you have. And then finally, uh, my favorite is Cloud Functions. So in, in Cloud Functions, you create a Node.js function that does some kind of functionality. And then you define what triggers that function. So it gets triggered by HTTP calls, or it gets triggered by um, pop-up messages. And then you just deploy that. And, and don't worry about containers or VMs or anything like that. Everything is fully managed for you. So let's take a quick look at these as well. So. I already deployed an, an App Engine application, so let's just take a look at that. So if you go to App Engine, uh, first I will click on versions, and then you can see that I have two versions already deployed. Let's say the, the, uh, this version 3 is the one getting the traffic, and it's being run, run on two instances. Uh, version 4 is not getting any traffic. I can easily change that, so I can come here, do split traffic. I will do IP-based uh, traffic splitting, so I will just add my version, and then say, let's say this will get 50%. So now. Each version will get 50% uh, of the traffic, so I, I can do my testing and make sure that everything works. So if you go back here, you'll see that they're both getting 50% uh, of the traffic. If I go to Dashboard, um, this app is not being used, so you don't see much. But then under here, you see the, the different versions. And then I can click on the version. And then from here, I can see the latency traffic, VM traffic. So all this stuff comes for free. Um, you can even see the instances. So by default, my app, the apps run on two instances. And these are regular VMs. You can SSH into them if you want, but you don't have to because App Engine kind of manages this for you. And this will be auto scaled from 2 to 20 uh, uh, if there's a need. So that's kind of App Engine. And then if you look at um, Container Engine, I can take the same container image and I can deploy it to Container Engine and get that managed by Kubernetes. So here I have a cluster already defined. And if I look under workloads, uh, in Kubernetes, you basically take your container and put it in, in what's called a pod. So I have a pod running with the same app. Um, and then once you have your pod, you can expose that to the outside world uh, using something called service. So with service, you get a load balancer, and then you get a public IP. So here I have the IP. And if I click on it, I have this hello world, very exciting application. But the point is that you can take the same app and basically move it around from App Engine to Container Engine really easily. And finally, what I really like is um, 
cloud functions. So here I have a cloud function that I deployed. Um, it's a hello world kind of cloud function. And if you click on it, um, it's running somewhere in the cloud. I don't know where, but, but I don't care anyway. And I can see the trigger. So this is a pop sub topic triggered function, meaning that if there's a topic that it, it listens, and if there's a message that goes to the topic, it will be triggered. I can even see the source of it. So here, this is my function, and basically it gets an event and displays the message. And you can even test it right from here. So in here, I can send a pop sub message and say, let's say this is message, and then I'll say, hello world and then test the function. So this will invoke my function. And then when it's done, I can see the logs. I can see the output, everything right here. It's very easy, fully managed for me. So that's that. Um, let's go back. So thanks, Mete. Yep. I'd like to uh, briefly touch on something that I think is largely invisible to most people when they're using our cloud platform. Uh, when you deploy one of the computing elements that Mete just talked about, the data that's moving around, either from the outside world into Google's cloud or between systems within our cloud, is riding on top of the same network that powers these seven products, each with a billion users. So we don't have like a separate network where we're, we're transporting all the information for your cloud you know, compute elements and another network that we make really good for our own internal use. It's the same network fabric extremely high performance, and you know, it's the same network that's serving up all those YouTube videos, the Gmail, Google Search, Maps, et cetera. And the reason it's so high performance is that Google has built its own private network, massive internal private network. It contains dedicated fiber links around the world. It, we even own our own undersea cables, and as a result, I mean, it's not just the facilities. A ton of engineering work over the years has gone into making it very high performance, very low latency. And you're taking advantage of all that power when you're running your applications in, in our cloud. Um, another kind of key design piece of our network is that we've built it so that when users want to access our cloud platform, App Engine apps or Compute Engine or containers or any of that stuff, we've got it designed so that we route their connections to the closest point of, pro point of presence to that user. The idea being that we want to get them on this high-speed Google backbone as fast as possible so that the bulk of the communication is taking place over this uh, very optimized network. And as a result, we not only get very high throughput and low latency, but we get very predictable uh, response time. And this is a, a little map of the extens extension of our data centers around the world. As you can see, we're in a lot of areas, but we're constantly trying to expand the footprint to accommodate platform needs all around the world. We also have several higher-end networking capabilities, which I'm not going to go into today, but we'll have some resources at the end to, so you can dive into those if you're interested. So we've talked about computing, and we've talked a little bit about networking. And now I want to turn to how you store your data, something everybody has, every application has to do. And I'm going to try to cover everything you can do in that domain in one slide. So it's going to get a little bit busy. Uh, we have several products. It's really kind of like tools in a toolkit. And it's just uh, some really powerful options, but it's just a matter of knowing which one to use for which situation. The very first one is in-memory storage. So this is simply caching for your App Engine app or your Compute Engine app. Think of Redis or Memcache, something along those lines, as a service. Uh, then we have the category of relational databases, so traditional SQL-based relational databases. And we have Cloud SQL, which you can think of as managed MySQL or Postgres. So you end up with a bunch of servers where the Images are maintained for you. The latest software is installed. It's backed up. But you're still thinking about database servers at the end of the day. And then we have Spanner, which kind of takes it up a level. And you really can think about just the database independent of any server. So it's really database as a service with a lot of other nice features as well. Uh, and then on the NoSQL side, we have Cloud Data Store. It's a hierarchical key value store that comes out of the App Engine world, but is now completely generalized and can be used from anywhere. And we've got Cloud Bigtable, which is also similar, similarly schemaless and NoSQL, 
particularly well suited for very high capacity storage jobs and for very high volume read and write uh, scenarios like an event log or page views and uh, you know, detailed uh, telemetry type applications. We have an object store called Google Cloud Storage. This was one of the very first products that came out as part of the Google Cloud platform. It was the first product I worked on back in 2011. It's a very powerful binary object storage facility, uh, global scope replication, and strong consistency. Very nice features. And uh, then we have block storage devices. So we call these persistent disks. This is essentially a network block device for attaching you to your VMs. And the idea is it's network resident, and it lives kind of a, its own life cycle. So if your VM uh, goes down, or you even delete the VM, your data is still persistent on that, on that disk. And you can get those in SSD format or spinning disks. Uh, lots more to say about that, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to, for time, uh, get through it. Uh, and then, of course, BigQuery, which we'll, we'll see more in a minute, but um, that's a really good way to store data as well as to analyze it interactively. Wow, that's a lot of storage options. Uh, but I keep hearing about Spanner. Um, can you tell us what's special about Spanner? Funny you should ask. <laughs> I actually have a slide about Spanner, Menta. Thank you. <laughs> And, and it would have been good if I didn't advance to it early. Um, so yeah, Cloud Spanner is this, it's very new. It was announced earlier this year. And it's um, a it really interesting uh, new database type. It's basically a managed, uh, unlimited scale, effectively, database as a service in the cloud. Now, whereas traditional relational databases are very strong in terms of uh, ACID compliance and strong consistency and data semantics, but they are often difficult to scale. A lot of times you'll see companies having to shard uh, multiple concurrent instances of, a, of an RDBMS. And, and whereas traditional, uh, or NoSQL rather, is just the inverse of that. So it scales very easily. You just add additional nodes to a cluster, but you often have consistency challenges trying to make sure everything is uh, strongly consistent and updates are seen everywhere at the same time. Spanner gives you the best of both worlds in that. It gives you the scalability of a NoSQL system, and it gives you the uh, semantics of a, of a traditional relational database management system. And I'd like to actually just show you real quick what it looks like to work with Spanner. So this is the same platform, or same console, rather, that Meta was just showing you. Um, but I'm in the Spanner domain. And when we're working with Spanner, we create things we call instances. And instances are simply collections of databases, but they're completely abstract. I don't have to think about how the software is configured or anything like that. Within the instance, I create a database. So I'm going to take the, this sort of imaginary example that I'm a university administrator, and I need to keep track of the database for all the students in the university. So I've created a database I call university. And I have two tables in that database, departments. So these are the different subject areas. They have a department ID, a budget, and a name. And students. So these are an enumeration of all the students. So I have a, uh, a department ID, which is inherited. So every student is affiliated with a department. Then I have an SID, that's my student ID, unique key for this table, and a student name. Now, one of the really nice things about Spanner is I can dynamically change the schema. Let's say I decide I want to add a, uh, a column to this table. So I'll say, Edit Schema. Anybody have a, something they'd like to add to, to the student record? What's the, uh, what's the attribute that causes college students the most stress? GPA. Let's add a GPA column. Let's make it a float. We'll add that and say Save. And it's now updating the schema. There can be tons of data there. It's going to update all the data that I have now, as well as make it possible for me to store new data. Um, and the database is continuing to run. There's no downtime. So it's not stopping ongoing operations. It's continuing to serve requests as we speak. And while it's doing that schema update, I'm going to show you another thing. 
Let's say I'm wildly successful with my new database, and I have more load than I can possibly take. And I just told you earlier that it's really scalable. So what I can do is go to the instance page, maybe. There we go. And I can say edit instance, and I can simply change the number of nodes from one to three, save. And I now have tripled my capacity that easily. I now have three times as much database serving capacity as I did before. So that's, uh, I think the schema update is done, as you can see. And that being able to just turn that knob is really one of the major advantages of uh, Spanner scalability. All right. So now let's talk about big data in the last four minutes that we have. <laughs> so big data at Google started with MapReduce. Um, back in the day, um, we were trying to process lots of data, and then there was a paper on MapReduce that basically explained how to take lots of data and break that down into small chunks, then map them to different machines, and then and then I apply some kind of aggregation and get a result back. So after MapReduce, there was a lot of innovation within Google. So there were things like Bigtable, Flume, and Spanner. So these were either papers or internal implementations that, uh, that people couldn't use outside Google. Uh, because of this, we had a bunch of Apache projects that were influenced by these papers. So we had uh, Hadoop, which is the uh, open source MapReduce implementation. We had things like Spark and Pig and Hive. Uh, and because of this split in, in, in innovation, we have two products on Google Cloud. Uh, we have Dataflow, which is basically the way the, the state-of-the-art uh, data processing pipeline that came up at Google, and now we are making it available to people. But at the same time, if you are already using Hadoop and if you are already using Spark, there's something else called uh, Cloud Data Proc. Uh, it's a way to run your Spark or Hadoop jobs on, on Google Cloud. So uh, if we think about the big data world, the typical kind of thing we want to do is to have a processing pipeline. And so I'm going to just briefly walk through that pipeline. The first phase would be capturing your data. And we'll come up with a, an example of how you might do this. Imagine you wanted to track all of the activity on Wikipedia. So imagine you had an event firing, like a HTTP post or something like that, every time somebody pulled up any article in Wikipedia. Uh, Cloud PubSub would be a perfect example of something to use for that, because it's a very high capacity uh, repository. It's a message queue, and so it can then publish those events to any number of downstream consumers. We might feed that downstream into data prep, which is a way to cleanse your data and add semantic checking and rearrange things. Uh, and that might feed into data flow, which can be a very um, flexible pipeline building tool. You can use Apache Beam to program the, the, the processing there. And it can also operate on either large batches of data or streaming data. So you could actually do, use it in sort of a real-time fashion. Uh, the output of that would be the process data. And we might want to store it in one of the storage facilities I mentioned earlier. We could do real-time analysis on it using BigQuery. And I'll actually show you an example of that in a second. And then we might want to actually take that data and work on it interactively in a more user-friendly way. So we have Cloud Data Lab, which gives us the ability to use Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebooks to interactively play with the data. And we also have Data Studio, which is a very nice tool for building interactive dashboards and other visualizations. So let's hop over to the console again. This is a different part of the console, but this is for, for running BigQuery. And I've actually preloaded a month worth of Wikipedia page views into this particular database. So here's my query. I can format it nicely. Um, I'm going to turn off used cache results, because I don't want to cheat. It'll come back blindingly fast, but it won't be true. So I'm going to run this query. What this is doing is scanning every line in the table of this database. And it's looking for occurrences of Krakow. Uh, because the O can be written in different ways, I've, uh, depending on language, I've used a regular expression to uh, avoid that. So not only am I scanning every row in the table, I'm running a regular expression on every single row in this table. I got my output. And if we look at the job information, we see that it's scanned almost 50 gigabytes of data. And the query explanation shows us the number of rows. It scanned 
billion with a B rows, didn't just scan them all, it ran a regular expression on them all. So I think, I hope this gives you a sense, and I didn't mention the, the punchline, is it was under five seconds. In under five seconds, we ran regular expression queries on 1.8 billion rows of data. Hopefully that gives you a sense of some of the power and speed you'll get with BigQuery. Great. Um, and then last but not least, machine learning. Um, so machine learning is big, and I think this graph shows why. Uh, this, is the num this is the amount of machine learning at Google and all the different uh, products that uses machine learning. So you can see an exponential growth in the last few years. Um, so when it comes to using machine learning in, in your applications, you basically have, have two ways of using machine learning. The easy way is let someone build a model, machine learning model, and, and give you an API and, and use that machine learning from your application. So you're not really building machine learning yourself. You're just consuming someone else's machine learning model. Uh, and then in the other model, sometimes the, the given model is not, um, is not good enough or the, maybe you want to customize things, so you need to actually create your own machine learning model. So for that, uh, you can create and serve your own machine learning model You're using things like TensorFlow. Um, so in terms of using models at Google Cloud, we have a bunch of machine learning APIs uh, for different kinds of models that we built over the years. So we have speech API for speech recognition. We have vision API for image recognition and a bunch of other things. So basically, we, we built all these models all these years, and we are just making it available to you with an API call. And I just want to show you really quickly a demo for the Vision API. So in Vision API, you pass an, an image, and then you get information about the image using machine learning. So here I have a picture of a cute cat. Sorry for the dog, dog lovers. I don't have a dog picture. But in this one, I pass this image to uh, Vision API, and then I get a JSON back. But if you look at the JSON in a graphical way, the, machine, the Vision API figured out that this is a cat, and it even figured out that this is a British short hair cat. And then from there, it can extract the color. It can extract uh, whether this is an adult image or a medical image. Um, if you pass in uh, more complicated things, uh, like a stadium, it figures out that it's a baseball stadium. It, f it picks up the text from, from different places. It even picks up uh, people's expressions. So it picked up the sky and then the fact that he is joyful. And it even knows where the location is. So you can see the kind of things that you can get from uh, Vision API. Thanks. So uh, underlying all of those products that you saw, that exponential curve that Meta showed, is TensorFlow. And for those who haven't already encountered it, it's a framework for building machine learning models that Google open sourced almost two years ago. It's now become more of an industry standard, com uh, kind of communal open source project. Tremendous contributions and tremendous popularity. It's particularly well suited for building complex deep learning models. Uh, and uh, you know, neural networks and those sorts of things. And uh, when you start to get into that domain, uh, you really need power. You need computational power. It's not a lot of those models you can't just run on a, on a laptop or something. And that's where uh, Cloud Machine Learning Engine comes in. So we've built this product to make it really easy to build and serve models, TensorFlow models, in the cloud. So the idea here is you get a fully managed infrastructure. You build your model, prototype it perhaps on your, on your workstation or wherever, and then you upload it to the cloud, and you'll benefit from a very optimized environment for training and for serving your requests. The other advantage you get is uh, the TensorFlow processing unit, which is optimized hardware. We've built ourselves custom ASICs that help do the tensor math orders of magnitude faster than we've been able to do in the past. The result of all this is that we're making it easier for people to build complex models so that you can really focus on the model and not worry about things like, where do I run it? How do I get all the CPUs I need? How do I get the GPUs? How do I coordinate parallel processing of models? A lot of that stuff's being made really easy so that you can just focus on what you care about, which is your own model. And that's it. Uh, so that was a lot of information. Uh, the main page that you want to remember is cloud.google.com, but there's other links as well. Um, we also have a free trial uh, if you want to try out. Uh, it's cloud.google.com slash free. Uh, you get $300 for 12 months. So don't take our word for it. Try it out and see what you like and what you don't like. 
Yeah, and I want to add that that's really the best way to learn. I mean, we're doing our best to tell you in a very short period of time what it's all about, but the, I find learn by doing is a great way to go. So avail yourself of the free tier, try some things out, try building something. We think you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, and maybe you'll build the next amazing application. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Jinkuya.
Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one, and nine times out of 10, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least, that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behave very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase Dynamic Links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, you can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing, too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase Analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about dynamic links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away.
myself. I'm also a Google Cloud Developer Advocate, as the speakers uh, before me, Meta and, and Mark. So we understand ourselves as software developers with a license to speak. Or if I, the, the way that I like to introduce myself is like the bi-directional interface between you guys who develop on our platform and the software engineers inside Google that develop the products. So please, please reach out to us with your feedback, be it good and bad feedback, uh, so that we can improve our products. So let's go back a little bit in the history. Um, and some of you might still remember these. I have one of those here, like this like little nice floppy disks. And that was all you pretty much cared about in the 80s and maybe in the beginning of the 90s to like install an operating system and install programs like WordPerfect or things like that on, on your machines. Uh, network wasn't such a big thing unless you were a bigger corporation that could afford it, but otherwise you basically had your, your uh, machine and your programs all on that. Now, fast forward today, this is not that easy anymore. Like, we live in a mobile world. Uh, everybody wants to have access to anything at any time. If you develop a really popular app, you want to scale with the demand uh, based on, like, if people are waking up or playing throughout the day or to the, the coffee or lunch break. So applications look more like this today, right? They're quite complex in the sense of, like, you have multiple services, you need some load balancing, you need some storage, things like that. We heard about some of the offerings that we have under the Google Cloud Platform in the talk before. Now, as a developer, I myself, I don't want to really deal with like operating that. I don't want to look at, like, is my, my app still running? Do I have to move my app from A to B because I do maintenance or things like that? All I really care about is adding more features and innovating and pushing them out to my users as fast as possible. So how, how can we do that? So if we look at like a little bit of the history, how apps or um, the apps were deployed basically on machines or physical hardware back in the days, we basically started with um, installing the operating system directly on your physical machine and adding all the apps and dependencies of these apps to this machine. Now, usually one app might not have exhausted that machine, so you added multiple apps uh, uh, next to each other on one machine, and they could interfere each other. Now, some of you might still know that term of never, run, uh, never change a running system. That is from these days. Basically, when you had that running, you don't want to touch it. So that hinders like innovation and basically rolling out new features. So, to get a little bit more isolation between your applications and make it a little bit safer in terms of iterating through new versions, there was a new thing that came out like a decade ago, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, where we looked at like, okay, how can we abstract the physical hardware and actually run your operating system in kind of like a virtual environment and then just have multiple on one physical machine. So that's where virtual machines came in. We were basically sharing the hardware through a hypervisor, but this virtual machine still had an operating system. You still had to install patches for security and things like that. So this still took like quite a while. Like if you wanted to iterate and if you wanted to uh, start up a new version of your application, it still took like a minute to start up this operating system. So it took quite some time if you had to react to like uh, demands in, in your applications. Now the new way to do things is actually to get, go another layer above and really uh, encapsulating all, only the things that you really need for your application and sharing even more of what you had before. So if you look now, you have the, the operating system and the kernel that you actually can share, and you have like the container that so we package our application in a container. It's pretty much just running as a process on your operating system. And with this, it's super wide late, wide, lightweight and can be started and stopped within seconds. Now, I have all these containers, which enable me to innovate and to roll out new changes quickly. But as I mentioned before, like, applications are complex, right? So I, what I really want to do is like, I want to have a system that helps me to run all these containers. And that's where Kubernetes comes into play. Kubernetes was inspired by how we are running containers inside of Google. We are running billions of containers, starting and stopping them every week. Uh, everything runs in containers pretty much inside Google in a system that is called Borg. Now, we didn't want to open source directly Borg because there is some technical depth. But what we wanted to do is, out, out of what we learned 
building Borg, we wanted to build a system for everyone who can use the things that we learned to manage containers. And that's how Kubernetes was started from scratch in Go and was open sourced uh, two years ago and then was one of the founding, uh, was actually the founding project for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Now, what it, Kubernetes does is things like it handles failure, it manages your containers, but there are a couple of like, core principles that are really important for us when we build Kubernetes. One is we wanted to meet the users where they are, in the sense of like, we didn't want to force you to rewrite your entire applications completely. We wanted to make it as easy as possible to have your applications and port them basically into Kubernetes. So first step, of course, containerize them. And once you have, to con uh, have them containerized, your containers don't need to be any special uh, from running them like, by themselves with a Docker engine, for instance. Uh, another thing is we didn't want to couple uh, parts in Kubernetes. So if you want to change certain things, if you want to change the scheduler or things like that, you can do that. You can just go and check out the Kubernetes repository on GitHub and just change the schedule as you like it. So it's really about like being open and being able to have everyone who uses the system to modify it in the way that they want to. Now, really, what's really, really important, what I like to talk about is um, that Kubernetes is about running applications in a declarative way versus an imperative way. So what does that mean? It basically means you tell Kubernetes how your application landscape should look like, but you don't tell it how to get there. Kubernetes will figure that out by themselves. And with this, with new versions of Kubernetes, you get all the goodies of like how to make this even more efficient. Now, um, another important part for Kubernetes is the portability. You can run it on any public cloud. We have a managed service, Google Container Engine, for it, which makes it very easy to get started. It's actually, in my uh, opinion, the easiest way to get started. But you can also run it on things like this. Though this is a Kubernetes uh, in a Raspberry Pi cluster. So I have basically uh, five Raspberry Pis here. I installed an Ubuntu on this and installed Kubernetes on this. And I can pretty much play live Chaos Monkey on this Raspberry Pi cluster, which is pretty cool. So if you want to learn Kubernetes, this is a good way to start. Now, the core concepts within Kubernetes to run your containers are actually four that I want to touch on in, uh, in this session. The first one, first and foremost, are pods. Pods is basically your atomic unit which moves through your cluster. A pod basically bundles one or multiple containers together, and it moves through your cluster, gets an IP, but you should never talk to this IP directly because a pod is an ephemeral concept in the sense it can, can start and die at any point in time. Now, to make sure that there are always as many pods available as you declared in your configuration files, we have replica sets or deployments. And deployments help you to basically say, like, I have want to have five pods of this kind. And the replica set will watch that there are always five, uh, five pods of this kind. Now, to make them addressable, to actually be able to talk to these pods, you use something that is called service. Service is pretty much a load balancer over the, over the pods that you have available and routes the traffic to the pods um, that are available. Now, the service and the replica set both need to kind of know what they are managing, like what they are responsible for. And that's where labels come into, into the play. Labels are like an orthogonal concept on top of this, which you can attach to any kind of API objects within Kubernetes, and then you can select on this. So basically, a replica set selects on a set of uh, labels um, to know which pods it's responsible for. Or a service uh, has a set of labels it matches to see what kind of pods to route traffic to. But this is a lot of words. and. I like living on the edge, so I actually like to show you a little live demo. Now, every live demo has to start with some kind of, like, what I want to show or run. So in this case, I hope it is uh, readable, I have a Go app, actually. Uh, my language of choice nowadays is Go, and it's very simple and easy to get started with it when you get a hang of it. Um, and in this application, I have basically two endpoints that you see down here where I have the hostname and the hello endpoint, and I let this run on, on port 8000. Now, um, you see the implementations of the functions here. So basically, one, I'm just returning a string, hello, from GDD Europe. And for the other one, I'm actually just responding with the hostname and the version of the application that I'm running. 
Now, the first step that I want to do is I actually want to build a container. I want to build uh, this app and then put it into a container that I can run on Kubernetes. So that's where a Docker file comes in. So in Kubernetes, you can run model, uh, different engines. Uh, Docker or Rocket are uh, two of the supported ones. So there might be even more out there that are supported. Now, I, uh, since Docker is the most popular one, I'm going to run a Docker container. So what I'm doing here is actually something that just recently came into Docker is a multi-stage build. Why am I doing this? Well, if you build your application, you need a lot of build tools. You need your like, uh, compiler, you need your linker and all the libraries and things like that, and your container would be really big. But I want to have my container as small as possible. So as you can see here in this first step that I'm doing is I have my build container, I'm loading my, uh, my source code in there, and then in the run command that you see there, I'm building actually my statically linked binary. Now in the second step, what I'm doing is I'm copying from that build container my statically linked binary into a so-called Alpine container with version 3.6. Now Alpine, uh, by the, f like the base image of Alpine is really small. It's like eight megabytes. And so even if I would have a, a bad Wi-Fi at a conference, I could still do this demo most of the times. So, Let's go ahead and, and do this. I'm going to build my demo here. And as you see, I have it already built. But basically, it goes through all these steps and builds my uh, application. Now, I have my container built and have my container um, tagged. Now, I needed to make it available for Kubernetes on, on Google Cloud. So first, before I kind of got started, I just want to show you in the upper left a little command that you can see there. That is the command to get started with Google Container Engine on Google Cloud. gCloud, container clusters create, GDD uh, cluster, for instance, and then you wait three minutes and you have your cluster uh, ready. Now, what I'm going to do is I actually want to push this to my private uh, Registry. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to push this to my private registry. Since I have pushed that before, it should be hopefully pretty quick. Uh, and going to go through there. So now I have it pushed on my private registry. registry and I'm going to show you really quick here. So this is my private registry. It shows you the container that were pushed and the versions. And you can delete them there, add other tags, and things like that. So very flexible. Now, the first thing that I want to do, and I can show you that I have a um, a Kubernetes cluster running is that I have three nodes in my Kubernetes cluster. Now, I use kubectl, which is basically kind of like the magic CLI tool to, to interact with Kubernetes to run my application. So in this case, I use kubectl run. I give that a name. I point to an image which I want to run in, the, in my pod, and I, wanna, uh, I point to a port that I expose for this, for this application. So now, when we do this, I want to actually show you uh, what is happening uh, here. So on the upper right, you see actually three kind of uh, API objects that I'm going to show. And the, on the very first, you have the pods that are running. And now we have like our version one of our demo app running. The second one is all the services that I have. And the third one is all the deployments that I have. Now. What I don't have right now is I don't have a way, basically, to talk to my application. So I'm, I have to make that somehow available to the outside. And that's where services come into play. So what I'm going to do is I do a kubectl expose, uh, which basically gives me the chance to expose my, um, my service either inside the, the cluster or uh, even to the outside. And how do I make it exposable to the outside? That's where dash dash type load balancer comes in, which basically tells uh, Google Cloud Platform, please provision and load balancer, an external load balancer, and make that application available outside. So you're going to see there, I have now a service coming up, demo app with a cluster IP, which is my internal IP, and an external IP is pending because it takes a little bit of time. Now. You might want to uh, debug your, your application. So what I'm going to do is I can actually exit into my container. Um, in this case, I have to, of course, use the uh, ID that, I, that you see in the upper right corner on the, on the top. And I'm going to do and ex execute bin bash. And up now, I'm on the, in the lower one, you see that I'm in, in the container. So I can do a ls, I can do a ps, and see what's running. My app is running. I can even do a vget qo and say http uh, slash slash localhost 8000, and say a hello. And you see, OK, hello from GDG Europe. 
So that works. All right. And so this gives you a possibility to debug and see like what's going on in, in the container. Now, the next thing what I want to do is actually uh, what I can do with this. I want to see if it's now externally available. And you see we have an external IP over there on the right side. So I'm going to copy this external IP really quick, put it in here, and run this. And this just uh, refreshes every second. Now, what I want to do is uh, with Kubernetes, it makes it very easy to actually do rolling updates. So uh, you, um, push a new version of your application. So what I want to do here in this case, I say, OK, you are an awesome crowd, because the audience is also always awesome. Uh, I'm going to save this. And I'm going to go back to my shell and build this. So I do a Docker build. And in this case, I want to have, of course, uh, a new version. So let me go back and do the version 2. I'm going to build this. Now you see I actually made a change. So this takes a little bit longer. Um, so we're just going to wait for a second till that is done. And once it's done, I can now push that to my container registry. So I have G Cloud Docker push. And now I push version 2. And now we wait again a little bit. While we're waiting, uh, with Google Container Engines, you have a lot of things that are managed for you by Google that, if you want it somewhere else, would have to manage yourself. So things like you can do auto scaling, you have all the monitoring integrated, like the master is uh, supervised for you, and things like that. Now, I want to push out the, the next version. And before I want to do this, I want to show you really quick how easy it is actually to scale an application. Now, you have like the Christmas um, uh, like business coming up, and you want to scale, up your, scale out your application. So you just scale the deployment. As you see on the upper right, there is a right now I have a desired one. I'm going to scale that, and you see coming up on the right two new containers, and we are live. And you can see that we are live on the, low, uh, on the top left as like the host name is changing. But we still have version 0.1. So what I want to do really quick is actually edit my deployment and go to my version uh, 2. So this is the configuration file that you see here. I just changed live in my configuration file the version. And I'm crossing fingers that it will work. And you can see it's terminating version 0.1. Now it's running zero, uh, version 0.2. And as you can see up there on the right, it actually did the rolling update of my application. All right. So this hopefully gave you a brief introduction. <laughs> Thank you very much. This gave you hopefully a brief introduction in what Kubernetes is capable about. But what I'm really uh, delighted and excited about to, to have here is uh, Stefan from, from Flixbus, who can actually talk about how to implement Kubernetes in production and talking about the experience of running Kubernetes in their company and how it enabled them to innovate and grow. Really, really great. So let's welcome Stefan. Thanks, Robert. So I'm Stefan. I'm an engineer at Flixbus. I'm here to talk to you about what, how, what we do with Kubernetes at Flixbus and how we use it in production. So first, who is Flixbus? So I think 200 of you actually got some vouchers from Flixbus and traveled here by bus. So that's really cool. So we are a long distance bus travel company. But we're actually not a bus company. So even though we have around 1,500 buses on the streets, we don't actually own any of those buses. So you can compare it to the Uber, Uber model. We're just doing all the marketing, planning, um, booking engine, but we don't actually operate those buses, and we don't actually employ any of those bus drivers. Um, so we cooperate with um, small to mid-sized bus operators for that. Um, we have pretty good growth. Like our first commit was in December 2011. Now we have around 40 million passengers this year, um, and it's an estimate. And this is um, at the bottom, you see the graph of our Slack users in IT. Um, when I joined the company two years ago, we had around 50 people there. And now, altogether, it's like uh, 200. Uh, not only engineers, but um, it's challenging to grow that fast. So how did we start? Um, so we built a big monolith. Um, made of, out of PHP and MySQL, 
uh, and a bit of memcache and all the other external services you have, and all the developers are working on this big monolith. This became a problem because um, we want to grow the teams, we want to grow how we work, we need more engineering power, so you cannot only work on, on this single monolith. So what do you do? Well, you take the newest fancy solution that is called self-contained systems, and basically it means you split up the teams and the code and the code base by business domains. And every one of those self-contained systems might be, con might be multiple microservices that work together. But it also means, of course, splitting the code base, the data model, you need a messaging bus, you need to uh, handle data migration, you need to uh, like have new teams, new responsibilities, so there's a lot of challenges doing that. And one of those challenges is infrastructure. So we used to have a two-person team managing our infrastructure, and this worked pretty fine. Um, over the years, we, we got pretty stable, but of course, that's not a sustainable solution, especially if you want to like, grow the number of applications that we have. So the small and centralized team resulted in a high communication over it. Every time you needed to do something, you needed to talk to this team and, hey, please, can you do that? Please, can you upgrade PHP to this version? Please, can you install this extension? Please, can you, um, I don't know, do something else here? And we were running on bare metal, and this makes it really hard to do system upgrades. Um, we were like two years behind on a Debian release um, because there was more important things to do. Um, and of course, at some point, you cannot scale your system anymore. So this overall resulted in low velocity of new application and services. So we need to change that if you want to do microservices. And our goals for when picking a new infrastructure or looking for, for, for a solution there, um, we had a few goals here. And one was that it needs to be reproducible and unified in mind for applications, including development. So we had a lot of different vagrant boxes. People were moving around, um, which were not up to date with the staging environment. And we had, a, of course, our production environment. And it's hard to keep them in sync. So containers are a really good fit here to make them all the same version and have them all be consistent. All the teams must be able to iterate their environment quickly and independently. Um, this is really important so teams can, if one team wants to save with PHP 5 and the other team wants to go with PHP 7, it should be, hey, sure, no problem. And we want it to be future-proof. We don't want to redo everything every two years. Um, and the ease of use is also, was also really important and also vendor independence. So Kubernetes is a really great fit here. Um, and I could talk about a lot of uh, great stuff in Kubernetes, for example, pods. Um, they are a great model to, 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 to model um, entities in a, in a cluster. And role-based access control is another really great feature to, to reduce overhead. Um, the deployments are really amazing in, in Kubernetes. The authentication model is really good. But also the strong API in the ecosystem and the community, um, I think, makes Kubernetes special. So let's talk about how you can use the API to build your own great applications. So in February 2016, we were dabbling around with Kubernetes. And there was no ingress controller yet. So ingress controller is a way to specify how to get traffic into your cluster. Um, so we wrote our own. And it was basically 100 lines of Go code. Now it's around 200 lines of Go code. And it's running, still in production. We want to get rid of it. But uh, of course, it's always hard to get rid of temporary solutions. And this is how, basically, this is how the code looks like. So we connect to, an, so let's go, uh, we connect to the HTTP server, to the endpoint, and say, hey, watch true. So please give me all the updates. Every time an endpoint changes, please give me all the new, the, the new endpoints. And we do some more, we open a reader for it. And so you, what you get is, if you open this, go to connect to this endpoint, is you get a JSON object per line um, in the thing. So we read up to a new line. We decode the JSON uh, object. We put it through a templating engine, put it to a, distant, like, to a directory on the, on the disk, and we basically reload Nginx. And of course, there's not a lot of like, all the error handling is missing there, but this is actually still working, running production for us. And this basically took an afternoon to write. Another great part is the community of Kubernetes. So um, we wanted to integrate Kubernetes or authentication part of Kubernetes with OpenID Connect to Azure Active Directory. Um, and it seems we were the first person because there was a bug in how the validation was working. So we submitted a bug, um, and we did some our own investigation and found the corresponding part in the, in the in Kubernetes source. 
Um, there was a fix in master seven days later, and another six days later, there was a new release with the fix included. So it's basically 14 days from reporting the bug to getting a new release that we could deploy on our infrastructure. And usually, you pay a lot of money for this, I think. But you, with Kubernetes, you just get it for free. Another part are deployments in the API. So we tried various approaches to deploy applications. Uh, some developers use kubectl, some use Jenkins, some GitLab CI. We tried a bit of Helm. But one of our developers said, OK, this is all not, not working too well. Um, I, I think I can do this better. And he started doing that. And he created a deployer, which we use internally. And the cool th thing about deployer is that it creates a, a new environment, a new staging environment for every feature branch. So in the past, we always had this problem. Hey, can I deploy my code? So we do seven deploys a day in the old system on average. And people want to test their changes on a staging environment. But if there's no one free, then you're blocked. And we don't want to block people. So now we have one staging environment per feature branch. And I'm going to show a quick demo for that. So please switch to my laptop. OK, perfect. So I have a very simple application here, a Docker, uh, Docker file with um, Nginx. And we're basically just exchanging the index.html file there. I have a file with a YAML file with all the Kubernetes definitions I need. So we specify a service. We put some stuff here, some labels that we need for our custom load balancer. You probably want to use an ingress controller now, an ingress resource. And we have a deployment. And basically, we do some templating to get uh, the dynamic stuff into our, uh, into our um, YAML file. We have a deployer file, so a bit like Travis CI. We we're looking into those things as an inspiration. I mean, by, hey, OK, what cluster do I want to deploy to? What namespace? What containers are there that they need to be built? And we configure a GitLab CI to build our containers, push it, and then trigger the CI, deploy a C, uh, CI pipeline. So let's make a change here in the HTML file. I will uh, create a new branch. And now it's. 1307. I commit the file and say, hello, GDD. We push it. And now, so you see the master branch is already deployed. And everything works fine. And the demo gods um, listen to my prayers. Then we fill a new deployment here in a new service. So there it is. So the new deployment has a new, basically it's all in the same namespace. They have a new prefix. I'm going to give it a few seconds because our load balance is throttling uh, like reloads. So we might need to give it a few bit of time so it works. This is the master branch, which still works. And we can, OK. So all opens up probably still needs a bit of time to reload. And there it is. So you get a feature branch for every or like environment for every feature branch in your, when you're developing automatically. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the presentation. So these things all fit very well together and help us solve our problems that we have because every company is unique and, and sometimes you need to change things and, and there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And Kubernetes really gives you the tools to, to, to help solve your own problems. So what's the current status? Uh, how does our infrastructure look like? So not everything is running Kubernetes yet, but um, we already have around 60 namespaces um, for around 12 teams. Um, at peak, that was like 800 containers running on 32 nodes. Um, and we have multiple production services running there, including two mission critical ones, which push around 100 megabit of traffic um, at, at peak level. So Kubernetes really helped us solve our problems. Um, for me personally, I think Kubernetes is one of the exci most exciting projects or open source projects in the infrastructure space since the Linux kernel itself. There's so much support in the community and uh, just great stuff going on. You should really look into it if you, if you need to solve or, or go th there. So thank you. Um, if you have any questions um, or want to chat with us about Kubernetes, the Flixbus stack, or Google Cloud, you can find us on the third floor. 
at the Google Cloud uh, Platform Office Hours after this talk. Thank you very much.
Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Thank you so much for joining my session, uh, The Year Ahead in Global Tech Policy. My name is Danielle, and I'm on the public policy team here at Google. So in addition to introducing what we do on the public policy team and how we can help you, this session is going to be a whirlwind tour, if you will, through some of the big issues that we're thinking about at Google, issues that are at the intersection of technology and public policy. So there's a lot that we could cover today, but I'm going to highlight a few issues that uh, developers in particular will be impacted with and flag some opportunities for you uh, to make a difference on these issues. So just to get started, a bit about me. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Oh, sorry. Uh, but I've spent much of my time practicing international law in the US federal government. But before I made the mistake of going to law school, I was an electrical engineer. So as a public policy advisor at Google, I get to explore the intersections between two areas that I'm actually really passionate about. So um, this is the only code that I get to put up on the screen today. Um, but I just wanted to point out that I get the significance of the infamous left pad code that broke the internet a few years back, um, but also the obscure legal reference that's here too. And if you're interested in it, um, come see me afterward and we can chat about it. So nowadays, as I mentioned, I lead our global public policy around two uh, topics in particular uh, that are relevant to developers. Uh, one is the Android operating system and related platforms like uh, Android Auto and Android Wear, and our thought leadership on the Internet of Things. So we're going to focus today on what we see having a real immediate effect and impact on developers. Um, but I'm happy to talk about any public policy topic that you'd like if you're interested uh, after this presentation. OK, so let's just get to it. What is tech public policy anyway? So I'm going to start with a bit of background. Now, when you say public policy, it can sound pretty abstract. Uh, maybe you think of a bunch of folks in powdered wigs, perhaps, sitting in a room, or just a bunch of folks writing a bill together in a slow and boring process. Um, this is a portrait depicting the signing of the US Declaration of Independence. Uh, obviously, these folks have never heard of GitHub because it's 1776. Um, or maybe you think about your favorite political TV show, uh, maybe House of Cards or Yes Minister. Uh, but for better or worse, my life is nothing like those shows. In either case, uh, most folks think that public policy is something that is happening outside of the world of technology. That is the basic assumption. There's policy, and then there's tech. But that is a big assumption. As an engineer, I think that the usual idea is uh, that you should just build great products and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, there's a tendency to think about products as being dependent upon users rather than larger outside forces. But of course, Lawmakers and policymakers are thinking about technology all the time. You might remember the SOPA PIPA, uh, that's the Stop Online Piracy Act and Protect IP Act debates. Um, those were occurring a few years back. So that was focused on legislation in the United States. Um, but these initiatives would have fundamentally changed how content is allowed to move around the web and would have had a big impact on speech. You might also remember some of the battles around net neutrality, uh, a debate about how people can access services and the speed at which they can do so. And various iterations of these debates are continuing today. Now, these discussions and debates have an impact at every level. As a developer, what can you build and what can you launch? As a startup, what kinds of users can you access and when can you access those users? And as a user, what can and can't you do with the technology that you have? So that's the work of public policy. There are new rules, laws, and regulations, and ideas for those kinds of things popping up all the time. There are great ideas, there are bad ideas, and everything in between. So our team plays the role of monitoring those developments and figure out the implications of those for the greater ecosystem of which Google is a part. Then we spend a lot of time telling people about it. That sometimes involves explaining technology to lawmakers or policymakers who want to learn about a new emerging trend. 
and sometimes involves talking to particular groups. Uh, developers are particularly important because they are a critical part of the ecosystem. And you're really influential when you speak out on these issues. So we want feedback uh, from developers in particular as we figure out our position on many of these issues. But I recognize you all have day jobs. You're busy, important people. Uh, and you're too busy trying to make sure that you make great products and that they work to pay attention to the myriad of uh, developments that happen in the public policy world. Uh, a lot of it is dense legalese, a lot of it's regulations, a lot of it's um, things that are promulgated into the future, and that's not something that you might want to spend a lot of time focusing on on the day-to-day. -day. So we think it's important to lower the cost to you for finding out and taking action on all of these policy initiatives. So let's jump into it. As I mentioned, the world is big, and the universe of public policy issues around technology is also very big. Um, and I just wanted to pick three topics that are at the top of mind for us here at Google um, that are likely going to have the biggest impact on developers in the coming months. So the Internet of Things, fragmentation of the Android ecosystem, and fair use of APIs. OK, so let's start with the Internet of Things, or IoT. So I'm sure you've all heard of IoT, um, but let's face it, it's kind of a buzzword. Really, it refers to the fact, if you break it down, to the idea that everything, big and small, is converging into becoming one connected computer. And these things can take lots of different shapes beyond the phones and laptops that we are accustomed to these days. So we don't think that the future is going to be some sci-fi looking world, uh, but instead, it might look something like this just devices that are seamlessly integrated into everyday life. Now, IoT is a buzzword. It doesn't mean much by itself. But for policymakers in particular, the ubiquity of IoT devices raises all sorts of new concerns. So how should these devices be secured against people with malicious intent? How should they be made to protect user privacy? How should devices signal that things are going right or going wrong to those people who own those devices or who are maintaining them? So how should we think about these problems? How should we approach these large topics? So one approach is rather old-fashioned, uh, which is to say we use the law to shape the behavior of people who are making and coding these products. That would be you. And indeed, lots of policymakers around the world are thinking about these questions, and they're starting to consider regulations. Uh, the recent DDoS attacks, which involved IoT devices um, that took down some popular internet sites, are a pretty good example of how these things can catch the attention of lawmakers and policymakers around the world. And of course, this is why it matters to you. But this picture isn't just about lawmakers. This is an area in which the people who are designing these technologies are going to play a big role. So this is Lawrence Lessig. Um, he is a professor at my old law school. Uh, you might remember him from Creative Commons or his uh, recent uh, ill-fated attempt to run for president of the United States. He is actually most known in the public policy world for thinking about the various forces that can influence human behavior. So law is one force but also norms and markets and code. So in certain situations, uh, some levers are going to be more powerful than others. And we think that for the Internet of Things, code is going to be particularly powerful because the space is moving so fast, and the standards and conventions that developers land on will be the template for the norms and laws that follow. So if ubiquity is the challenge in the IoT space, then trust is the solution. So at Google, we've been thinking about three principles that should guide the IoT space. Interoperability, security and privacy, and the need for new interfaces. So with respect to interoperability, we are constantly considering how we can develop and, dis and support open protocols uh, that would allow devices to connect easily to one another. With respect to privacy and security, we're thinking about what controls actually need to be in place 
uh, taking into account the diversity and the various use cases for a plethora of IoT devices even yet to be invented. And with respect to the human interface, we are thinking about the implications for transparency, for consent, control, and choice around data, particularly when the IoT device may have no screen or keyboard for users to interact with. So this is something that we are really looking for developer feedback on. No one has all the answers, but people who are closest to this technology have the most practical experience. So in sum, we really think that developers are going to be setting the norms for this new IoT ecosystem. And the practices that you develop will guide policy and law as it's developed. So next up, I want to talk about fragmentation and the Android ecosystem and how it intersects with the law. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how this impacts developers in particular and what you guys can do about it. So for this story, it's worth going back to the early days of Andy Rubin and Android in the late 2000s, ancient times, I know. Um, and for those of you who are too young to remember or are just living in the present and seeing all the future developments that have happened uh, or will happen with uh, devices, uh, I think it's really important to remember it was really difficult to create apps for mobile devices um, back, back then. So first of all, there were millions of users who just weren't even harnessing the potential of the mobile devices that they had, the computers that they were carrying in their pockets, because the software just wasn't good enough. Mobile phones had really limited functionality. They had relatively low usage. And many users wouldn't even try to get on the internet. If you remember how hard it was to get on the internet and do something useful back then, uh, that was a real issue. And the mobile industry was plagued with what we call walled gardens. This really created a limited opportunities for app developers to get their apps onto the devices and into the hands of consumers. So our objective was to develop an open operating system that would benefit all of the parts of the ecosystem, the phone manufacturers, the app developers, and just everyday people using phones. So this meant developing an operating system with some common protocols that anyone could pick up and use for their own purposes and would allow the same app to work across different phones built by different manufacturers. So in sum, the goal of Android was to turbocharge the mobile innovation space by aligning the standards around an open source operating system. And as they say, that was super effective. We have some amazing stats about the state of the Android ecosystem. And, and these are a little dated, but you, I, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, we have more than 400 different manufacturers, more than 1.4 billion Android devices worldwide, and more than $14 billion paid to developers since the launch of Android. But as the ecosystem got bigger and bigger, and I don't need to tell you this really, the ecosystem also became increasingly fragmented. So this is a visualization from OpenSignal. It shows the great variety of Android devices, which is excellent for consumers and those who like choice. Um, but it also shows all of the fragmentation that is in the Android space. So in short, the openness of the system itself generated fragmentation as Android uh, grew into more and more contexts. So the result is higher costs in ensuring performance on each kind of Android device. So Animoca had this uh, photo being passed around a while back. Um, it shows all of the devices that they keep on hand to make sure that their games and products uh, run across all of the possible uh, Android devices. And this even impacts us. A um, little known fact is that when we were developing Google Maps, we had a closet full of phones that we were testing them on. So that isn't all. Fragmentation can impact security. Now, Android is a very secure platform. We work to keep those 1.4 billion Android devices safe, and we start with the core Android platform as a safe space for that. Uh, Android is strengthened by the regular security updates for the platform, for applications, um, for the devices themselves. And it's constantly evolving security services that monitor and protect the system. But fragmentation does make it harder to ensure security updates reach everyone. 
Uh, and it's doubly hard to ensure that those uh, devices incorporate the latest patches quickly. So this certainly impacts users. But it also impacts the ecosystem more deeply, namely you, since developers need to spend more time and resources to ensure security. Um, and, that, and another big issue is that security failures can easily harm a developer's reputation. So as an open operating system, the interesting and exciting design challenge here is how we balance openness, which is in part what generated so much success for so many who use the Android platform and in the Android ecosystem with interoperability. So that decision and those trade-offs have a huge impact on developers in your day-to-day -day lives. So we have a few levers for ensuring interoperability. One, uh, for example, is our Nexus and, platform, and uh, Pixel phones. Those really serve uh, as an attempt to give the Android platform uh, a method for the operating system to be uniform. But the strongest lever that we have to ensure interoperability is our relationships with phone makers. They get impacted by fragmentation, too. So we make agreements with them to ensure certain practices that protect interoperability. So the worry is, without the ability to use these anti-fragmentation agreements, the Android ecosystem will continue to fragment in ways that are really unsustainable over time. So eventually, you could imagine devices diverging so much that it becomes difficult to tell whether or not a given app uh, will run when you download it. We also think that it might particularly impact smaller developers that don't have the resources to deal with big cabinets full of phones. So you may have heard that regulators are interested in these agreements, too, because they have a big impact on the mobile ecosystem. At issue is whether or not these types of agreements should be allowed at all. These inquiries that we get uh, from policymakers really give us a chance to better understand what they're interested in and a chance to talk about how the open source ecosystem of Android really works. But, of course, it isn't just about Google. Developers are a big part of the picture here. It turns out that regulators are just as interested in the developers that make the Android ecosystem great. So how do you balance openness and interoperability? That is a question that's uh, not just for policymakers, uh, but for developers too. And the policymakers really need to hear from you. So uh, the last topic that I will briefly touch on is uh, fair use of APIs. So um, the surest way for me to get booed off the stage, if you're not asleep yet, is for me to launch into the intricacies of copyright law. <laughs> so I will just simply say this. For decades, uh, developers have relied upon the open nature of APIs to build their products and have re-implemented those APIs uh, to create new software. Uh, think about, for example, the C standard library API. Uh, that has been re-implemented countless times uh, to allow differing operating systems to work with programs written in C. So many developers have found that when they can freely re-implement an API without getting a costly license, uh, they can uh, create compatible software um, that maybe the original creator had not ever envisioned before. So we think the openness of APIs supports innovation, and that's innovation everywhere from incumbents to startups. So now, currently, there is debate about whether APIs should be copyrightable, uh, and if so, whether a doctrine called fair use could be used so that licenses wouldn't be necessary in certain contexts. So the question is, what does the world look like if developers have to get a license before re-implementing an API, or if they can't rely on fair use doctrine? So I'm sure that you're building products and tools every day that can provide concrete examples about how decisions policymakers make on uh, copyrightability and the application of fair use would really impact the world. What products might get built and what might not if you have to seek licenses to re-implement APIs? That is something that would be really great for you to communicate in a practical way to policymakers. So, 
I'm going to wrap up soon. Um, I really hope that if you take anything away from this uh, presentation, um, it's a really how important you are to these debates and how important these debates are to you. So right now, if you're here in the audience with us, um, we really invite you to visit the Google Developer uh, Video Studio, which is on the third floor here, and tell us your experiences developing with Android. Um, we'll be there for the next couple of hours, and if you want to ask me other public policy questions, I'd be happy to engage. Um, there, we would love to record your story. Tell us about the work that you're doing, um, how Android has helped you do it, um, and please give us your honest feedback. Um, maybe there's some things you agreed with me on here, some different point of view that you want to raise. That is completely OK. Um, it's your honest opinions and your thoughts about some of these issues that will help us figure out where we should be. And in exchange for your time, I think we have a small gift for the first 40 or so of you that are able to make it up to the developer studio and to share your thoughts with us. So if you don't have a chance to stop by today, there are other things that you can do to contribute to this debate. Um, Feel free to uh, tweet um, or share on social media some of the ideas that you heard here. Um, we have a photo booth that we would love to, for you to um, uh, visit and, and share that on social media as well, to have people know that you're interested in these issues so policy can, makers can start thinking uh, more fully about how developers might be integrated into this conversation. So um, that's it. Thank you so much for your time.
Consider the simple URL. A few years ago, these were pretty straightforward. You clicked on one, and nine times out of 10, you went to a web page. Then things changed. People started using their mobile devices for, well, everything. And these devices in turn started supporting the idea of deep links. Click on one of these deep links and it could take you not just anywhere on the web, but anywhere in an app as well. So you could use a deep link to point directly to a specific restaurant inside a reservation app, or give your new customers a personalized welcome based on the link that brought them to your app in the first place. At least that's how they worked in theory. In practice, deep linking had issues. The same link wouldn't necessarily work on an iOS or Android device, and they behave very differently, or didn't work at all, for users who didn't have your app installed. And for people who did install your app through a deep link, all of that great link info was typically lost during the installation process, leaving your personalized warm welcome out in the cold. So while deep links were great in theory, their uses were a little more limited in practice. Enter Firebase Dynamic Links. Firebase dynamic links are deep links that work the way you want them to. So you can create one single link that behaves one way on iOS, another on Android, and even a third on a desktop browser, and it will take you to a place that's appropriate to that platform. You can also set up dynamic links to change their behavior depending on whether or not your user has your app installed. For users who don't have your app installed, maybe you send them to your website, maybe you take them to the Play Store, or maybe you show them an interstitial describing the benefits of your app before you take them to the App Store for a smoother transition. More importantly, these links can survive the App Store installation process. So if your user installs your app when clicking on a dynamic link, all of that information is still available to you when your user opens up your app for the first time. So what does this mean? It means you can use dynamic links the way you've always wanted to use deep links. You can use them in marketing campaigns, from email to social media to banner ads to, heck, even QR codes. And in addition to install attribution tracking, you know, the kind that lets you know which campaigns are getting you the highest quality users, you can also give your users a customized first-time experience based on the campaign that brought them there. So if a user installs your music app because you showed them an ad for classical music, you can make sure your app takes them right to Chopin's latest hits when they first open it up. Dynamic links are great for sharing, too. Your users can use them to share recipes, links to their favorite level in your game, or even coupon codes. In fact, dynamic links are the technology that powers Firebase invites. And because dynamic links are a Firebase product, you can see their stats directly through the Firebase console. Find out how many people clicked on a link, or use Firebase Analytics to find out which of your users first opened your app through a particular link. To find out more about dynamic links, check out the documentation here and give them a try. And deep link away.
does this symbol look familiar to you? And how about this screen right here? Waiting for things to load is part of everyone's mobile app experience, but it's never a good experience for your users. And how would you even know what that experience is? Your users are on a wide variety of devices, on a wide variety of networks, in a wide variety of locations all over the world. If you want to optimize the performance of your app, you need metrics that tell you exactly what's happening during the critical moments of your app's use. And you need that information to come directly from your users. Now, you can get it using Firebase Performance Monitoring. By integrating the SDK into your app, and without writing any code, your performance dashboard in the Firebase console will collect information about your app's performance as seen by your users. You'll get data about your app's startup time and details about its HTTP transactions. And using the provided API, you can instrument your app to measure those critical moments that you want to understand and improve. Then, in the dashboard, you can break down the data by country, device type, app version, and OS level. So try out the Firebase Performance Monitoring SDK at no cost for iOS and Android to gain insights into your user experience today. And to learn more about Firebase Performance Monitoring, check out the documentation right here.
Yeah, with NPR One, we are reimagining what a listening experience could be outside of the radio. It's the radio, but better. It has all of the great stuff that we've spent 40 years perfecting. With NPR One, we see the opportunity of reaching a more diverse audience that have a device in their pocket at all times. My name is Mike Saifalahi. I'm the lead mobile developer for NPR Digital Media. My name is Nick Dupre, and I'm the innovation accountant at NPR. My name is Tejas Mystery, and I'm the senior product manager of NPR One. So some of the biggest challenges in any mobile app are that first impression. When the user first installs the app, you've got a very limited amount of time to convince them to keep the app and to get engaged in the experience. Trying to figure out how we can get users into the content as quickly as possible was the real focus of integrating Firebase and Dynamic Links. Using Dynamic Links, we were able to shorten the number of interactions it takes for a user installing the app to get from the promoted content to the content from 20 to 3. So that user is able to get right into the content. We're driving more and more listening per user every week. It's really astounding. Creating playlists of content that are configured by the podcaster or by a member station or by us internally. And with Firebase, we have that at our hands. Having the analytics product interact with things like dynamic links, remote configuration, cloud messaging, it adds a real multiplier effect. And the integration with the broader Firebase suite, I don't have to go outside the platform to figure out what's working. So it's not just about shipping the product faster, it's about analyzing the results faster. And with the integration with all the other Firebase products, we're really excited about all the things we can learn from it.
Right now we're working on a brand new storytelling experience called TAP, which is all about stories told through text messages, through chats. The TAP team started off very small. We didn't have a lot of resources to test out a lot of libraries to help us grow very quickly. Firebase gave us the ability to take what we would have done in many different places and integrate from many different services all in one place in one convenient package. And it allowed us to integrate that package and just get going with our development almost immediately. The real-time database allows us to have schemaless storage, which means we can change the schema whenever we want. We wanted to have the tab counters increment on the stories as the users were browsing through them. So you could kind of get a sense in real time what people were doing and what they were reading. And with Firebase, this is a, a trivial thing to implement. You basically just add a watcher onto the count nodes and it comes back to you in real time. Since our app is supported on both Android and iOS platforms, cloud functions come in really handy. When a user makes and publishes a story, the cloud function gets triggered and we send a notification to all the friends of the user so that they know that they made a story and published it. There are times where we don't know whether or not to build a feature or to roll out a feature and so we would use remote config and test it out with a smaller group of, of users first and then we would look at the analytics dashboard and when we see that you know the feature is actually performing really well we would deploy it at a larger scale. Remote config really made it fast and easy for us to make these really really important product decisions. We've reduced our typical app deployment schedule by more than half. That allowed us to go from effectively zero to a working product in production and that time span was was just phenomenally fast for us. The app has been really, really well received in both Google Play and the iOS App Store. We've had over 1 billion taps in tap so far through Tap Stories. We've had, in the first weekend that we launched our Story Writer, 25,000 people wrote stories. Firebase gives us the ability to focus on what we know best. That's storytelling. And that's giving our users the ability to immerse themselves, to interact, and to participate with stories in ways that were not available before.
Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Fluen, and I am a developer advocate on the Angular team at Google. Throughout my career, I've been entranced by the power of tools. The right tools used in the right way have the power to improve our lives as developers, but also to increase the quality of our work. Part of the reason I joined Google was to help developers find and adopt great tools from across the ecosystem. Over the past day or so, we've heard a lot about progressive web applications. Part of what we've heard has been some of the great case studies about the outcomes that we get from adopting these technologies. And we've also heard about some of the ways that these improve the user experience. I want to peel back the onion a little bit now of PWAs and get into a little bit of the tooling, the ways that we build progressive web applications, and the way that tools can help us do that. I'm going to go through this in basically four parts. First, I'm going to start off with an introduction to kind of the state of progressive web apps as they are today. Then we're going to go ahead and dive into some of the goals of the tools. Why do we build these things? What are the philosophies behind these tools? Then we'll talk about single page applications and the libraries and frameworks that exist today to use these things. Then we'll end with some best practices that you can take back with you as you start adopting some of these tools and as you look at adding progressive web applications to your workflow. So let's start by looking at the state of PWA tooling as it is right now in September of 2017. We're all chasing after the per perfect progressive web application, but a lot of us come from very different journeys. Some of us already have large applications. Some of us have greenfield projects where we can experiment and try new things. But when we talk about the perfect progressive web app, I like to think that we're talking about three things. We're talking about building applications that are fast, reliable, and engaging. And when we combine this with thinking about the tooling that exists for us as developers, we're really looking at how do we get the best developer experience for providing our users the best experience, the best DX for the best UX. So what can tooling do to help us with all of these different problems? Well, when we talk about our users, their time is very, very important. As we've heard many times throughout the conference, even seconds or milliseconds of time that you make your users wait for your application or for a pieces of functionality can cost your business money. It can lose you conversions every time. We also talk about bandwidth. In many cases and in many user environments, the amount of bandwidth that your application takes is a direct decision factor in terms of whether or not they're going to use your product or service. Additionally, tools can do some very interesting things. By giving a tool an understanding of the browsers that you're looking to target, and by combining that with an understanding of what tool or browser the user is using to access your application, we can send down just the right code at the right time. Additionally, push notifications are a really great way of building engagement with PWAs. And tooling can help us understand these things a little bit better. As developers, a lot of the time, we're writing code and maintaining code. And so using PWAs to generate code for us, or using tools for, to generate code for PWAs, can be a huge impact for our lives. And lastly, tools really focus on allowing us to take advantage of best practices by giving us a deep understanding using tools like Lighthouse that expose from across the industry the best practices that have been collected by the Chrome team. Some of the technology behind PWAs include the Web App Manifest, which we'll talk a little bit about, the Service Worker, which I'll talk a lot about. But a lot of this is going to come down to you building great applications. Tools can only do so much to help you advance and take advantage of the latest and greatest uh, capabilities of the browser. But it, you still need to be thinking about your use cases. You still need to be worrying about your users. So let's talk a little bit about the Web Application Manifest. The Web App Manifest is really designed to try and let both browsers and the web at large know about your application. We're really trying to elevate the code that we write from a single page that's going to be served at a single time, or a set of JavaScript and HTML, into the concept of a collective application that we know something about. It has themes. It's got icons. It's got a starting place. We can tell the browser, the device, how it should be accessing our site and how it should be presenting it to the user. Some tools can do things like default generation. They can give us a manifest that we can then easily configure. Other tools will actually guide you through the entire process of making decisions. Service workers are the underlying API in browsers 
that give us these kind of modern superpowers for building progressive web applications. By adding a service worker to my app, I can do a lot of very cool things. I can proxy and intercept all of the HTTP requests that my application makes. By doing that, I can decide when and where I want to be serving from the internet, from a local cache, or maybe even some generated content that I'm storing within my service worker. But service workers have a relatively complex life cycle. And as we think about things like caching, each of these things can be done at any of these stages, whether it's when the user first visits the page and we're still rendering from their HTML, after the service worker has been installed and we're given a chance to actually go and cache these things, uh, or even later, maybe when a user is visiting a page for the second time or the third time. We can make decisions at each of these points of the life cycle, but tools can help us make those decisions. So let's talk about one specific case, which is file caching. As a developer, we can decide, hey, I want to cache all of the assets from my application, maybe as part of the installation process, because it's so important to my app. Or maybe I see caching as a nice to have for my application, and I want to install after the application has installed my service worker. This can be helpful by taking some of the work that's being done by the browser out of the critical path for rendering, giving users a great experience. We can also do things like runtime caching, because we don't always know all of the data our application is going to need when we write it. A lot of data is coming from servers and backends. And as the user accesses them, we can decide, hey, I'd like to cache these things so that if my user does go offline, they're able to access all of the content that they've previously seen. Finally, there's also advanced caching strategies, because by combining our knowledge of our applications with our tool's knowledge of the user, we can actually do far more advanced things that really drive great user experiences. Another technology that we really want our tools to help us with is push notifications. Because as developers, there's a lot of work here that can be done if we want to take advantage of it. And there's best practices that the browsers are leaning towards. One of these best practices is that we want different behaviors for push notifications, whether we're using the application actively on the device or whether the service worker is being woken up behind the scenes when the user is not interacting with our device. When the user is not interacting with our device, we actually want to show a notification. But there's some additional things we can do if the user is live and engaging with your application. These sorts of best practices can be baked in via tooling. Another thing that I care a lot about is code generation, where we want to give you the code that's going to help you get your work done faster. Good tools that do good code generation are going to be fast by default. They're going to be great by default. And they can even do things like help you with your build pipeline. So help you write code and ship that great code to your users with all of the sorts of metrics and things that you need to understand how your users are going to consume your applications. I see code generation as a very interesting idea, because it combines this ability to give a developer a great experience by default without eliminating any of their flexibility or control of what they actually ship to users. So when we talk about PWAs, there's a few different ways uh, that Sam talked about yesterday in terms of building them and adding them to our existing workflow. He talked about, maybe I'm going to write a new app from scratch taking advantage of PWAs. Maybe I'm going to rewrite one feature of my application and take advantage of PWAs fully. Or maybe I want to look at it a little bit differently and add one PWA feature to my entire application. Things are a little bit simpler when we talk about both the generic tools and the framework and library specific tools, because typically, as a developer, I'm targeting that library or framework for my entire application. And because of this, it's much easier for us to take the best of PWA and apply it holistically to my application all at one time. But it's still possible to take advantage of some of these tools and build a fully custom uh, service worker or PWA implementation that follows my business needs and the needs of my users. One of the really fantastic tools is Chrome and the developer tools that we've been building into them. I'm going to come back to this a couple times, because the application tab in the developer tools is one of your best assets for understanding what's going on when it comes to building a PWA. It's there that you can bypass the service worker for network calls so that you make sure you're getting the most fresh data. You can understand the life cycle. Is there a service worker that's pending install? Is there one that's already been installed? What's the state of my cache? Can I look and see what has been cached and what its status is? But Chrome developer tools are also very awesome because we've baked in some of these awesome tools for finding best practices, such as Lighthouse. 
So now, using Lighthouse, I can figure out, am I building a great progressive web application? Is my application doing well on performance? Can I broaden my audience by taking advantage of more accessibility best practices? And overall, what are the practices that we've discovered from across the ecosystem that I could be taking advantage of in my app? So we have a few generic tools. So these are tools that could be used for any web application that exists today. And one of the best for doing this is called Workbox. So this is a project from the Chrome team that takes the best of what we've got in terms of our understanding of the use cases and the needs of developers and packages that in a very easy to use library. Workbox is fantastic in the way that it embeds offline caching, even newer things like offline analytics, and new APIs that are now coming available in browsers, such as Background Sync. Background Sync is a very important concept because it allows us to not only get the freshest data when a user is interacting with our application, but we can do some of that behind the scenes so that the moment our user accesses our application, even in an offline mode, we can still give them the freshest data that they expect. I love Webpack. There's a lot of different tools out there for building applications with Webpack that have PWA attributes. One of these is Offline Plugin for Webpack. Offline Plugin really focuses on the file caching aspect of service workers and PWAs. With Offline Plugin, you can do ahead of time caching, so give me all my files up front. I can do deferred caching, hey, let's go and get these files later. Or I can make some of my files optional and base these sorts of decisions on user behavior in order to cache the files at the right times in the right way. Another fantastic project that you should look at as you're getting to know PWAs is actually from Pinterest. It's on their GitHub Pinterest slash service workers. This is a collection of utilities for creating, testing, and experimenting with service workers. Not only do they have code generation tools that give you a service worker under the hood that helps you move faster as a developer, but they've also done something very interesting. They've built out a mock environment generator that allows you to do testing of your service workers. And this has historically been a little bit of a problem because of the newness of these APIs and the way that sometimes the browser is actually ignoring the back end of your application entirely. And so mocking out these sorts of environments and testing them can be very important for ensuring that we have fantastic user experiences. Another tool that you should be aware of that you're going to see all over the place is a set of tools called SW Precache and SW Toolbox. This was another set of tools from the Chrome team that were utilities for building service workers. Uh, these tools had the same goals and values as Workbox, but they were a little bit less modular, flexible, and extensible. And so the team decided, hey, we want to collect this array of tools that we've built. We want to reflect on the best practices that we've learned over the past few years. And we want to bake those into the new tools. So SW Precache and SW Toolbox have, for the most part, been replaced by Workbox if you're building a generic implementation of a PWA today. But what you'll see is that SW Precache is still used by many CLIs today, and it's still a fantastic tool for building PWAs. Another tool to have in your toolkit is Hacker News PWA, or HNPWA.com. This is a website where we're collecting the best practices across a number of different tools, libraries, and frameworks for building progressive web applications. For each submission, we track both the speed as well as some of the capabilities of it. There's tools from projects like React, Firebase, and Angular. There's more than 20 implementations of this Hacker News client, and they really tried the best to show off the capabilities of the framework and of their PWA capabilities in a way that's open source and that you can take advantage of and learn from as a developer. So now let's get into a little bit about the goals and the philosophy behind these tools. I like to think that technology tools are really about simplifying the mental model in a good way. It's very easy to do this wrong, because what we're doing under the hood is we're finding new abstractions for concepts that have existed before in lower levels, but we as developers can't hold all of the complexity in our heads at one time. We have to focus on smaller subsets of the projects and the tasks that we're trying to accomplish. And tools are fantastic at taking an abstraction and saying, here is the thing that I can help you with. Additionally, tools can help you with different edge cases. And finally, tools can help you save time. Let's dig into these a little bit more. So when we simplify mental models, this is something that we often have to do. One of the common programming jokes is that there's two unsolved problems in computer science, naming things and cache invalidation. 
caching is a very, very hard topic. And so if we focus via tools more on use cases than underlying implementation, the tools can actually help us with that a huge degree. The service worker lifecycle, I also find to be a little bit difficult. And so again, focusing on use cases, the tools can help us with that. The last thing is a, an interesting conversation that I often have with developers, which is, does web development feel like what I'm used to? Right? We're always mapping new concepts into concepts that came previously for us as developers. I know that I talk to developers that are, in some ways, stuck in the web development that we did five or six years ago because they haven't been able to take advantage of the newer capabilities that we have and the new APIs that exist in the browser. And so good tooling should both be teaching you these mental models and kind of guiding you into the new world while still empowering you to be effective from day one. There's also a lot of edge cases that end up coming up that you might not expect when you start using progressive web apps or service workers. So a lot of us have talked about uh, intermittent connectivity and offline use cases. So one of the things that can happen very easily is what if your app loses connectivity during the service worker install? A naive implementation that you might do yourself might fail out and say, hey, I can't use any of these assets. Let's uh, uninstall. Let's uh, throw away everything we've got and then try again on the next load. But you could also do something different. Some of the tools will allow you to, for example, keep some of the cached files via some sort of validation. They're using some sort of checksum to ensure that they've got the files and they understand the integrity of those, those files. We've talked about a lot of offline use cases, but there's also online use cases. What if your user has full connectivity? One of the patterns that's been emerging that, that I believe is a little bit of an anti-pattern is this little box at the bottom of the page that says, the application is updated. Click to refresh. And so this is something that we didn't used to have on the web because applications were always fresh when you loaded them. But now, in the modern web, because we have these new capabilities, we've introduced a little bit of a problem where if I update my application every day, perhaps via some sort of continuous integration system, I don't want my user to be constantly assaulted with this click to refresh, click to refresh, just so that they're getting the freshest content of my app. We also build applications now in much larger environments. Many times, you may be building a front end of an application, but you have no control over the back end of an application. And so as you're looking at adopting things like Service Worker, you may want to be caching files, but maybe the cache headers that are coming back from your API aren't what you expect or aren't what you need to build out the front end. So you can look at things like tools to say, hey, maybe I need to override the cache headers or I need to ignore them, and I need to supply a completely different policy that supports my front end in a way that my back end can't. And then finally, we talk about saving time. As developers, we write a lot of code. But we also have projects that have a lot of DevOps. Right? It's not just as easy as writing code anymore. I have to figure out, how am I going to mitify this? How am I going to build this? How am I going to combine this all, with all of the work that other developers are doing? And then how do we ship that down to the user? And all these things have lots of effort. And so finding the right abstractions and the right tools at each of these stages is very important. So now let's get into the world of single page applications. So libraries, frameworks, and platforms, oh my. So I'm going to go through these five specific tools. I apologize to anyone that's not on this list. There are more tools than I can count and more frameworks than uh, I can uh, go over in the limited time we have. But each of these share a number of things. So each of these tools use some sort of CLI in order to empower developers to be more effective more quickly. So let's go into each of these. So in the React world, we have Create React App, which is a fantastic CLI. If you're using this CLI, what you're going to see is that it creates a service worker and a web app manifest by default. They have a cache-first strategy under the hood to ensure that you get the freshest con or excuse me, the fastest experience possible. So for all these examples, I'm going to use Yarn. You as a developer could use NPM or any other package management tool that you want to go fetch from the NPM repositories. But installing Create React App is Yarn Global Add, so you globally install Create React App. Then I'm going to run Create React App and give it a project name. Then I'm going to CD into that folder, and I'm going to run a build command. What this will get me is a basic kind of hello world, welcome to React application that is awesome in terms of demonstrating how do we get started very quickly, and then giving developers the freedom and flexibility to get into their application and start adding functionality right away. And one thing that is very beautiful to see is that the moment you see that application in your web browser, a service worker has been installed and loaded. So it is a PWA out of the box in a very fantastic way. 
Let's now talk a little bit about the Preact project and the Preact CLI. This is a CLI that goes a little bit further in terms of helping developers take advantage of the modern web. It has the standard app creation, but it will also do things like uh, generate an app shell for your index.html file. Because it has knowledge of some of your application, it can ensure that that is pre-rendered as HTML, and then you ship that down to the browser to increase perceived performance, which is a very important metric. The Preact CLI is also browser-aware, so if you tell it which browsers you want to be targeting, it can automatically add the appropriate prefixes for your application. One of the things that's fantastic about the Preact CLI is that they've pre-configured your application if you run the appropriate commands for Firebase's server push. So combining, again, its knowledge of your application with its knowledge of the best practices across the web in terms of which files should be pushed down to the browser and which should be waited for or requested only when it's needed by the user, and then baking that into the Firebase hosting configuration. All of the Preact CLI is using SW Precache under the hood today. So just like we saw before, I'm going to add the Preact CLI via the terminal, and then I'm going to run Preact Create and give it a project name. And again, I'll just CD into the folder and run the build. And here, out of the box, we're going to get a beautiful material-designed styled app, Hello World. And one of the cool things about this application is it actually includes routing by default, so that you can see one of these, common very these very common patterns and get started more quickly. Next, I want to talk a little bit about Polymer and the Polymer CLI. Polymer does things a little bit differently. So while they have the manifest generation and the optional service worker, they actually do a set of distributions for you. And this is something that's unique to how they've built their CLI. So when you run a build, you won't just get a single set of JavaScript that you ship down to the browser. They actually give you three options. So they're going to give you an ES5 bundled version of your application, which is the standard version that will work in basically any browser. But you also get an ES6 version or an ES2015 version that is a little bit smaller, a little bit more performant if the browsers have optimized for ES2015, which most of them have. But then you also get an unbundled version of that same code. And the idea here is that they're really trying to help you take advantage of the latest and greatest from the browsers and kind of leaving behind some of the legacy that we had to support with ES20, uh, ES5 in the past. One nice thing as well about the Polymer CLI is that they have purple by default. So they really believe in this idea of building great user experiences. With the CLI for Polymer, I'm going to install Polymer-CLI. I'm going to make a new directory and CD into it. And then I'm going to run Polymer init. And then what it's going to give me is a set of choices of which starter kit I want to use. So there's several options. Uh, the one here that includes PWA out of the box is called Polymer 2 Starter Kit. And then as soon as I've set up that project, I can run Polymer Build. Again, I'm going to get an application with routing and some material design styling that out of the box gets me started much quicker. And as we always like to see, it's a service worker out of the box. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about Vue. So there's two projects at play here. There's the Vue CLI, as well as the Vue.js templates for PWA. Again, this handles app creation. It handles manifest and service worker and app shell generation. And one of the very nice things about the Vue CLI is that it intelligently loads the bits of your application as they're needed. So it can understand, for example, if you have lazy loaded routes, which chunks based on a user request we need to load right away, and which ones can be asynchronous and deferred for a little bit later. Using the Vue CLI is relatively straightforward. I'm going to install the CLI, and then I'm going to run Vue init, and I'm going to choose the PWA template, and then I'm going to give it a project name. The Vue CLI is fantastic in terms of the way that it gives you a guided setup. And so it's going to be asking you questions about your application and how you want to be serving your users in order to, uh, as you're going, teach you the different decisions that you have to make as a developer. Then I'm going to install the dependencies, and I'm going to run another build command. And out of the box, we have this very helpful tutorial that says, hey, here's some links that will get you started as a Vue developer. And again, we have the beautiful service worker. Lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Angular CLI. The Angular CLI handles app creation. It also handles service worker generation. One thing that's a little bit different about the Angular CLI is instead of using JavaScript to configure your service worker, it has a declarative JSON-based configuration file called ngsw. Another thing that's interesting about the Angular implementation and support for service workers is that they've wrapped push notifications as a service that you can inject into your application in order to do things like registering for push notifications 
or to observe or listen to an observable that gives you the push notifications that comes from your application or understanding the lifecycle events that are coming from a service worker. To use PWAs with Angular, you're going to install the at Angular slash CLI project. I'm going to use the ng new command with my project name. And then I'm going to flip a flag in the CLI's configuration saying, I would like a service worker, please. And then when you run a production build, you're going to automatically get service worker included in your application that's going to cache all of the static files that are generated as part of the Webpack build process. And then you can further configure those via that declarative file saying, hey, these are the files I'd like to dynamically cache. These are the files you can ignore, and so on. When you generate a project like this, it's going to give you, again, a short Hello World page that has all of the necessary links to get you further started as an Angular developer. And again, we have the service worker. The Angular team has decided to ship basically a single service worker that is entirely reliant on that configuration file. So obviously, this file exists on disk. It's generated for you, but you can modify it to your heart's content. But it really is focused on exposing all of the capabilities of service worker via that file so you can do configuration easily. There's a few other projects that I want to mention very briefly in the remaining time we have. There's a website called pwa.rocks. There's a PWA builder that you can find online. The nice thing about the PWA builder is that it's a web-based interface for generating a manifest. You'll be able to upload images, and it will generate all the right sizes for you. It'll generate the JSON for you. It'll ask you questions that help you understand what's going into the web app manifest. And then it will ask you, how do you want to generate a service worker? It'll ask you, based on the use case that you're using, for example, are you just trying to cache all the static assets so that the application works offline? Or would you like something more dynamic, where we just cache the assets the application actually uses so that as a user has interacted with our application, anything that they've touched before can be accessed offline? And then also, within the Angular project, there's a set of tools called ngpwa tools that let you take advantage of things like server-side rendering. Lastly, let's dive into best practices for building and debugging these things. Remember, remember, remember to check the Applications tab. I've heard stories of developers restarting their browsers, uninstalling Chrome, uh, reformatting their machines because they can't understand why their application isn't refreshing. So service workers are a very powerful API, but because of the way that they can favor performance over freshness, it can actually break some of our expectations around the save and refresh cycle. There's a fantastic guide on debugging service workers by Rob Dodson. Uh, the link is bit.ly slash debugging SW. Another recommendation that I would make in terms of best practices is make sure that you're following the tools. Tools are useful because they provide abstractions. But if those are the wrong abstractions, you can end up spending more time fighting the tools because you're going against their intention. So whenever you adopt a new tool, try and understand what the tool is trying to do for you. Try and understand the pieces of the workflow that it's trying to automate. Because you're going to have a much better time if you're using tools the way they intend so that as they continue to evolve, they don't continually break you. While the Chrome developer tools are fantastic, I would highly recommend that you don't rely on them as the only way that you debug and build your applications. Throttling is one of the really cool features where I can say, hey, give me an emulated 3G connection, or give me an offline connection. But these tools are sometimes not enough and won't reproduce all of the scenarios that users run into on a day-to-day -day basis when they're on the bus or they're on a plane, for example. It's also important to note that as of today, I believe this is still true, the offline checkbox does not actually affect WebSockets. And so if you're building an application with Firebase, for example, where you're pulling down data via those WebSockets, hitting the offline button will not allow you to test your service worker with that data, because all the data will actually come back when you might expect it not to. One of the other really cool techniques that's just kind of being developed right now is the idea of having end-to-end -end tests for your service worker. So it's possible and important to think about how do we test and how do we understand the state of our service worker as we're building these applications. So there's two projects I definitely recommend you check out. Uh, the first is that Pinterest project that I talked about where they are mocking out the environments so you can do things in more of a hermetic way. Um, but there's also work being done to build out, for example, a PWA harness where we can use our standard end-to-end -to -end tools where we're doing browser instrumentation using the debugging mode. And we're actually using UX elements on the screen to check and verify and change the service worker status in the way that the user could be doing. The last recommendation I'd have is really make sure that you're staying up to date. 
Service workers are a fantastic API that are on millions and possibly, I think, yes, actually billions of devices today. But it's continuing to expand and evolve as the web ecosystem always does. A great example of this is that we've now seen work being done in Safari to support service workers. And so what that support looks like, we don't actually know. But it's important to understand and use the latest and greatest tools so that you're reaching as many people as you can and empowering as many users with fantastic experiences. So I'd ask you, really just give these tools a try and let us know what your experiences are with them, because we all want to make the web a better place. Thank you so much.
I sat in front of the computer, I felt like I had superpowers, but people told me I was just wasting my time. When I turned seven, I got parts to build a computer with my dad. It was mind-blowing for me that, you know, something that I built came to life. When I graduated high school, my parents just told me that I need to do something that can lend me a job. I didn't really know where to go, and I gave up on my dreams of pursuing computer science, and eventually I got into business school. I felt like I was out of place. I felt like it wasn't a good fit, and I knew it wasn't a good fit. Dropping out felt really risky because I was afraid that I'm gonna make the same mistake again. Since my parents didn't graduate high school, they didn't know what was right for me. I found Udacity. It was a good way to learn about different areas of computer science before I start my studies again. Online learning is really good at reflecting the market's needs and you can start with something like web development and, and work yourself up to self-driving cars. It's all in the realm of possibilities and, and you don't need a degree and you can do it from anywhere in the world. With Udacity and Google, you build projects which are interesting for potential employers. When I had my job interview, they looked at the app I built and they saw what I could do for them. Once I got my certification from Google, it took three months to go from knowing some programming to landing a job. It's just really a fast track program to becoming an Android developer. My work really reflects how I approach things and seeing people enjoy that gives me the feeling of being on the right track. When I sat in front of Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are excited to be here and uh, we really appreciate the effort, especially at that hour after lunch. We know it's not as easy as the early morning hours. We're here today to share with you what's new and cool and interesting in the new platform of the Google Assistant. At Google, as we heard in the keynote earlier, we believe in the that the future is AI first. And what does it mean? It means that we invested a lot in machine learning, natural language processing, and understanding context and what the user want. And it's all boiled down and coming into the assistant. It's basically a way for you to have a conversation with Google and get things done. And the beauty of this new platform is that basically it's everywhere. 
So from really small devices up to cars, and very soon we're going to have many more devices, it's going to be everywhere. Why? It's one of the most important questions that every time when we have a new platform or a new system, we ask ourselves, and there are obvious questions and obvious answers to this new platform, like, it's right once, run everywhere, it's very efficient, and it's a great way to get things done. But to me personally, there are two things that I think if I were in your shoes, I would look at it very carefully. One is the productivity aspect. You could really help your users interact with your service and get to the result that they want efficiently and without too much trouble. And second, like the photo up there, it's a blue ocean right now. So think about the early days in each big new revolution, you could be one of the first there. And we'll touch a bit on it later. It's a great way for you to be there with a quality app and then reach more users. So what does it mean for us as developers? There are lots of new terms, and it's great to understand at the beginning what we mean with each and every component. So first and foremost, we have the surfaces. Right now, we have the Google Home device, which is a smart speaker that the assistant is embedded in it, and it lets you talk and get things done with it. And of course, mobile devices, Android, iPhones, it's embedded there. The Google Assistant is basically the conversation that you are doing with Google. And like we saw in the impressive demos in the keynote, lots of new interesting things to communicate and to express what are the intent and what you want to do and get the results very efficiently and quickly back to you. Action on Google is the way to expose this new assistant platform to third-party developers, to you. So you could tap into the investment that we did and leverage it when you are coming to serve your services and product and you handed them to your users. The major important aspect here to remember is that when you interact with the assistant, it's very straightforward. It's a conversation. And when you want to handle your service and your users, you basically burst with, OK, Google, or hey, Google, talk to, and then you'll give it your specific brand name or app. So your users from that on will move and be in your hands, and you could interact with them and, do, um, and help them reach the goal that you want to. So how does the assistant app work? And again, it's very important at the beginning to have the basic understanding of the moving parts here, and then everything becomes much clearer. So as you can see here, in our example, we did a small demo app that is called Personal Chef that gives you a um, suggestion to a recipe based on your flavor and what you feel like in the right moment. And when you burst and say, OK, Google, talk to Personal Chef, basically, you're going to actions on Google, and then the magic of language understanding and gathering out from what the user said the exact intents and entities is being done for you. And from that moment, you basically go to your service. Here it will be Google Cloud, but it could be any uh, cloud service out there. And the user will be in your hand, so you'll need to interpret it what they wanted to and return back the text that, again, actually Google will take and produce a speech out of it. So all the interaction with the users will be done through that layer that basically giving you the ability to work with nice JSON file in your server that is easy to interpret and work with, but the heavy lifting of combining and going from text to speech is being done through that layer. We'll, I think the best will be just to look at this short demo. It will make very clear what I just said. OK, Google, let me talk to Personal Chef. Sure, here's Personal Chef. Hi, I'm your Personal Chef. What are you in the mood for? Well, it's kind of cold outside, so I'd like something to warm me up, like a hot soup, and I want it fast. All right, what protein would you like to use? I have some chicken and also some canned tomatoes. OK, well, I think you should try the chicken tomato soup recipe I found on example.com. Hmm, sounds good to me. All right, so that was a pretty simple interaction. It was like a simple thing to be having a conversation about, but the conversation itself was actually quite complex. So Wayne, our developer advocate up there, said cold, warm, and hot 
all in the same sentence, but the app managed to capture the correct one referring to the soup. So can you imagine trying to write a regular expression or a parser that would try to extract meaning out of that? It basically, there are so many difficult cases that it ends up being pretty much impossible for anything beyond a trivial example. Um, so let's look at some of the ways we could build this interaction. So one of the options is to use the conversation API and the actions SDK. And in this case, your assistant app receives a request that contains the spoken text from the user as a string. Um, so Google handles the speech recognition for you, but you pass the strings, you generate a response, and then Google handles speaking this back to the user. The thing is, as we just mentioned, passing natural language can be really difficult. So fortunately, we have some tools that make handling that type of thing a lot easier. Um, API.ai is one of these. It's a platform that makes it incredibly straightforward to build conversational experiences. Um, you might not even have to write any code if you're building something fairly simple. Um, so we're going to give you an overview of this today. And it's probably what most of you should use if you're going to implement your own assistant app. So API.ai basically provides an intuitive graphical user interface to create conversational experiences. So you program in a few example sentences of the way users might express a certain need. Um, and you can also specify the values you need to get from the user. Um, and then we use machine learning to train a model, or we train a machine learning model to understand these sentences and manage the conversation. Um, so the key part here is that you no longer need to process raw strings. API.ai will do that for you. So you can see in our diagram where API.ai fits in. Um, it handles the conversation fulfillment um, in between the assistant itself and your back end. Um, and API.ai handles the conversation for you. So another way of looking at this is like the user says something, so maybe they're asking for a certain recipe. The assistant converts their voice into text, and API.ai receives that text string. It will decompose that, figure out what it actually means, and hand you that meaning in the form of structured data. You receive that in your webhook. You do whatever you need to do, like look it up in the database and find a matching recipe. You build a response, and then you pass it back to the assistant, which will read it out to the user. So we're going to show you a short demo um, of how we would work with API.ai to build this app. All right, so in API.ai, we create an intent to represent each thing that the user might want to do. So in this case, we've built an intent that covers the user asking for a recipe. Um, so I'm going to open the intent here. So right here, you can see how we've provided examples of different ways the user might express their desire for a recipe. Um, and these examples are used to train a machine learning model that can recognize what the user wants. And as we add examples, API.ai will automatically pick out important concepts that are mentioned by the user. So the system actually understands many concepts by itself. But you can add custom domain-specific information, like in this case, recipe ingredients. So I'm going to add a couple of things here. And as done type, you could see that it will mark immediately the entities that you understand. And actually, if it doesn't understand correctly the entity that you wish, you could mark it for it. So you could see here, protein and dish type immediately being recognized because we already have some examples beneath. So another example. So these are all entities our system knows about. And API.ai is able to pluck those from the user statement and figure out what they mean. Um, so we can actually also mark this information as required. So here we've put in a cooking speed and a dish type. Down here, we've actually marked dish type and protein and vegetable as required. Um, so in this case, our app is automatically going to ask the user if they didn't mention it. So I'm going to save the intent, and we'll wait one moment for it to train the machine learning model. Yeah, it's OK. OK, so training's completed. So now I'm going to enter in our test console, which is kind of how we work um, while we're developing the agent. I can just enter in, I want something with beef. 
So in this case, I'm specifying a protein, but I didn't specify a vegetable or a dish type. So the system actually knows that it expects those things, and it should prompt for them if they weren't supplied. So I can now say potato. And I still need to know a dish type. So what kind of dish do you prefer? Let's have a main course. And so now this is where we would hand off to our back end, and we would use that structured data to look up a recipe in the database and return it to the user. Um, so it's pretty amazing to be able to conduct a conversation dynamically in this way, just based on the information the user provided on the fly without knowing in advance what they're going to say. Um, once the intent has captured all of this information, it becomes available to use on your back end, which is where you're going to make stuff happen and generate a response. So you can see in here, we have the action that we resolve to, which is the intent. Um, and we have this parameter data that we captured from the user's query. Um, and so because we have those values in a structured way, we can look those up in our back end and return something useful. Um, so once we're done, it's only a few clicks to integrate the app with a load of different platforms. So on the integration tab here, so we want to integrate with actions on Google so that this app is available via the Google Home. So we can just click here and load up the simulator to test this out. So the actions on Google Web Simulator allows us to test out our action um, as if it's running on the actual platform. So I can say, talk to my test app. All right, let's get the test version of my test. And so here we're seeing how the um, app will be responding. And I can say, let's try a recipe with chicken. And this is now communicating with API.ai in the same way that the Google Home might be. So it's asking what kind of vegetables we have. So let's say potato. And again, we want a main course. So you can see how it's really easy to develop your app within API.ai, test it out in the simulator. And then the magical thing is, if you're signed in to a Google Home or the Assistant app on your phone, this app is now immediately available for you to test out. So you can try it straight away and make modifications live, which is a really fun workflow. There's not really any deployment step. Um, so this is the workflow for building an action. It's super fast and simple. And you should definitely attend the following workshop session on building an assistant app. Um, so give it a try for yourself. Um, so let's switch back over to our slides and talk a little more about the platform. So we saw how we could leverage API AI. And the goal with any app that we're building is actually to have the wow effect and to have the best experience that we could give our users. So let's touch a bit about what can we do. Before we starting to code our app, and it's actually quite easy to do, I think one of the most important aspects is to dive into all the great content that our team produced around design voice UIs. It's totally different topic than what we, or most of us, are used to in terms of graphical user interface. And when we're coming to voice, there's lots of constraints, limitations that we could take into consideration. And there's some great opportunities there, like a checklist and uh, tips that could really put you on the right track when you're coming to design the conversation and to see how those moving parts are going to work best in your specific use case. When we're coming to build it, we need to take into consideration that, like we saw in the earlier slide, we'll have different surfaces out there. Right now, we have Google Home and mobile devices, and soon we'll have more. And on mobile devices, we could and actually should leverage the real estate that the screen is giving us. As you could see here in the example, um, let's say that the user wanted to get uh, to some place. On Google Home, we'll tell them where to go, and if we have the screen, and we know it in our app that we are now on this surface, we could give them a small map and a URL so they could get the directions immediately. At most basic, um, you can specify on the screen what is the text that you are going to speak. And as you could see here in the example, the, we have what will be 
telling to the user and what will be the text. One of the most important aspects to remember here is that we always want that the text will be a summary or the executive summary of what we will talk to the user. So if the user is listening, they're getting the full-blown answer. And if they're just skimming with their eyes the screen, they still get to see what we want or the most important aspect. But like in the example here, we don't need to give them the full-blown answer. Um, when we have uh, one of the options, or most, one of the most popular options, one of the main design tips that we're giving is to lead the conversation and to give the user the ability to very quickly go and route to the path that they want to. So suggestion chips are one of the most efficient way to do it. If you have some popular choices, you could suggest it to the user. So on the screen, they have this nice button that they could click on. And if, of course, we are on Google Home, you could suggest it and the user will choose. They don't necessarily force to it, right? They could choose, in this example, any other number that is out there. But at least we're suggesting them what to do. And in our example, it could be suggesting the most common vegetables that are appearing in the recipe. Um, basic cards are actually quite holistic and complex in the sense that they're giving the full-blown image URL and text. And it's giving you the ability to extend the experience. So in our case, we could show a nice big photo of the dish itself and to give the user a link so they could open it um, in their app and see what we are going to cook. There are many cases where you want to set and show the user a list of things and give the user a visual selection of what's going on uh, with the different type of uh, things that they could choose from. And the carousels show big images. The main difference is that we have more limited set of items. And with list, we'll have smaller images and much longer list that we could uh, show the user what are the different options. And in this example, you could think about showing a couple of different options for a type of a dish. And that will be, let's say, that the user already chose a chicken salad. We could use the carousel to offer three, four different type of recipes for chicken salad. On the other hand, if we want to show um, a dozen different dishes that feature chicken as a gradient, we could use the list. So you might have a conversation where you need to know the user's name or location. So one example might be if you're helping the user find a local bookstore and you want to know the zip code or the postcode. Um, so you can use our SDK to request permissions for the name, the course location, and the precise location of the user. And when you invoke this function, the assistant's going to ask the user for permission in the voice of your app. So it's really seamless. Um, the name is the name of the user who's registered to the device. Um, the precise location is the exact GPS coordinates and the street address. And then the course location is just the zip code or postcode and the city. Um, if you'd like to link a user with their account on your own service, and you have an OAuth server, the Google Assistant can prompt users to link their account. So at this point, the requesting user is going to receive a card at the top of their Google Home app on their phone that provides a link to your login page. Um, and they can follow that, log into your service. Once the user's completed the account linking flow on your web app, they can invoke your action, and your action can authenticate calls to your services um, through our API. So it's important that you provide the OAuth endpoint uh, right now, uh, as part of the approval process, we basically want you to uh, run your own OAuth server. Um, so if your experience involves shopping or payments, we support rich transactions, and we allow you to accept user payments. And the really cool part about this is that customers can use whatever payment information they have on file with Google. So payments can be super easy. There's no need to fumble around with a credit card or read numbers out loud, although they can use your payment solution if you prefer. Um, Transaction supports a shopping cart, delivery options, order summary, and payments. Um, the user can see a history of all their transactions. Um, the assistant also supports home automation via our smart home integration. So if you're a device maker, you can easily integrate your existing devices with our home graph. And the home graph basically knows the state of all connected devices so that when you ask to dim the lights a little bit, it knows how to do that intelligently. Um, so there's kind of endless possibilities around how you can allow the user to interact with home automation. 
Um, we've also announced the Google Assistant SDK, which enables you to embed the Assistant in your own custom hardware projects. So Magpie Magazine announced the AIY Projects Kit from Google, which provides a cardboard housing with a button, a speaker, and a microphone that wraps around a Raspberry Pi and uses the Google Assistant SDK. And at Google I.O., we demoed this Mocktails mixer from our partner, Deep Local, which embeds the Assistant SDK. And you can walk up to the device, tell it what kind of drink you want, and it will mix it up for you. So you can embed the Assistant into pretty much any hardware device. After we build our Assistant app, it's time to reach user and see how we could drive traffic to it and what are the different options for us at the moment. So, the basic way to invoke the app is to, after, of course, you submitted the app and it passed the review, is to provide a set of triggers that the invocation knows. So when you say, OK, Google, talk to, in our case, personal chef, it could be another one or two uh, different invocations. And the user will ask according to your brand name or to your uh, app uh, name, and it will invoke it. We also support deep linking. So as you could see here in the example, you could say in one sentence to talk to personal chef and get a recipe of a hot soup or something else. There are also uh, the ability to ask Google for, I want to work out, I want a yoga, or something more uh, bored, and then Obviously, if you have a quality good assistant up in the directory, Google will surface it. And that's come to the point it's a blue ocean and great opportunities out there. Last but not least, we have uh, a full directory of apps that are sitting and living inside the assistant. Um, on the top right corner, you have the ability to click and open the directory. And again, it's uh, opening and give the user based on categories and and based on what the assistant thinks the user will enjoy most, what are the different variations of apps that are out there to try and use. Um, there are quite a lot, so I really suggest you to check some of them out. You could and should link. And we have a deep link, so you could, if you have a web service or another app, you could always link from it to the assistant app. So in lots of cases where the service might be more efficient for your users from the Assistant app, I highly encourage you to link to it. And then, of course, they could use it. So we've seen all this awesome stuff you can do with the Actions platform. But let's talk a little bit about how you can get started. Um, so we've got a series of videos that cover a lot of content on how to get up and running with the Assistant. So we've got an intro video that explains high-level concepts and goes through the personal chef example. Um, there's a video dedicated to conversation design, which is definitely worth checking out as you start to design and build your app. Um, and we've also got a screencast of every single step needed to build our personal chef example. Um, we also have several code labs that will guide you through the experience of designing and implementing your first Assistant app. And finally, when you want to discuss this stuff with other developers, we have a really active Actions on Google developer community on Google+. Um, so we post regularly there to keep you up to date with the latest news. And we answer questions from developers. Um, we've also got a great community on Stack Overflow if you have technical questions. Um, after us, there's a really great talk by Sachit and Xu Yang that will guide you in much more detail on how to build an assistant app. So you should definitely head upstairs and check that out after this talk. Um, and our whole team of uh, assistant DevRel people is here. So please feel free to come by and ask questions about the platform. We can show you the Google Home, and we can show you the assistant SDK stuff. So thank you all for coming, and really encourage you to dive into this new platform. Um, last but not least, I forgot to mention it at the beginning. I saw people taking uh, photos. All the slides are live. Um, you could ping Dan or myself um, on any channel that you wish, and you could get all the slides there. And if you have any questions, we'll be at our booth at the Assistant uh, App Room. So please feel free to come over and um, give us your feedback and thoughts. Thank you very much. Cheers.
We started is on a living room couch, and we really started because of the problem that we had, which was asking the same question to our closest friends. Where are you? What are you doing? We were baffled by the fact that there wasn't a solution that solved this problem, and we felt like we could build one that was better. The value that is drives for all users is knowing which of your friends are nearby. So if you look around where we are right now in Arena, how many times have people gone to a basketball game, hockey game, or a concert and found out the next day that they had friends who were at the same event? And think about all those moments that are missed because they didn't know they had friends there. So what we're solving is letting people know who's nearby and making those moments matter. My name is Diesel Peltz, and I'm the founder and CEO of Is. I'm Mark French, co-founder of Is. We felt there was no reason users should manually go fetch data. When I get a text message, there's no reason for me to tap refresh. And we felt, why should it be different from anything else? And Firebase let us solve that. Firebase really allowed us to enhance user experience by making it real time, simplify the UI by not having a refresh button, and cut down on development time. Like any startup, the most valuable asset that you have is your team and your time. And what Firebase has allowed us to do is save 50% in terms of time by moving that much quicker with a product. It's a game changer. We're using eight features from Firebase right now. They're analytics, remote config, dynamic links, the real-time database, and more. Traditionally, that would have been in eight different places. And now we go to one place, which is the Firebase console. We're eager to launch this product in a big way. We're seeing how people are using the product and how they're inviting more and more friends that we're concerned. We're growing very, very quickly. So we sleep a lot easier at night knowing that we got Firebase that's really there to build that infrastructure. If you're a developer, use it. We love it, and it's enabled us to focus on developing the user experience and not have to worry about the things in the background that should be there.
Raise Labs is a company that is focused on building excellence in software, technology and design. We do that through our work on mobile applications and websites and technologies in general. My name is Gregory Reyes. I'm the CEO and founder of Raise Labs. We really want to understand the human problem, and oftentimes the hard problems in software aren't just the technology problems, the API, the how do you connect these things, but really getting at the heart of what people are trying to accomplish and do in their day to day. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the managing director at Raise Labs in Boston. We decided to put our hat in the ring for the Google Certified Agency Program. The first leg is just having access to a lot of what Google is doing today. So there's uh, access to design reviews, invitations to events, and that's sort of the base level. And I think that's hugely rewarding even in and of itself. Having Google review your app from a design perspective is amazingly helpful. So that's sort of the first tier. The second tier comes with certified status. Uh, you know, there's a long application process for that. And once you have it, it's something that you can really say to your clients uh, that gives them comfort that we're a reputable firm, that we're building great software in a way that Google believes in. The certification is a higher bar for us to really differentiate ourselves from many of the other companies out there. It required us to really dig into what that means to be truly world class. And we wanted to set that bar for ourselves as well. My name is John Green. I'm a VP Creative at Raise Labs. The Google Developer Agency program allowed us to have access to uh, engineers for the map team, the design team to figure out, oh, how can we actually do some of these things? And we could reach out to them when we needed. And also it allowed us to set up and say, we can make this a success. They might look closer at this app because we're part of this program, which has actually been uh, super helpful. Some of the challenges in building the Six Flags app, and which touched on some of these, are certainly mapping technology and payment technology, material design, or the APIs. Uh, having access to the Google team to really ascertain how we're approaching certain software and ensuring that we're building technologies the right way makes for a smooth development process. We set off to build the Six Flags app with a pretty lofty ambition, and it was to bring in-park navigation and commerce to the app. The comfort of knowing that Google is there to help us understand where they are heading as an organization and that we are along for that ride is a really uh, helpful thing to know. And as a business, we know that uh, going forward, we're going to be at the cutting edge of whatever Google is doing through access to programs, through uh, you know, the collaboration with their teams. It's really helpful for us to know that six months, nine months down the road, we'll still be a part of that uh, process and we'll still be working with them to figure out what's next. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wojtek. I'm a developer advocate working with the Android Studio team. And today I want to tell you a little bit about performance tooling that we, um, we are releasing um, soon with the new Android Studio version uh, 3.0. And why performance tooling? Because I think we all know perf matters, right? That's not something I have to convince you developers that it's true. Uh, so let me keep this intro short, um, but I just want to tell you a little bit how I understand app performance and what it means to me. So imagine that performance is actually a measure of your app quality, right? Now, the user will down your, download your app and install it before they want, because they want to use features, the features that you implemented, that the, the benefits that the app gives them. Um, 
you design a great UI because you want the user to be able to access information quickly, and you want, you want, them, to, you want them to feel good about just using your app. Now think about the other part of the user experience. What if they want, actually want to use it, but if they're frustrated because when they keep the app open, the battery drains very fast? What if um, just having the app installed means that their phone dies twice as fast as before? Um, the user cares about the responsiveness of the device, about a smooth UI, about how, fa how fast the app installs, uh, how much space it takes up on the device. And uh, all these things ultimately will make your user happy or frustrated um, because they're using your app. And um, ultimately, it's what they will feel about your app and what rating they will give you on the Play Store. So what can we do that about this as developers? I see it as a two-way process. You have to be proactive, and you have to be reactive. Now, what does it really mean? So even before you start working on your app, you have to plan for performance. When developing before the release, you have to keep measuring and profiling. Like, what does it mean that your app is performing? How can you know if it's, if it's performing up to the standards? You have to actually plan for some numbers. Just do some benchmarking, uh, look at your competitor's app, see how fast they work, how fast they start. Just write down some, write down some figures and plan for this. Then when you release, uh, maybe you will not nail it on the first time, but at least you will have something to, to strive for and to um, try and fix it. And then be reactive. Um, this whole process doesn't end when you actually release your app and you're done. No. It's all about monitoring and reacting to any problems that arise. And you have to have tools to be able to debug and fix this thing, these things. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the new Android profiler, available in Android Studio 3.0, which is currently in beta. And this is a tool that replaces the old Android monitor tab. Uh, you can see here, when you launch your app on a device or emulator, you open the Android profiler tab at the bottom. And you see this view. This is what we call the unified timeline. Uh, you can see um, three, three charts, uh, the CPU, the memory, and the network charts. But what's, what's really cool about this view is here at the top, you can see an additional track with some important app events that are happening, such as input events, rotations, and activity state. And looking at these things gives me more context to actually analyze the data that you see below. So imagine here I'm touching the screen, interacting with my app, and I can immediately see on the CPU chart that my app is doing something. It's actually uh, processing the input events. Then when I rotate, you can see that activities are changing. The activity is getting destroyed, a new one is being created, and something is happening there with the memory and CPU. Now, when you click on any of these tracks, you can actually go to a detailed view. And let's start with a CPU profiler first. So the UI is a little bit complicated. Um, I know it can be a little bit hard to see from the back, so let me just walk you through uh, the main points here. So here on the left, uh, you can see the thread list. These are all threads that were active when you were profiling your app uh, using the CPU profiler. Here on the top, you can again see a chart of CPU activity. You can see spikes whenever there was something happening in the app, such as activity creation, um, um, swipes, list scrolling, and so on. And finally, um, you can see thread state. So you can actually see we which of the threads were active and their associated states, such as if they were sleeping, active, waiting for I.O., and so on. Now, you can glance at this and, and already figure, that, figure out that something's happening. But the nice thing is you can also start method tracing from here using this button. Method tracing is basically recording all the method calls in your app so that you can analyze them uh, better and figure out which methods are, are taking up uh, the most time in your app. Now, there's two ways you can do this, uh, this dropdown uh, next to the record button. Um, you can select the sampled or instrumented trace. Uh, the difference is, um, well, pretty small. I mean, uh, they both essentially do the same thing, except the sampled one has a smaller overhead. But it can miss some uh, very short-lived methods sometimes because it samples um, every x milliseconds to check which methods were run. Whereas if you choose, if you choose instrumented um, traces, they will record every method enter and exit but the overhead will be bigger. So what happens? When I press the Start Method Tracing button, I interact with my app, I swipe, um, swipe on the screen, I, I do some transitions, I um, rotate my phone, I press Stop. And when Android Studio stops processing the trace, um, you can see this view. Um, 
So here at the bottom, uh, we see a call chart uh, from the selected um, slice of time that you can see on the timeline. Um, so here I selected the moment when I was rotating my phone and um, the activity is getting destroyed and recreated. So imagine this is a, an image gallery app. And I notice that when I'm looking at an image and I rotate my phone, the activity takes a, an unusually long time to, to actually restart and show me the image again. So I want to see what's happening there. So I, actually, I can actually zoom in this chart because um, I want to see the exact calls that were made. Or I can just drag and drop uh, and select on the timeline um, a, a smaller slice of that, um, of that uh, recording, of that trace. And here um, at the bottom on the, on the call chart, you can see um, all Android uh, framework methods highlighted in, in yellow, all methods from my code that were called in this trace in green, and some other um, standard library methods uh, in blue. So um, again, for those who can't see the small text on the screen, here I can see the whole onCreate method. And actually, the widths at the chart represent for, uh, for how long the, the respective methods um, were running. And the first thing that runs in my own create is layout inflation. It takes some time. That's OK. Uh, I can't do anything about it. But then I notice that there are two very long method calls in my code, uh, which actually create these caches for my images. And first of all, um, I can see that I'm actually hitting the disk. I'm creating caches. I'm reading disk from my main thread. I can see that because the, I'm actually analyzing the main thread, which is highlighted at the top on the thread list. I can also see that all this takes almost twice the time it takes to initialize my layout. Uh, so I should probably not be doing that uh, in on create. And that's it. In 10 seconds, I was able to uh, quickly glance and see what, what's happening in my, in my own create method and why it's taking so long. Um, so I really recommend to try this for all the places where you need to um, finish something quickly. If you're doing any um, calls in um, layouts, in computing layouts, in custom drawing for, uh, for your views, any place, basically, that's, um, that may be impacted by doing a lot of work on the CPU, uh, please check it out. Um, there's always also uh, other ways you can look at the data. So the call chart is obviously a very visual way to analyze it. But you can, ob uh, you can also open the top-down view and see all the calls from the, from the thread root, from the main method, all the way down to uh, individual, individual methods uh, that were called in your app. And also see uh, some data like relative times of, of how long they ran. And there's another way of looking at it. Um, in the bottom-up view, that's the second tab, uh, I can actually sort all the methods that were called um, by um, how long they ran. And I can immediately see the method I was telling you about, the create, cache, create this, this caches method, is very high on the list. I can immediately see that that, that method is actually making my own create slow. And then if I expand the nodes in the, in the tree view, I can actually see where it was called. Uh, so instead of going from the thread root to the individual methods, I'm going the other way around, starting with the method I'm interested in and finding out which place in my code I was calling it. OK, so let's move on to the memory profiler. Um, so here again, um, same situation. I'm rotating my screen. Something's being recomputed, recreated, and my memory, memory goes up. You can immediately see that from the, from the chart. Um, you can also see some more events. Uh, so you can see when GC events were happening. If you see too many of these um, small trash can icons and, um, in, in a short amount of time, and if the memory is going up and down, up and down, that means you might be thrashing the memory. You might be creating objects and destroying them, uh, which, again, might impact the performance of your app. Um, just for debugging, if you need to force a garbage collection event, you can do that from here. But the coolest part about this memory view, about this memory analyzer is, um, by the way, this is, this is all live. I know I'm presenting this on screenshots, but this is all um, going live when you run your app. And at any given moment, when you see something happening, something interesting happening in your app, you can drag and drop on the timeline and select a, a slice of time without any uh, pre-recording, any, any, uh, pressing any buttons first, and see all the allocations and deallocations that happen uh, at that time. So here, um, you can see some input events in the top. This is a situation where I was um, just um, scrolling a long list of items, uh, again, of images. And you can see, um, just like I said, memory goes up, memory goes down. There's a lot of garbage uh, collection events. 
And for some reason, my scrolling is, is very janky. It's, it, I can see that the app is loading something and just thrashing memory. So I'm inspecting this, this place for possible culprits. And at the bottom, you can see uh, a list of all the classes that were either um, allocated or deallocated within that time slice. Um, but the really helpful views are actually hidden under a dropdown, so you can arrange this data um, in different ways. So here, I selected Arrange by Call Stack, and I can actually find the place in my, view ad in my um, list adapter, um, the getView method, which, if you remember, um, when you have a long list, the adapter recycles views, and that has to provide them uh, whenever a new view has to be shown um, on the screen when you scroll it. So I found the getView method that does exactly that. And I can see all the allocations that I'm making there. And it turns out there's actually a lot. Um, you can see the number of allocations. You can see this, uh, the memory size that is being allocated. Another way of looking at it is, is you can arrange by package. So let's say I'm not interested by any um, third-party libraries that are doing allocations right now. I'm not interested in the system classes. I'm only uh, interested in classes uh, from my code, so something that I wrote that is being allocated. So that's another way to look at it. So let's go back to um, analyzing the, the getView method. So when you actually select a class, uh, you can see on the right a new view opens, and you can see all instances or all objects of that class that were actually allocated and deallocated. Even more, when you select any of these objects, you get a call stack. Uh, so you can see where exactly where that object was allocated. So you can track down these rogue allocations and, and try and fix it somehow. Uh, maybe move it uh, to some um, warm-up before or just some uh, shared cache. Yeah. Another, another thing you can do with the memory analyzer uh, is you can analyze heap dumps. So whenever you want to examine some state in your app, uh, let's say you got your app, um, you were using your app, you were just using it as a normal user would, and something's wrong. You, you got the app into some weird state. Maybe some view is not lo showing. Maybe some image is not loading. And you just want to figure out what's going on. Or you just want to figure out where is all that memory coming from, uh, uh, all these memory allocations. What objects are actually uh, exist in my app? So just press this button, wait a bit, and then you get um, a similar view as before, except now you have a snapshot of memory from your app at the, at, the, at the time when you press the button. So again, you have a list of classes. Uh, you can click on it, and you get a list of instances of, the, of objects of those classes. And here, the view looks slightly different. So for every instance, you can actually analyze all the fields, all the values that were held there, just as if you were um, debugging, the app, uh, debugging the app in Android Studio. Uh, so this is nice for figuring out uh, the state of the object. Um, but if you, have, if you have another problem, if you, have, if you know you have a memory leak, and for example, you see an object that shouldn't really be there, let's say it's some activity that you actually stopped interacting with um, a long time ago, and sh it should really be garbage collected by now, but it's still there in the, in the list, you can use the um, bottom view here, um, the references view, to figure out who's holding references to my view, who is preventing it for being, from being garbage collected, and here, by expanding the nodes, you can find a, a chain of references, usually to the window object or to some root view or whichever object is, is being held by the system because it's active in your app, and then it's holding on to these um, objects that you would really like to, um, uh, well, enable them to be garbage collected. So a great way of um, analyzing memory leaks. And finally, the last profiler, network profiler. Uh, so this view is quite interesting because you can see, uh, you can use it for two purposes. Well, analyzing network requests, obviously, uh, but the other one is it actually shows you the radio power state, and you can figure out some battery problems that might be created by your app. So the radio state is, can, be, can be shown in three states, really. It's either Wi-Fi, low-powered radio, or, or high-powered radio. And the way the GSM radio and your devices works, when it doesn't have to do any, uh, any, any transmissions, when, you don't, when you're not downloading or uploading data, it can go to a low-powered state to um, save battery life. As soon as you want to make a request, if your app has to hit the network, the radio has to be powered up. Um, that already takes up some battery. Then you make your request, and it, then it stays up for some time just to, in case you want to request some more um, data from the network. 
And that can be wasteful, um, but you can actually minimize that impact by batching your requests. And if you look here, um, if you look at your um, uh, network profiler after using your app for a while, after interacting with it, you can see if your requests were um, well batched in one place. You woke up the radio once, did all your uh, downloading, and then the radio can go to a low-powered state. Or if you are waking the radio up every minute, every 30 seconds, um, and then figure out how to fix it. But obviously, the network profiler is about not only about um, the radio state and the battery, it's all about network. So at the bottom, you see the, the data transfer graph. You see how much data was sent, how many, um, when the requests were made. And again, like on the previous profilers, you can select a chunk of time and then see all the HTTP and HTTPS requests that were made uh, in that time. It's a little bit similar to um, DevTools that you know from Chrome, for example. Um, you see the content type. You can see a timeline with how long every request, uh, time, uh, time that every request took. Um, but even more, if you click on any of these, you can see the actual payload. So if it was an image, like a JPEG or a PNG, if it was text, such as JSON or XML, you can see the actual data that was downloaded in, uh, into your app through that request. You can obviously also see HTTP headers, um, very useful for debugging any problems with server APIs. And finally, you can see the call stack um, on when the, on, uh, showing you where the call was made in your code. So that's pretty useful. Uh, a few comments. Um, the profilers work great on Android Oreo. Uh, you don't have to literally do anything. They should just work with any debuggable APK. Um, they also work on lower API versions. However, remember, on Nougat and below, you have to build and deploy your app from Android Studio to use all the functions of the Android profilers. And you have to remember to enable advanced profiling. If you don't have it enabled, don't worry. The profiler will, will show you the, the, a prompt, and it'll literally be a one-click fix. Um, and there are some small differences in how profilers work. So for example, in Nougat and below, to track memory allocations, you actually have to press a record button, just like on the, in the CPU chart. Um, other than that, most functions should be available for you. And there's one more new thing um, in Android Studio 3.0. If there are any, for example, game developers out there, uh, or people who use alternative ways to build your APKs, such as different uh, IDEs or different tool chains, um, and you would like to use all these new uh, Android profiler goodness, or just use Android Studio to debug your app, there's now a new project type in Android Studio to debug external APKs. Um, you can select this profile or debug option from the Android launcher, uh, from the Android Studio launcher, the, the, the first screen that you see. Select your APK, and it will be a, 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 like a dummy project will be created for you with the APK attached, um, with the Java code decompiled to Smiley, and, um, and you can even see the APK contents open in the APK analyzer for you. Uh, so you can do that to load an external APK. You can even attach Java sources and attach um, native libraries with debug symbols that lets you debug st uh, do step-by-step -step debugging in your code. And yeah, if, if you have always wanted to use Android Studio for APKs built with something else, do try it out. So I mentioned APK Analyzer. That was the window on the right. Uh, it's not new in Android Studio. Uh, however, Android Studio 3.0 brings some uh, pretty uh, well, notable improvements. Uh, the way you launch it uh, is uh, you can select Analyze APK from the Build menu. Just one word of advice. Uh, if you build your APKs during development using Instant Run, using the, the Run button in Android Studio, don't open these using, Android, uh, using the APK Analyzer. They don't contain all the classes and resources that you want to actually look at and analyze. Uh, instead, um, press the Build APK or Generate Signed APK, wait until the APK builds, and you'll get a nice notification. APK is ready. You can either locate it on disk or open it in the Analyzer. So when you press Analyze, APK Analyzer launches. You can see, uh, let me just give you a short walkthrough if you haven't used it before, but it's been in Android Studio for some time. And you can see the contents of the APK, all the files, uh, some basic info such as um, the file size of the APK, file sizes inside, the download size, because Play Store compresses the APK for delivery to devices. And then you can actually dig into um, the classes that are in your uh, classes.dex files and resources. 
what, what we've added in Android Studio 3.0, you can actually now see a third column showing you the sizes of the DEX, in, of the DEX code in your uh, APKs. So you can actually see uh, the size of a package, the size of a class, and even the size that a method adds to your class's DEX files. Uh, so it's pretty good for figuring out where all that space is going to. Uh, but there's a new thing I wanted to announce today. And just last night, we updated the Android SDK tools in the Canary channel. And we are now offering the APK anal Analyzer as a command line tool um, for using your CI servers and build servers. <laughs> so this was a long-standing request. I'm happy we, uh, we are finally releasing to you in preview. Uh, I'm hoping you'll try it out. It does most of the things and even more than the APK, anal uh, the, the APK analyzer in Android Studio. Uh, syntax is pretty basic. It has commands that let you uh, inspect things in the manifest, in the APK, in the DEX size, and even print out resources from the resource table. Um, it'll be great for generating reports on your build servers. It'll be great for comparing to APK versions to see um, where you've regressed when it comes to APK size. And with some script foo, you can even figure out very, very um, specific um, changes in your APK, such as um, you take two APKs, you list all the packages inside, all the classes, and you notice that between these two versions, um, some developer in your project added two new classes, and they take up X amount of space in, in, in those APKs. Um, so these are only some ideas um, on how you can use them. I'm curious to hear your feedback uh, on this tool. Um, so please come to see me after the session, and let's talk. And the last thing I wanted to mention at this session is um, Android Vitals. So this is a place in the, Android, uh, in the Google Play Console um, that lets you track and see um, some common problems with your apps that are happening on users' devices such as um, an ANR rate. ANR is application not responding. This, is, this basically happens whenever you use network or storage from the main thread. You can see the crash rate. Uh, you can figure out things like slow rendering or frozen frames, um, which usually means you're doing something wrong um, with the CPU or memory, as, we, as I showed you, you can analyze before. And finally, stack wake locks and excessive wake ups, which have an impact on the user's batteries, battery life. Um, we also offer all this information on, a, on developers Android com. So every section has a dedicated um, page that explains all the tools and debug um, methods that you can use to um, figure out these things and fix them in your apps. So I really encourage you to, to look it up in the Play Store, um, in the Play Console, and start working on it. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be here uh, on level three in the Android Office Hours booth. If you want to talk about the new profilers and the APK Analyzer, please come talk to me. And I'm curious to hear what you think. Thank you.
Right now we're working on a brand new storytelling experience called TAP, which is all about stories told through text messages, through chats. The TAP team started off very small. We didn't have a lot of resources to test out a lot of libraries to help us grow very quickly. Firebase gave us the ability to take what we would have done in many different places and integrate from many different services all in one place in one convenient package. And it allowed us to integrate that package and just get going with our development almost immediately. The real-time database allows us to have schemaless storage, which means we can change the schema whenever we want. We wanted to have the tab counters increment on the stories as the users were browsing through them. So you could kind of get a sense in real time what people were doing and what they were reading. And with Firebase, this is a, a trivial thing to implement. You basically just add a watcher onto the count nodes and it comes back to you in real time. Since our app is supported on both Android and iOS platforms, cloud functions come in really handy. When a user makes and publishes a story, the cloud function gets triggered and we send a notification to all the friends of the user so that they know that they made a story and published it. There are times where we don't know whether or not to build a feature or to roll out a feature and so we would use remote config and test it out with a smaller group of, of users first and then we would look at the analytics dashboard and when we see that you know the feature is actually performing really well we would deploy it at a larger scale. Remote config really made it fast and easy for us to make these really really important product decisions. We've reduced our typical app deployment schedule by more than half. That allowed us to go from effectively zero to a working product in production and that time span was was just phenomenally fast for us. The app has been really, really well received in both Google Play and the iOS App Store. We've had over 1 billion taps in tap so far through Tap Stories. We've had, in the first weekend that we launched our Story Writer, 25,000 people wrote stories. Firebase gives us the ability to focus on what we know best. That's storytelling. And that's giving our users the ability to immerse themselves, to interact, and to participate with stories in ways that were not available before.
My name is Ben, and today I'm here to talk to you about modularization of your app and Android instant apps. I work in London on the Android developer relations team as an engineer, and I spend a fair amount of my time working with the instant apps team and the early access partners as well as on samples. So in, at Google I.O. 2016, we introduced Android instant apps. And we then closely worked with a set of early access partners and made the SDK generally available this year at Google I.O. So everyone now can build an instant app. Android instant apps follows three main principles. That's discoverability, performance, as well as security and privacy. Today I'm going to take you th through these key principles. And let's get right started. First off, discoverability. Discovering an app sometimes can take a little bit of time. What happens every now and then is you find an app either by browsing the Play Store or somebody recommends it, or you literally just search for that and specifically find it, either with the uh, Pixel Launcher or in another way. Well, that's cool, but then you install it, then sometimes you forget about it, and through one or the other mechanism, you rediscover the app, and then you use it. That's the trodden path that developers uh, have to deal with so far, and users are um, actively uh, have, deal have this as well. It's really great. It works well. But uh, we can do a little bit better than that as well. So what happens is there's basically a funnel from the user finds the app, then they actually read through everything, and they decide to install the app. And in the end, they use the app in a longer time. So you've got a proper attention rate on that. Well, like I said, there is quite a lot of friction in that. And we figured there has to be a better way to deal with this. And we wanted, wanted to reduce this. So let's take, the, the, let's take a look at the process with instant apps. Say, Joyce sends me a link to BuzzFeed. I'm like, oh, cool. I wanted to see uh, something about cooking. And I click the link. What then happens is the app, the part of the app gets downloaded instantly. And I have the native app experience on my device. No friction whatsoever. I don't have to install the app. It's, all get, it's done automatically um, with the magic that the Play services provide, as well as uh, the magic that's happening on your device with that. Simple. So we launched with 50 early access partners from across a multitude of industries. And like I said, this SDK is now generally available to every developer. And the amount of devices that we have that are enabled for Android Instant Apps recently has passed half a billion devices. That is quite a lot, and it's, uh, it's still uh, working upwards trajectory on that, so it's going to be even more in the future. Well, that's all cool and stuff, but how does it work from a developer's perspective? Because I take that many of you in here are Android developers and want to know how you do that. So let's take a look at the high-level developer's overview of what we're gonna, what, what, how this works. Basically, your app is just a monolithic thing, right? So that's the one thing that gets installed on a device. That's the one thing you actually have to care about. Mm, that was the old world, and that's the installable app world. That's fine. But let's take a closer look at that. Basically, your app consists of multiple features, and those features sometimes have commonalities. And you can take all those commonalities and refactor them in multiple modules. Say you've got the feature A, you've got a feature B, and, a B, and those commonalities, you put them in a base feature that those other features um, rely on. Still, the build output for your installable app will be one APK with all those features combined. And that's the same thing that will happen on the device. So you have this one APK that gets installed on the device. Within, an within the Internet app world, what will happen? Instead of getting an APK, you get a zip file with a multitude of APKs in there, which then can be uploaded to the Play Store. And the Play Store decides, depending on the link that the user clicks, uh, where, which part of that will be installed on the device while, um, 
not hogging too much of the, of the bandwidth that is available as well as space on the device. So let's see how this works on a device. When you click on feature A, what happens is the base module gets installed as well as the feature A. When the user, on the other hand, clicks through the uh, sideways on feature B, what happens is only feature B gets installed. But if the user clicks first on feature A, then walk, walks his way through to the next feature, both of those can be installed. So everything, every part of your app can be installed on the device at the same time. So the users won't really notice the difference, other than they don't have to download the app manually and go through the whole search and discovery process. So to recap that, you've got a more fine-grained control over features with, more clean, with cleaner edges. And uh, with that process, you also can uh, decrease the size of your, uh, of your app, which is good for users as well. And with the new Gradle plugins, you improve your build times as well as, uh, as a side effect. You improve the testability of your app and um, can improve the architecture with that as well, which will increase your uh, velocity during development in the middle and long run. In the end, it doesn't really matter what your app is. It's one app, be it before it's an installa installed app, as an instant app, or afterwards. So you can essentially run the same code and don't have to rewrite everything. There is some refactoring involved, though, but uh, I'll come to that a little bit later. Let's take a look at the uh, requirements and the specifications for instant apps on your device, as well as on a couple of tools that we can uh, use on that. So it's available to devices running Lollipop and above, which is already a lot. And with Android Studio 3.0, we introduced a, a set of tools and plugins that developers can use to make Android Instant Apps work for them. There is the Instant Apps SDK that you can download. Also, there is new Gradle plugins for feature modules, which I just mentioned, as well as for the Instant App module, which we will take a look into those a little bit uh, later. Also, there's the AppLink Assistant, which allows you to um, output a file that you can easily upload to your server to make the matching possible between the local app and uh, your domain. Also, the emulator supports Android Instant Apps. You, all you have to do is set up a test account on that, and you can easily work with Instant Apps without having to uh, have a, a device that is enabled with it. Also, there's a refactoring tool, which allows you to for example, take one activity, click on the refactoring action, and instead of having to go through this refactoring step by step manually, you can just say, I want to refactor this into a module, and that, with all the code that's associated with it, as well as the resources, can be put into a separate module, and then you can start working with, uh, with, the couple advancement, uh, with a couple of things that you have to do to make your app uh, accessible as an instant app. So yeah, what, what do I actually have to do um, to get there? to make my app instant. So like I said, there might be some refactoring involved if you already have an existing app, depending on the structure of your app. Um, let's take a look at a couple of things that you definitely will have to do uh, without going into deep into too depth of the refactoring of the app. One of the things that you have, uh, every app has is a settings.gradle file if you build with Gradle. Otherwise, there is uh, currently no support on, um, on other build systems for that. But for the settings Gradle file, all you have to do is delete the currently existing app module um, and then replace that with base modules that you have refactored, the base module that you have refactored, as well as the feature modules, and have one new module that is the, insta the installed app, which basically cor correlates to your um, existing app module that you had before, and add a new module for the instant app. The only two um, relevant modules for the uh, device output are the installed and the instant app module. But let's take a look through step by step. First off, the base module. In order to make sure that the base model works uh, as intended, you have to mark it as a base feature. That's the only thing you have to do specifically for that. Also apply the feature plugin um, to um, so have it either output a APK if you work in the instant app world or a library if you work in the installed app world. For the other features that are depending on the uh, instant app module, what you'll have to do is uh, you just say, I'm, this feature is implementing the base feature. Also, you can have your dependencies scoped directly to the features that are using them. And I highly recommend scoping them as narrowly as you possibly can in order to avoid uh, having a massively bloated uh, 
base, API, base uh, module in there. On the installed app, what you have to do is you still have the application plugin that you already had, and then in, with the new dependencies, you have the uh, dependencies of, onto those, on those feature modules that you had before. Very similar for the instant app, you just apply a different plugin. And that defines which output you will get, either one single APK or a zip file with a multitude of APKs. Also, in your manifest, there have to be some changes that you have to make. So if you wonder, is my app actually a good use case for instant app? Well, yes. And you can think about that if you have your, if your app is addressable via uh, URL, then this is the use case for an instant app as well. In order to make that all happen and uh, to make it work, you have to uh, have an activity that has the Android Auto Verify set to true in order to have the app links available, and you have to set uh, the, the action view and category of browsable, and your default activity that you already have has to have the uh, default category as well. Then you associate your URL to your activity, and for your default activity, what you have to do is give it some meta metadata to um, have a default URL that it can fall back to if, it not if none of the other ones um, is applicable. Also, one of the cool things that we introduced with uh, Oreo is a new sandbox version. With that sandbox, we tighten security and make sure that we can uh, migrate user data from the instant app to the installed app. More on that later. The next principle of Android Instant App is performance. So what does that mean for a developer? So main question is, how do I get from having this click to getting output and getting the app installed instantly? What does that take? One of the things is, uh, that's basically that's the science, uh, that's how you, you have to uh, constrain your app in size. You have to make it as small as you possibly can in order to transfer it as quickly as possible over the wire. So that's kind of scary, right? Because like refactoring everything and making everything as small as possible takes a lot of time. There's a couple of things involved, but actually it's not that hard. And while you're developing, um, there's no size constraint. So you can easily just work with it from just having those, those changes in the Gradle files without having to limit yourself in, in uh, without having to send the app on a diet. That's really cool for the first refactoring efforts, and it's also really, really helpful for uh, the pitches to the team and for your product owners and product managers to actually show them, hey, this, is, this would happen if our app was an instant app. You can show this to them on their device and um, can take it from there. When you've taken the next steps towards that is um, when you upload your app to the Play Store for the first time to the development track, there is a download bundle size limit of 10 megabytes, which is still quite generous because that's not your whole app, but just a download bundle. When you move on to alpha, beta production, uh, what then happens is you will be constrained to four megabytes per downloadable bundle. So that's 1,024 to the power of two times the megabytes that you have. Um, so but what's with the bundle size? Bundle size basically means if your base bundle is quite large, say three megabytes, you could have features on, on top of that, which each are one megabyte. That effectively gives you six megabytes on the device. But if you split those two features that were combined into two different features, you would gain another megabyte. Similar if you can slim down your base APK, uh, your base uh, feature module, all your other modules can grow in size as well. I don't recommend just growing it for the sake of growing it, but um, you have ways to actually um, play around with that limit a little bit more effectively. So just to recap, stay under four megabytes. Yes, under. Like the, uh, the lower you can go, the better it is because it improves your user's experience from getting from the click to the installed application. So let's take a look at a couple of tools that we offer to make this easier for you as developers. One of them is the APK Analyzer. Some of you might be already familiar with it, especially if you just watched the session uh, earlier today here at the Google Developer Days. This gives you good insights where your kilobytes are spent, um, and it works with installable apps 
as well as within Synapse. So you just drop the uh, instant zip, instant, instant app zip in there, and you can see which of your modules takes the most size, and you can have all the insights that you want to have. That's really great. Also, in order to make sure that you divide your app into um, modules easier and, to, and have, have the output properly modularized, um, there's configuration splits. Well, that works with either screen density or the processor architecture type if you have native code as well as a user's language. The cool thing about that is that you don't ship all the resources and all the drawables and everything to the user but you, the experience is tailored to uh, the user's device. So an HTTP IB device with English language would only get HTTP IB resources and the English language. Same accounts for processor architecture. So how do you enable that? That's straightforward. Within your uh, build Gradle file, you enable but generate pure splits, then um, set the density um, to true. That is, it should be enabled, depending on whether you have native code or not. The AVI uh, part is, is, is essential as well. And you can split all the languages uh, into your different feature, into the different um, modules as well. What will happen is that all of those splits are being generated, and they will reside in their own APKs. And the Play Store decides this will be shipped, and the other ones, well, just don't take up space over the wire or on the user's device. Also, to further reduce your APK size, what you can do is use code minification, resource shrinking, ProGuard, or um, other things that we talked about in, at Google I.O. or at uh, other conferences already, like using WebP, make sure that your images aren't too big, uh, make sure that you um, remove all the unused resources. Um, but that has been covered in a wide variety of, uh, of words already. So, how does it work? Again, just for your release build type, because uh, in development it doesn't really matter that much. Um, you can minify it, can shrink your resources, or can use your ProGuard files for, um, for the modules that you're working with. Be aware that you have to have the um, API surfaces of your feature modules excluded from, the, uh, from ProGuard so that they don't get obfuscated, because otherwise the modules can't really communicate with one another. Also, one of the things is that you don't have to have everything as an instant app immediately if you consider working with instant apps. There may be features that are more suitable within your app to become an instant app than others. And your users will encounter that boundary in that case, which basically means that you have to have an install affordance at some point. These are two examples where you can have them. There's different ways as well. You could also have a modal dialog to um, show them this is where, where you want to go. This is now the place where you have to install the full application in order to um, continue with the, with, with the app's experience. There's an API for that. Basically, you check whether you're running in an instant app context. And if you run it in the instant app context, you show the install prompt, which gives you the install prompt from the Play Store directly. Let's take a look at the next principle. That's privacy and security. One thing is the identity of the user um, should be easy for the user to log in. So don't have them, si have them fumble with, around with sign-up dialogues, with um, long forms that they actually have to sign in with if they are newer users, or have them answer their password and username uh, if they're existing users. You can use the smart log APIs for that to make sure that uh, this is as quick as possible and as easy as possible for your users. Also for payments, for in-app payments, we already have the in-app billing API available. You can use that for um, digital goods, so everything that you have within the application or like subscriptions, anything like that, works with that. But also if you want to uh, ship something to the user and have physical goods available or you want to, um, to bring the user somewhere, that, then you use the Google Payments API, which uses the cards stored in the Google user's account. When it comes to permissions, uh, we made sure that this is secure for the users as well. We reduced the amount of available permissions for Android instant apps and the amount of requestable permissions, depending on the API level. So some of them are available down to, uh, to Lollipop, and some of them are available only from Android Oreo and above. So your instant app could run in a foreground service, so this would be helpful for media, for, for media playing uh, applications. And it can read phone numbers, which is a subset for, of read phone state. 
Well, be aware with background services, they might be killed at the system's convenience when a user does not really use the app anymore. So as soon as the user decides to switch to another app, it can get and will get um, evicted faster than usually uh, with installed apps. When it comes to local storage, you want to probably store data locally because you need to make sure that you access all that. And sometimes the user comes back to the app, and you, it's, uh, it's important to actually have that available. So we made it available to the local private storage. Also, there's the cache directory. There is a cookie API available, and you can use the shared preferences, as well as your database that's already existing and internal content providers. But you don't get access to external storage or your exported content providers. That is, again, to make sure that uh, the users are in a secure environment. When it comes to migrating user data from the instant app to the installed app, there we provided an API for that as well, which relies on you declaring the target sandbox version 2 in your installed application. And how does it work? That's the cookie API. It's available to both instant app and installed app. It allows you to store and retrieve user data when you migrate or as a replacement for other ways to uh, store user data that you already used. How does it work? It's, again, a straightforward API. You check whether the cookie that you want to store uh, is small enough to fit the cookie jar, and then you update your Internet cookie. The Internet cookie is a byte array, and it's available to, through both the package manager as well as the support package manager. On the other end, you then all have, you have to do is uh, get from the package manager, get it back to get back the internet cookie, and then uh, convert it to the data that you already to the data type that you can work with. And when you're done, you can clear up after yourself and uh, clear the internet cookie. That is all I had to say on the part of internet for today. But there's a couple of things that I want you to keep uh, keep in mind when it comes to. Uh, that I want you to keep in mind when it, uh, when it comes to looking up for instant apps. One of the things is you um, probably want to go to the g.co slash instant apps or developerandroid.com slash instant apps. Also, if you have questions, uh, post them on Stack Overflow. And uh, if, you have, if you see that there are samples missing or if you want to um, contribute to samples for Android instant apps, please uh, file an issue on Google Samples. And there's also a couple of other presentations that are definitely highly recommendable for Android Instant Apps. One of them is the introduction to Instant Apps, which gives you more of a high-level overview of how, what they actually are than this presentation. Also, building an Android Instant App, which takes you through the um, modularization process um, more hands-on than this presentation as well. Also, adding to that is the best practices to slim down your app size session, which is really great to get a great overview over all the tools that we made available for making sure that your app size is as small as possible without uh, sacrificing any of your users' um, experience. Thank you very much. That's all from me.
Does this symbol look familiar to you? And how about this screen right here? Waiting for things to load is part of everyone's mobile app experience, but it's never a good experience for your users. And how would you even know what that experience is? Your users are on a wide variety of devices, on a wide variety of networks, in a wide variety of locations all over the world. If you want to optimize the performance of your app, you need metrics that tell you exactly what's happening during the critical moments of your app's use. And you need that information to come directly from your users. Now, you can get it using Firebase Performance Monitoring. By integrating the SDK into your app, and without writing any code, your performance dashboard in the Firebase console will collect information about your app's performance as seen by your users. You'll get data about your app's startup time and details about its HTTP transactions. And using the provided API, you can instrument your app to measure those critical moments that you want to understand and improve. Then, in the dashboard, you can break down the data by country, device type, app version, and OS level. So try out the Firebase Performance Monitoring SDK at no cost for iOS and Android to gain insights into your user experience today. And to learn more about Firebase Performance Monitoring, check out the documentation right here.
gentlemen, please welcome Dirk Prips. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> two days of learning, two days conversation. I can't believe it's over, can you? It's like it just started. And we aspire to create a conference for all of you that is more than just a technology show. We aspire to be European, to be a place of learning, and to be an inclusive place where you can get inspired and have conversations and just love being a developer around the developer crowd. So when you design something like this, there are a couple of things that you try to, to get right. And then you, you wonder if you really got it right. So being a place of learning, kind of easy, right? You ask the audience, in that case you developers, hey, what would you like to hear? You invite experts that give session, you put on an agenda, find a place, check. And after the event, we ask you how we did and how we can improve. Being a European conference, also kind of easy. So in this room, we are actually more than European. We are, we are a global conference. We have 71 nations sitting in that room, and more than two-thirds of you come from countries outside Poland. So this is truly an international European conference, and that was what I heard from you all over the place, that among good conversations, you really like the exchange with other perspectives, other nations, people from other countries. The inclusive, inspiring part is a tricky piece. Um, because, well, how do you test for that? There are a million little things you can do and try. And uh, it's not easy to test. It's more, some, some would say it's more a soft, soft thing. But uh, wait a minute, we can, we can ask, right? So I can, I can run a little experiment. Maybe you do it with me. Um, I'm going to raise my hand and everybody who feels like inspired, being, uh, learned something new, and being part of an inclusive conference just starts cheering. How about that? Let's try. That was like medium-sized cheer. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of expected. So if you look around, and you were some of in the cheering crowd, you might have noticed some of you didn't cheer. Because actually, you know, we Europeans don't cheer that easily. Just because some clown on stage says, cheer, we don't cheer. <laughs> um, and that, that is kind of a, that's, that's a well-known stereotype. Actually, we as Europeans even subscribe to that stereotype. So non-Europeans think that Europeans are not that easy in cheering. And Europeans kind of do it and believe it themselves. And these kind of stereotypes we know. But they're like, a million other things that are unconsciously baked into how we behave, how we make decisions. Now, we are engineers, so it's like a decision tree or a filter, if you will. Our brains are remarkably good at that, because that helps us navigating the world much faster than we would without these heuristics, if you will. So these unconscious stereotypes, these unconscious biases, they influence how you make products, how you make decisions. A conference is a product, if you will. Software is a product. Hardware, you build products out of these elements. And your stereotypes influence your decisions. Your conscious and unconscious biases influence your decisions. By extension, sometimes they influence what kind of product you build. We at Google, we build products that have a global scale. We want everyone to be part of this technology world that we are all creating together. How do we build processes? How do we design software? How do we design systems that are, without realizing, without wanting it, uh, maybe biased as well? Our biases creep in. And if you take the example of uh, this conference, this was an important question when we started building up um, the project team and started working towards these two amazing days we just had. So we brought in this, and we thought in this last session of this two days conference, we talk a little bit about how Google tries to build software in a way that's more inclusive. What are the processes? What are the practices? What are the things that we try to do in order to overcome that challenge? So please welcome to the stage engineering lead YouTube, Somya Subramanian. Thank 
you, Dirk. I'm super excited to be here. I still remember my first technical conference presentation almost 17 years ago in Paris, where I, the speaker, was pretty much the only female engineer in the whole room. To see so many women engineers at this conference has been amazing. We've come a really long way, and let's give a big round of applause to that. As Dirk mentioned, I'm an engineering director at YouTube, and I will be showing a lot of YouTube videos in my presentation. So let's start off with a video of a favorite clip of mine. Me love rewind. Um, nom, nom, nom. Oh, <laughs> the video is not playing on screen. I can see it. Okay.
All right. Okay, so shall we get this started again? Yes. So sorry about the projection not showing up. It's a video you're going to enjoy, I promise. So let's start with a video. Is it progressing? <laughs> it's not. Are they doing the voice of God? No. Okay. All right. Let's see if this works. This is how we debug problems in Google. <laughs> Let's try it. This is... 
So this is a clip from my all-time favorite YouTube Rewind videos from 2015, because it really captures the essence of YouTube. YouTube started out with a very simple mission, broadcast yourself. And it has grown into a global platform with global reach. We have over 1.5 billion users coming to YouTube every month. And over 80% of our views come from outside the United States. We are an open and democratic platform with over 400 hours of videos being uploaded every minute by creators all around the world, making YouTube the platform with the most diverse content. In the time that it took me to say this sentence, or for us to debug that problem earlier, almost a full day's worth of videos have been uploaded to YouTube. What makes YouTube special is that, like, unlike traditional media or television, we have no gatekeepers. Anyone can have a voice and reach and build an audience. While this is still very, very true about YouTube, a few years ago, when I was looking at some usage data on YouTube, I realized that as our platform and usage have grown, human dynamics and unconscious biases, like what Dirk was talking about, are creeping in. And on YouTube, too, we see biases and gender gaps, for instance, like traditional media. On YouTube, too, we see a lot of our makeup videos, for instance, are created by female creators. And a lot of the science and engineering and technology videos are made by male creators. With this insight, I started a conversation and a pitch within YouTube and across Google at large, whose mission is to build products for all about diversity in the context of product design. And how does unconscious bias play into product engineering? What if, in YouTube, in addition to optimizing for the growth of watch time, we became more intentional about our demographic goals, such as gender reach or ethnicity reach. That would unlock opportunities for deeper engagement and onboard more users, thereby driving growth. So for the first time in Google, we expanded our dialogues around diversity at Google from being about hiring and building balanced teams to about diversity becoming a core piece to defining the growth strategies for all our products. And that brings me to today's topic of inclusive design as a growth accelerator. So what is inclusive design? It's about engineering products for all your target users across all demographics. When you broaden your demographic reach, you're increasing your user funnel and thereby driving growth for your products. Inclusive design is not just about user design or visual design. It is also about machine learning and algorithms, about the training data, about testing, about how you launch the product, the branding, marketing, and more. Inclusive design is about asking which target user segments could you be doing more for. It could be gender-based. It could also be that your products work great when you have good connectivity, but then doesn't work that well in the developing world. It could be about optimizing your products for certain ethnicity groups. As an industry, we all have been doing inclusive design for lots of years now in the form of accessibility work. And this is about expanding that across other dimensions. For instance, when airbags first came out, there were more deaths and injuries in women and kids. Why? Because airbags were tested with only tall, male crash test dummies. Were the engineers who designed this sexist? 
No, it's because of the unconscious biases that inform their process. Female drivers tend to have a smaller build and in real crashes have 47% higher chance of severe injuries than men. So once the industry included women in their design and started using female crash test dummies, the safety of airbags went up significantly for women, and not just for women, but for anyone with a smaller build. So this is an example of gender-based inclusive design. Airbags still don't work well for kids, and that is an opportunity of growth. For this next example that I want to show you, I'll start with a video. My coworker Wanda and I are sitting in front of an HP Media Smart computer. It's supposed to follow me as I move. I'm black. I think my blackness is interfering with the computer's ability to, to follow me. So she moved this way, and the camera followed her. And then he'd get into the screen, and it would be completely stable. No face recognition anymore, buddy. My so anyone know what's going on there? For this, we need to go back to the 1950s, when Kodak was dominating color photography. And they introduced the Shirley color card, which has become the standard for all photography. But it works better with lighter skin tones. So what this means is you often have exposure issues when taking multiracial photos. This problem was recognized as a big problem in the 1970s when chocolate makers and wood manufacturers were having a hard time creating advertising material for their products because they could not capture in photos the different shades of brown. So a funny way for this problem to get surfaced. It also was becoming an increasing problem when the media and television world was starting to become more diverse. Finally, 25 years later, in 1995, a group of engineers took an inclusive design approach to help bridge this gap. And they launched multiracial color cards, which have significantly improved camera and photo technology and helped unlock a lot of advertising revenue and new business opportunities. While things have improved, there's still a slight light skin bias, which is what you saw in the video earlier. The black color skin is not recognized by the camera, which is why when the uh, black person was moving, it seemed so stable, but the face recognition was able to follow along with the white skin person. I'm really proud that at Google, we've taken a proactive inclusive design approach to helping bridge this gap and the Google camera team is helping solve this problem. Let's watch a video on what the camera team has done. Pictures tell stories. It doesn't really matter if it's a selfie or if it's a portrait that somebody is taking of another person. You are sharing in that human moment. Uh, let's take a picture of you two. One, two, three. No, oh, he's too dark. So this is where the discussion started. Kia, just use my phone. It's got a better sensor. Better sensor? And what does that even mean? Color tuning is an extremely complicated process. When we look at images, what we try to do is figure out how much of a difference there is between, let's say, a reference image and the image that we actually are trying to quantify. We were running some tests on a product, and it was the proximity sensor we were testing. And we said, oh, it looks like it does 60 centimeters. And we looked at each other and we go, we're both white. The technology itself, as many people will say, is not racist. It's just that it wasn't tested properly to make sure that the designers weren't unconsciously biased. Hey, there's an entire world out there and we want to make sure this works for everybody. I love the fact that we get to influence cameras, that we get to share those experiences of life and emotion. And to me, that is what imaging is about. It is a vehicle to express 
humanity. Take a picture of you two. One, two, three. All right, for this next example, how many of you know of Cheetos? A few. Cheese puffs or cheese, the cheesy snacks. It's a very American snack called Cheetos. And when it first came out, it was only available in one flavor, the cheesy flavor, cheese flavor. Until a janitor who worked for the company started adding chili and lime to his packets of Cheetos to make it more flavorful for him. He was Latino and loved chili and lime. His family and friends also liked the taste. So he decided to pitch this new flavor idea to the president of the company, who actually listened to this janitor and decided to experiment with this new flavor. And that unlocked huge opportunities and markets for Cheetos. I'm happy to say the janitor is now an executive at the company. It's a true rags to riches story. And more importantly, it's a story that shows cultural inclusive design thinking. This next example is from YouTube. Few years ago, we wanted to increase engagement with kids and families on YouTube. So we brought kids into our UX lab to see how do they use and interact with YouTube. This is what we see. Yeah? Everyone uses YouTube here? Yes, many. Um, this is what we see. But the kids, when they saw the same thing, this is how they saw it. <laughs> they didn't care about anything else on the screen other than the video content that was there. That is when we realized if we wanted to increase engagement with kids and families, we had to reimagine YouTube from the ground up and build a new app. And that's when YouTube Kids app was born. The YouTube Kids app provides easy to use interactivity and safe, enriching, and engaging content for kids and families. And we've done this by improving our user design and visual design and user interactions, and also by making a lot of changes to our algorithms, the backend systems, and our content classification systems. YouTube Kids now has over 11 million at weekly active users. And we see the engagement with kids and family content on the YouTube Kids app to be significantly more than on main YouTube. This is a great example of age-based inclusive design driving growth. It also demonstrates clearly that sometimes for you to meet the needs of specific target user demographics, you might have to build a specialized product for them. How many of you have used the YouTube Kids app Hardly any. OK, because we haven't launched in all the markets yet. So I'm going to play the first launch video of YouTube Kids app for you to get an idea of what I'm talking about. Let's roll the video. OK, so do you want to tell a story? Uh, sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now, it's, now everything is popping into my brain. Okay. Um, Once upon a time, there was a boy named Alex. Three um, sisters. A bunny. Two trains. He um, got caught in a bubble and then he was floating around. He went to um, France and then he sees Dracula and a, and a few ghosts. Frankenstein, and then the robot came and ate the whole town. And everyone went like crazy. And then they had to destroy the robot. That was the only thing, so I put it on the sun. Like, um, so. Because since the sun is made of gas, it couldn't eat anything. 
nothing there. He got surprised, and then he jumped back and popped the bubble and he fell. The end. It's really weird. <laughs> So how many of you use emojis? Yeah, you're not alone. 90% of the world's online population also uses emojis. While there are many emojis to choose from, they're fairly stereotypical. Like the boys are portrayed this way, as doctors and police and others, and the girls are portrayed as queens and princesses and giving haircuts to people. So it's fairly stereotypical. To bridge that gap and to also be inspiring for young girls, Google has added a whole new set of emojis to represent women and men in diverse roles and in a mix of hair and skin colors to be more inclusive. This is driving industry-wide change with iOS, Facebook, Twitter, and others embracing these new set of emojis in their products and platforms. This is a great case of gender-based and ethnicity-based inclusive design. <laughs> this next example is again from YouTube. How many of you have heard of women harassment in online communities, like the gaming community, um, through hashtags and online commenting tools. Some of you, yeah. Uh, many of you might have heard of Gamergate, where women gamers were even threatened for their lives using these online commenting tools. Few years ago in YouTube, we organized a Women at YouTube hackathon around the theme of bridging the gender gap to drive grassroots momentum around inclusive design. One of the salient projects in this hackathon focused on improving YouTube comments to help women combat harassment and feel safer on YouTube. As a result of this hackathon project, we've launched several enhancements to YouTube comments and our moderation tools, such as making it easier for creators to deal with inappropriate comments, blacklist words, and also limit commenters who are making those inappropriate comments. This is a great example of gender-based inclusive design thinking to further deepen our engagement with our female creators. It also shows that many times, grassroots ideas like hackathons can bring about change in product direction and strategy. So now I've gone through several examples of different kinds of inclusive design, some from the non-technology world, and many from the technology world, and many from Google and YouTube. And now I want to talk about how do you do inclusive design at scale, and how can you become more proactive in incorporating inclusive design rather than being reactive? So this is the typical stages of product development at Google. They're not necessarily linear. We do do it in an iterative way. But at a high level, these are the different stages we go through during product design and development. In Google, we are starting to become more intentional about setting demographic goals at every stage of product development. So when we're defining target users, instead of just saying 18 to 34 age group, we are also picking a demographic goal that we would like to meet. So we're saying 18 to 34 age group with equal engagement from male and female. Or 18 to 34 age group with this level of ethnic reach that we want to get on the platform. Once we've set that demographic goal, we propagate it through the rest of the pipe, uh, stages of product development. So when we're doing testing, for instance, we are very careful in picking our test user groups to ensure that they are reflecting and mirroring the demographic goals that we want to meet, whether it is with user research and user testing, or training data for machine learning, 
or um, market research or more. Over the last two days, you've heard that Google is a lot about algorithms and machine learning. And you could ask, like, machines, why are they biased? They should all be like neutral. And that's not the case. There are lots of different kinds of biases that can come into your machine learning systems, too. And I want to roll a video now to show you what those different biases are and how we are tackling it at Google. Let's roll the video. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. OK, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. You may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem, step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias, like this recent game where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias, for example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias from tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation because technology should work for everyone. So once you've designed the product and you're ready to launch, it's really important that your marketing, branding, and uh, support systems all are making sure to echo the demographic goals that you set out with. Now, for inclusive design to be a success, it, in addition to everything that we talked about just now, it's really important to still have diverse perspectives and diverse teams and to increase the representation of diversity in technology. So to this end, Google is investing through our computer science education and media efforts to increase the access of technology education around the world to a diverse group and to help increase awareness of unconscious biases. And also partnering with Hollywood and other media producers to change how scientists and engineers and computer scientists are portrayed in the big screen, because that can be a huge influencer. So another video, the last one in this presentation, showing what we're doing with the media work. Let's roll the video. When I think of the lack of diversity in Hollywood and the lack of inclusion, I figure if I'm not part of the solution, then I'm part of the problem. When I meet students who look like me, I see their eyes light up when they learn that I'm an engineer.
most rewarding aspect of this work is showing girls that they don't have to choose between computer science and their passions. Computer science is really just a tool for what they love. Computer code can do anything. This one searches for signs of life in outer space. Growing up, I was so good at math and science, but I didn't feel like I could pursue a career in STEAM because I didn't see anyone who looked like me doing it, especially not on TV. Our Google-funded Gina Davis Inclusion Potion shows that even when women are leads in film, they still receive three times less screen and speaking time than their male counterparts. The only way to find the source address is to access and analyze the datagram packets in his broadcast. We want technology to look fun, accessible, and common as something to do for girls. Or as some would say, normal, because it is. I'm here because I want the billions of women and girls all over the world to know that you can be literally anything you want to be. Our CSN Media team strives to change the narrative of computer science for people of color, the LGBTQIA community, people with disabilities, all aspiring youth so they can finally see the reflections in the media. As a woman of color and a mom, I want my kids to know they can pursue any career, regardless of gender or race. Yes, absolutely. If the platform doesn't exist, we need to create it. Google is in a unique position to work with partners to provide students with access to technology and empower them to be creators. It is so cool to see that minds filled with possibilities. So now it comes to you. I hope I've shown you today the value of inclusive design and how you can drive growth using inclusive design. I hope also that I've shown you the ways in which Google is doing inclusive design and what are some of the steps that we are taking by becoming more intentional. Now you, when you go back to leave this room, go back to your offices, can follow the same similar approach that Google is doing I would also like to leave you with a cheat sheet. Right? The first thing is, in your current products, it will be great if you can identify demographic gaps that you have, and the magnitude of these gaps, and if you were to bridge them, what kind of impact they could be driving. Once you have that, prioritize which gap, the one gap that you want to fill, because we all are resource constrained and can't solve everything. So pick one or two gaps that drives the biggest impact for you. As you bridge those gaps, make sure you have metrics and logging and data to measure progress. And when you drive big impact, celebrate your wins. Also, it's really important to foster an inclusive culture in your organizations. You can do hackathons around inclusive design themes to drive more energy and momentum across your entire team. You can also do unconscious bias trainings to make more people aware in your whole organization. So with that, now, I want you to take a moment and think about the one thing you're going to do differently when you leave this room. And if you want to be bold, you can tweet it at Google Devs and make sure to mark it with the hashtag GDD Europe and Women Tech Makers. Anyone wants to shout out an idea that they may be doing differently? It's OK. Anyone? All right. OK. So with that, OK, so with that, I'm going to invite Dirk back to wrap up, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you. And I believe I, I need to do this. There have been a few people having quite an adrenaline rush back there, and Salmia certainly had the same. I think even Europeans can give them an extra cheer, right? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's like presenter's nightmare, so I'm, I, I was really feeling with her. 
The last step on our two days journey for me is now to say a very warm thank you. It has been incredible, uh, incredible two days. And we have a few parting wishes. You heard Sonia's wish. I have an additional. Please don't be a stranger. There are several ways to stay in touch with each other and with us. Continue the conversation that you take with you out of this conference. The women tech makers, the GDGs, you name it. There are multiple ways. And kind of hard if you have walked these halls these past days not to have uh, bumped into them and um, maybe you're a member already, maybe you're interested, um, stay in touch. On your way out, uh, there are on the, on the entrance, I've been told, a couple of things you might consider grabbing. Some, apparently there's some swag left, so uh, if, you're, if you keep your eyes open, it might be interesting what you see. And with that, please travel safely. Thank you for being, us with, uh, being with us today. And uh, yeah, maybe next time. Thank you. Traveling to Kaka has been really awesome. I don't think I would ever have come to Poland in my life except for having an event like this. It happens pretty much just once a year. You also can't really overstate the value of doing something like this in the same room as other people. So everyone helps each other and it's just really great that way. I think that it is normal to be a little nervous before any sort of big event, but I'm hoping to take that and sort of channel it into my excitement about what I'm talking about. As a speaker interacting with uh, attendees, I get to share a lot of my knowledge and also I get to learn a lot about what they're doing with all of our Google products. This GDD event, there's so much going on. I would say that my one regret is that you can't see everything. I think that I'm really fortunate that you can check out a lot of our events that are recorded, so I can't wait to check them out later on YouTube. I love the place because it's such a vibrant community of developers and you get people from all kinds of areas, technological areas. You get Android developers mixed with cloud developers, mixed with front-end developers, and it really is a good mix of everything that Google is providing to developers. We're really excited about the possibilities for developers to build some truly amazing things.